Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Coming of the Storm, Book One of Contact, The Battle for America, by W. Michael Gear and Kathleen O'Neill Gear, narrated by Kevin Orton, and directed by Jennifer O'Donnell. Dreams The dream carried one of her souls away last night, or so she believed. The images her dream soul saw were so vivid, fresh, and bright that she might have relived them exactly as she had on that long-ago day. The details, unmarred by the passing of time, remained as sharply defined in her memory as freshly chipped obsidian. The earthy, humid odors of soil, freshly cut palm fronds, and spring flowers came unbidden to her nostrils. The angle of the light, Splashes of newly burst flowers in yellow, pink, blue, and red dotted the green tangles of vine, brush, and tall grass. The sun beat down from a haze milky sky as she sawed at thick palmetto stems with a sharp clamshell. A stray bead of sweat trickled from her armpit, down around the swell of her bare right breast. The frond drooped, allowing her to sever the remaining fibers. She placed it atop the others she'd cut from the palmetto and straightened, grateful to relieve the strain in her lower back. Once again, he and his dogs came striding down the trail, fluid muscles flexing beneath moist, sun-darkened skin. White heron feathers, three of them, fluttered from the crook of his trader's staff, and a thick alligator hide quiver rode crossways on his back. His face was smooth, angular, with a firm jaw and straight nose. She liked the look of his wide cheekbones and the half-smile on his thin-lipped mouth. Oddly, for a man of his age, his face was undecorated by either paint or tattoo. His black hair grew fully from his head, pulled back into a bun at the rear and pinned with a bone skewer. She remembered the rippling muscle in his arms, the thick spread of his shoulders, and the travel-stained fabric apron that hung down front and back from a breechcloth tied about his narrow waist. His five pack dogs were walking ahead of him, and of course, they saw her first. She froze the image, staring up at the suit-thick thatch roof rising over her head. What if I hadn't met his eyes? What if I hadn't felt that thrill as our souls touched across time and space? What if she'd just ducked down, crouched over her severed palm fronds? Sometimes the smallest decisions led to the most tumultuous events. Don't look him in the eyes, girl. Just let him pass. But their eyes had locked. Now, a lifetime later, she relived that instant. Her heart picked up, blood quickening in her old veins. Her lungs expanded, and her loins tickled with anticipation. She coughed, placing a withered hand to her mouth, and glanced around the dark room where she lay. Would it have made any difference? Really? She shook her head, smiling up at the dark recesses of the roof. How are we to know? And if I had known, had I let him pass? Could I have saved the world? Would anything have been different? She grinned at the absurdity of the notion. No, even now, if she could go back, just like she had in the dream, she'd do it all again. She closed her eyes in surrender, summoning that day again, and pulling it around her like a wrapping. She breathed the moist warm air, felt the faint breeze, and ran her fingers over the stacked palm fronds. The ache tightened in her back, and her young heart beat with renewed vigor. Her skin was smooth and silky her breasts firm and round. He's coming, just as I had hoped. Boldly, she lifted her head and stared him straight in the eyes. The jolt was still powerful, relived as his sharp gaze met hers. Once again, she saw his surprise melt into curiosity, the smile curling his lips. Something in his eyes, a reflection of his soul's, challenged yet reassured her a warmth built deep in the pit of her loins. Wait, fool, use your head for once. Men had always been her downfall, 
as they had been her mother's. He may just be another man. Discover the depth of the water before you jump. She watched him stop and signal his dogs. All the while she stared into his eyes. Greetings, he called in Timakua. She straightened, rising to her feet. At the sight of her, he seemed oddly starved for breath. The change in his eyes as he took in her high breasts, narrow waist, and long legs was as predictable as sunrise. Oh yes, I've got him. Assuming I decide I want him. Forget it, she said, mouthing those same words she'd said so many years ago. Forget it? How? As tears slipped past her tightly pressed eyelids and trickled down her wrinkled cheeks, the world she'd once known began to die all over again. Chapter One I am Black Shell, of the chief clan of the Hickory Moiety of the Chikaza Nation. But then, truth be told, ten long years have passed since I ventured out from my people. You see, in their eyes, I am Akeohusa. It means dead and lost in the Muscogee tongue. A more precise term would be outcast. When I was driven from my country long ago, I thought it a divinely bitter irony. The notion of being Akeohusa would have killed a lesser man. At least, that's what I tell myself. It has killed others, generally from despair, loneliness, and guilt. My people, the Chikaza, have fostered the myth that they are somehow superior, that they hold themselves to a higher standard. Such notions have served them well. By cultivating a code of honor, piety, and nobility, they have had fewer scruples about conquest or manufacturing a reason for war over some perceived slight or insult. Only when I was finally an outsider did I gain any understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of such a system. You see, most other nations don't like the Chikaza. They think we're rather prickly and arrogant prudes. At the same time, people fear us because the only thing the Chikaza do better than preening, slapping each other on the back, and lying about our innate superiority is make war. No one takes warfare with the Chikaza lightly. That curious mixture of awe and dislike has served me well during my years as an Akeohusa. I'm not fond of my people either. That fateful day when all the trouble started, I heard the voice of Horned Serpent. It was that terrible spirit being, the great winged snake who flies up into the summer sky, who told me to run from my first battle. My clan called me a liar when I insisted that Horned Serpent spoke to me. Since the day I was banished, anger has run along my veins like hot liquid. It has spurred me in my wanderings. What does an exile do? If he's of the Chikaza's chief clan, as I am, he trades and gambles. The things I trade consist of luxury goods. Pieces of precious copper, polished white shell, buffalo wool, medicine herbs, and spirit plants brightly colored feathers and unusual carvings or artwork. As to gambling, I have a facility for games like stickball, chunky, or akbatle. In addition to those skills, much of my life has been dedicated to mastering the bow. Warriors, no matter what their nation, are a proud lot and more than willing to wager just about anything on their ability to drive an arrow through the mouth of a narrow-necked jar at twenty paces. Their temptation really rises when the challenger is a rootless foreign braggart like me. I travel with five pack dogs. A trader's dogs must be large, sturdy, and sure-footed. Over the years, dogs have come and gone, but the ones I traveled south with were among the best I'd ever owned. My favorite, and most beloved, was Fetch. He was more than just a dog having a partly human soul. He kept my spirits up when things turned miserable. His greatest joy in life came from retrieving thrown sticks, hide balls, or even rocks. He'd been with me for eight long summers, and a better companion you will not find.
Skipper, another of my dogs, was named for his curious sideways gait, his butt traveling a hand's width to the right of his front as he trotted. He was light brown, with short hair, and an oddly blue left eye. Bark, well, his name says it all. At command, he'd stay silent, mostly. But if one of the other dogs stole something from him, he'd just plop on his rear and bark his full head off in indignation. He was charcoal black, with a thick head decorated by old scars. Bark had another talent. When it came to a dogfight, he was terror unleashed. Squirm? He liked to wiggle out of his packs, and had made a study of how to do it without me noticing. I swore he had extra joints in his legs and spine. His long hair was dark brown and sleek, serving to accent the white blaze on his face and the milky bib on his chest. Gnaw no longer lived up to his name, but as a puppy, several times he almost ended up as stew after chewing off sections of pack leather. He was the fastest and strongest of my dogs. Consequently, he carried the heaviest pack. I thought of him as a huge gray monster of a dog, the image only sullied by the cute white tip on his tail. For several years my path had taken me south, away from the civilized lands of the Muscogee and the other great nations. It led me to the Appalachee, who first conjured my curiosity about the bearded and pale sea peoples. While at Appalachee, I visited the place they call Aute. There I saw with my own eyes the bleached skulls of great and terrifying animals larger than elk. Upon these are said to ride the mysterious hair-faced men from the sea. Eleven winters past, the invaders, calling themselves Christianos, arrived from the south under the leadership of their chief, Navares. The Apalachee had nothing but disdain for the Christianos, having watched them struggle through the coastal swamps and tidal flats, sick and starving in a land of plenty. In the end, the Christianos built rafts, ate their great beasts, and floated down to the gulf. After that, they simply vanished into the sea. I had walked among the curious constructions at Aute, and saw the great wooden crosses they hung in the trees. I viewed with awe the mysterious metal left behind, and held pieces of their cloth. I wondered at the remarkable many-colored beads they had traded off during their stay. My curiosity grew with each new discovery. The Miko, as the Appalachee call their high chief, is named Kafake, or Great Soil. He has a Cristiano skull in his palace at the capital city of Ankaika. I've held it, studied the narrow bones of the face and nose, and wondered at the man whose souls once resided inside that fragile bone. It was then I decided to follow out the source of the legend. For, fool that I was, I anticipated making a fortune in trade if only I could obtain a sample of their goods. The great chiefs in the north would barter fabulous wealth for such exotic oddities. I need not bore you with the story of my route down through the Timakua lands, my time trading among the Uzachili towns, or the trouble I had with the Holata, or chief, at Okala town. In a sense, the story begins one late afternoon when I approached White Bird Lake Town. For those who have never traveled that way, it is a land of pine forests, occasional hardwoods, and palmettos. Open areas, sometimes cleared by wildfires, are lush in grass, and the soils are sandy enough for the cornfields to produce. Settlements tend to be inland from either coast, away from the threat of storms, though occasional great tempests do flatten areas of forest as they roar across the peninsula from one body of water to another. The peninsular people are warlike, as ready to fight with their cousins a half a day's walk away as with the Calusa and Tequista to the south, or the Usita to the west. Most of their towns are built around one or two low mounds that serve as supports for the chief's house, charnel house, or perhaps a temple. A log fortification is usually thrown up on an earthen embankment around the town's perimeter, just enough to allow the defenders to shoot between the gaps. When I say the people are warlike, it's not like among the great nations of the north, 
where trained armies are unleashed by a slighted minko over some perceived insult. Instead, these villages and towns are in a state of constant intermittent raiding. At times, however, some war chief, called a paracousi in the southern Timucua tongue, will manage to defeat enough of his neighbors to create a loose sort of nation relying on tribute from conquered towns. Such chieftainships, if you can even call them that, are fragile, easily sundered, and generally in a constant state of flux. They rise and fall based upon the charisma and cunning of individual leaders. Such was the case with a fellow by the name of Ira Paracoki, a newly risen leader among the most disorganized southern Timakua villages. When a man is made chief in these lands, he takes the name of the town where he rules. Thus, a man might be named Red Hawk, but he will be called Holata Ahokalaquin, or Chief Ahokalaquin, from the moment he is confirmed. I thought it was confusing, but that was how the Timakua did things. Iraperakoki, which would translate as something like High War Counselor and Combat Chief, had subjugated most of the towns south of Okali territory and north of the Calusa and the Takista. Controlling such a large block of land, he was happily earning tribute from his subject towns, and, more important as far as I was concerned, very taken with himself. Like the puffer fish of the seas, petty chiefs can blow themselves up beyond their true importance and greatness. Remember, I was born and raised Chikasa. I know all about created self-importance. That day I was walking at the head of my pack dogs my trader's staff in hand. The trail was wide, well-trodden, with palmettos, pines, and oaks on either side. Spring was in full flower, the air almost muggy. An afternoon sun was squatting in the western sky, the southeastern breeze perfectly scented with honeysuckle, gallberry, phlox, and firebush, all in bloom. The very air seemed to buzz and vibrate with the hum of insects. Overhead, flocks of herons were winging north, their trilling hoots floating down over the land. Mockingbirds called in lilting voices from the brush. I could see an osprey circling over a marsh off to the west. I took a deep breath, and the damp musk of vegetation and rich soil filled my nostrils. The pack dogs heard her first, pricking their ears, tails rising as they inspected the brush off to the side. Then low growls broke out as the woman raised her head from where she used a sharpened clamshell to cut palmetto fronds. At my hand sign, the dogs went quiet, panting as they watched the woman. Squirm tried as usual to shake his way out of his pack. I snapped my fingers in rebuke, and Squirm shot me a you-caught-me look. Greetings, I called out in my halting Timakua. The woman straightened. And what a sight she was, tall, with raven black hair falling down past her hips. Her broad shoulders reminded me of a swimmer's, and her arms were smoothly muscled. Some men might have thought her round breasts too full, but on her tall frame, they just seemed perfect. A brown skirt hung from a thin waist, held in place by a knotted rope. Gleaming thighs and shapely calves made her long legs the stuff of any man's dreams. Then her eyes met mine. Dark, like a midnight sun, they pierced me as if reading my very souls. A slight smile curved her lips, and a knowing eyebrow lifted. Evidently, she was used to being stared at by men. Riley, she said, forget it. I belong to Ira Paracoki. He's a very jealous man. I had a little trouble with her accent, but responded, What makes you think I'm interested in you? She gestured at the panting dogs resting under their heavy packs. Your tongue's hanging out further than theirs. What's the matter? No women where you come from, traitor? None like you. In defense, I said, Women enough. God, she was marvelous. I watched her bend down with a lithe movement to pluck up the armful of fronds she'd cut. She gave me an irritated scowl as she picked her way through the grass to the trail. She looked even better up close, with a triangular face 
and a curiously delicate and straight nose. Her firm chin balanced soft lips and wide cheekbones. My obvious infatuation filled her with a dancing amusement. So, you're the famous northern trader, she stated skeptically. You knew I was coming? Word came down a couple of days ago. We heard that the Okale chief didn't think much of you. He had the silly notion that I was a Patano spy. Are you? No, I indicated my trader's staff with the white feathers dangling from its top. I'm a trader, doing what traders do. I haven't even been in Potano country. They live over by the east coast. I follow the central trail south. Why? Was she being insufferable on purpose? Because I've never been down here before. I've got northern goods to trade for things like spoonbill feathers, taino tobacco, and sea turtle shell. Goods they don't have up north. Time to take the offensive. So, why are you out here all alone? She was giving me a thoughtful appraisal, as though I were a deer haunch. I came to discover what sort of man you are. That threw me. Why would you care? I kept trying not to stare at her breasts, or the narrow waist, or the way her skirt hung on those rounded hips. Was she a sorceress casting a spell on my souls? What would it feel like to run my fingers down her cheek, to see her smile at me? We all have our reasons, she whispered absently. It took all my control to keep from gaping like a fool. What man wouldn't? You travel alone, she asked. For the time being, where's your woman? I don't have one. Are you that difficult to get along with? No, I've just never found the right woman. Most don't like leaving family, clan, and home. Trading can be a lonely business, never along with the same people. I shrugged. It takes a certain sense of adventure to be a trader's wife. You've got to be footloose, I smiled. Free. And you don't think a woman wants to be free? Her head cocked, as if something important balanced on my answer. I gave that some thought before replying. Trading just isn't for women. Traders spend a lot of cold nights sleeping on the ground in the rain. There are days with poor food or an empty belly. What I own is carried on my back or by the dogs. But you are beholden to no man? Only myself and the power of trade, I agreed, then smiled. Fortunately, having only myself to talk to, I win all the arguments. Is that important to you, winning arguments? I was making a joke. I do that, make jokes at my expense. It keeps me from taking myself too seriously. Why? It was as if she were trying to see right down inside my guts, as if somehow sitting in judgment. Judgment for what? Let's just say that if you get slapped around a lot by life, it's better to have a sense of humor. I grinned. And believe me, life does have a habit of hitting you when you're not looking. Her lips curled into a knowing smile, but thoughts churned behind her eyes, masked by a long practice control. Why did she keep looking at me that way? Not that I minded. A woman like her could turn her attention my way any time. The fantasies he ignited started following their own path to a snug bed. Forget it, she repeated. I'm the Iraperacokis. Wife, I asked, gesturing the dogs to follow as she started down the trail, and I matched her pace. She shot me a scathing glance and made a disgusted sound. Luckily, no. But then, were I a wife, I could at least divorce him. As a bound woman... I'm his to do with as he pleases. A pause. And he'd kill you just for looking at me wrong, let alone for trying anything else. That explained a great deal. She was property. Bound women had only a slightly higher status than slaves. I could guess what her life had been like. You've been around the wrong kind of men for too long. And you're different? I'd wipe the drool off my chin before walking into Iraperacoki's great hall and announcing myself. He'd kill me just for drooling? When it comes to me, yes. Then I'll drool carefully. Most men do. I gave her another sidelong inspection. 
She was shooting similar looks my way, as if weighing something. You have a name, I take it? She smiled. I've had lots of them. How are you known to Ira Perakoki? In Timakua, it translates as Pearl Hand. In private, Ira Koki calls me other things. I'm pleased to know you, Pearl Hand. Among the traders, I'm known as Black Shell, a man of the far distant Chikaza. Yes, I know. You have something of a reputation, Black Shell. Even here we have heard of your legendary feats. They say you're quite a gambler. I shrugged. Sometimes I get lucky at a chunky game. I reached back and patted the pack on my back. My chunky lances and bow were protruding from the alligator hide case I carried. And on occasion an arrow goes where it's supposed to. Other than that, it's just talk. I watched the muscles tighten in her delicate jaw. Ira Perakoki fancies himself as a warrior. While Chunky is not a game played around here, his ability with a bow is seldom bettered by any of his warriors. Is that why you've come? To challenge him? I gave her a noncommittal grin. Not particularly. Here on the peninsula, if one will go south, he must pass through the Ira Perakoki's country. Unless, of course, he wants to wade through the swamps off to the west in the Usita lands. But will you trade? I shot her a glance. If Ira Pirakoki has anything I want, Pearl Hand couldn't quite hide the calculation behind her controlled expression. She shifted her load of fronds. What's in the South? Rumors? Stories about bearded, pale skinned men. I've seen the medals, the beads, and the magnificent cloth. Some of the stories are as fantastic as the stories we tell at home to frighten little children. I've heard that these strange men ride giant beasts. Among the Appalachian, I've even seen the alleged skulls of such. The way it's told in the north, the strangers have great floating palaces that ride upon the waves, and their war armor is made of magical metal. I want to see if these stories are true. Then you're a fool. A fool? Her level gaze met mine. Traitor, the stories are true. But the last thing you want is to meet the Christianos. Unless, that is, you wish to spend the rest of your suddenly short life as a slave. They raid for captives along the coast. Those they take are herded into the floating palaces and sailed out to sea. In all my life I've never heard of anyone returning. The rumors are that most slaves are worked to death within a single season. Where? I mean, they can't have that much work in the floating palaces. She gave me the same look she'd give an idiot. They have great islands out in the sea. The slaves there work cutting down trees, clearing fields, mining, growing things, and building huge earthworks. Some of the stories I've heard make no sense, but on one point no one disagrees. These are brutal men with terrible ways. I still want to see them. With a note of exasperation, she asked, Why? So you can become a slave? I'm protected by the power of trade. They obey no laws or rules, Black Shell, and they have no respect for spirit power, at least as far as any of us can see. Walk up to them expecting them to honor the power of trade, and they'll either kill you for the sport of it, or clap one of their metal collars around your neck and lead you off by a metal chain. Everyone believes in the power of trade. She gave me a pitying look. Not the Christianos. You seem to know a lot about them. When I was a little girl, they tried to build a town. My mother went to them, searching for my father. I don't understand. She threw her head back in a most provocative manner, her long hair swaying. I'm Chikora. Does that mean anything to you? I nodded slowly, remembering the stories. From along the coast up north, the bearded white men have been there twice over the years. She continued giving me that look, as if I were remarkably dim. I tried to understand. They took your father, stole him for a slave, and your mother went looking for him? Her expression hardened, her mouth thinning with irritation. My father took my mother from Chikora, kept her until they had filled their great boat with slaves. But on that last night, in the confusion as they were packing, she escaped. When her family discovered she was carrying a bearded brat, they disowned her, 
For reasons beyond my understanding, she went back looking for the man when the Christianos landed a few years later. I was very small then, having but five summers. The Christianos didn't do very well building their town. Some of the things they do are inexplicably stupid. They were starving to death, surrounded by food, things they wouldn't think to eat. Finally, they loaded up and sailed off into the sea. She was kind enough to ignore my gaping stare as I studied her face, her thin nose, the line of her jaw. She gave me a humored glance. You want to see one? A Cristiano? Olada Makoso has one just over west of here. White men show up every so often. Their big boats get wrecked by storms. The survivors, the ones Mother Sea doesn't suck under and drown, wash ashore, usually in a pathetic state. Yes, I would very much like to see one. I have so many questions. The look she gave me sent a shiver down my spine. They are evil, black shell. By ones and twos, they even seem likable. But if they come in groups, run, hide, for if they capture you, it's worse than dying on a square. She referred to the log square unto which captives were tied and slowly tortured to death. Could they really be that bad? And you? I couldn't help but ask. You're one? Or at least half of one? Is this really true? She turned those gleaming midnight eyes on mine. Oh, yes, traitor. Then she performed a saucy sway of her hips. So if they're completely evil, what does that make me? Enticing, I said to Muskogee. To my shocked surprise, she smiled as though coming to a decision, and replied in precise Muskogee, And just what would you do with me? I gaped at her suddenly speechless. Fully aware of my fluster, she added, just what I'd expect from a man. I glanced down at my packs, calculating. What would it take to persuade Ira Paracoki to trade for this woman? Reading my expression, she laughed in a cunning way. More than you've got, traitor. We'd see. Chapter 2 White Bird Lake Town was a typical settlement in the region. The town itself covered a hammock, or hump of raised ground, on the banks of one of the many freshwater lakes that abound in the central peninsula. A low earthen berm supporting a ragged wooden palisade rose above a ditch fed by lake water. The ditch is, of course, defensive, but also serves as a garden for yellow lotus, cattail, spatterdock, and other aquatic plants cultivated by the people. Children learned to harpoon fish along its muddy banks. Inside the fortification, a single charnel house perched atop a low mound on the west, just inside the gate. Iraparakoki's palace dominated a higher mound on the eastern side. The two were built in a direct line with the equinox sunrise. Through the rickety palisade, I could see the houses were thatch-roofed, supported by a wooden frame, and floored with matting, but open-sided, the climate being conducive to such designs, especially in the summer. When trash and shell piles grew large enough, soil would be carted in by the basket load to make a raised floor for a new house, thereby ensuring the structure stood above high water in the rainy season. Let me tell you about the southern Timucua. Farming is a part-time occupation. As a person travels south, the soils become less and less suited to the cultivation of corn, beans, and squash. Being part-time farmers, Iraparakoki's people rely on hunting, fishing, collecting, and trapping as the basis for survival, and their land is rich enough in such resources to support them. Constant low-level warfare and the high death rate for newborn children keeps their numbers low enough that, unlike those of us in the north, they are not as dependent on raised crops to feed a large population. As Pearl Hand and I left the forest and entered the fields skirting the town, a shout went up. I held my trader's staff high at first, ensuring that no one misinterpreted my arrival as threatening. The staff also proved useful for beating off the town dogs that came running and barking, ready to pick a fight. Despite being infatuated with Pearl Hand, the job at hand was to keep my dogs together, announce myself, and ensure that I was received with the respect and honor due a traitor of my stature. Sometimes this included playing my little cane flute as I approached. Walking at Pearl Hand's side, the flute seemed unnecessary. 
Besides, I'm not that good at music. Pearlhan did her part superbly, stepping inside the gate and calling out, A traitor! The legendary Black Shell comes from the north! Notify the Iraparakoki and the priests! Someone prepare food! We are honored to host such a renowned man! I arched an eyebrow and gave an appreciative nod. Meanwhile, women and children were headed my way from across the fields, and with them came the dogs. It's tough to make a grand entrance through the palisade gate when you're jabbing at dogs to keep them away from the trade pack. Fortunately, the local kids seemed to catch on, driving their mutts back with sticks and other thrown debris. Bark looked on with anticipation, but no fight came his way. Gnaw wagged his tail, the white tip flipping back and forth. Squirm sat and tried to scratch his pack off. A wizened old man, white-haired and fragile-looking, came walking down the gate passage. He glanced at Pearl Hand with her load of fronds, and then at me. The look he gave Pearl Hand intrigued me. It smoldered with a reserved hostility. You are the traitor known as Black Shell, he asked, his hands forming the appropriate signs as he spoke. Unlike spoken languages which can be mutually unintelligible from one town to the next, sign language is almost universal. I am so known, I replied in my clumsy Timakua, my hands signing the words. Be it known to the people of this place that I come under the power of trade. May it please the sun, the ancestors, and the great Iraparakoki and his counselors. I, Anakotima Redwing, first counselor of White Bird Lake Town, bid you welcome in the name of the great Iraparakoki and his people. We have heard stories of the traitor called Black Shell. It is said that you bear many wondrous items in your packs, and that you are most generous with your trade. You are said to be an honest man, one who does not take undue advantage of his hosts. The old man rambled on without a breath. Anakotima is a term that can be thought of as something like a combination orator, counselor, palace overseer, and supervisor. For my part, it was all I could do to keep from craning my neck as Pearl Hand disappeared through the gate. I bit off a sigh, turning my attention back to the old man. His job, of course, was to stall me with endless monologue while the town headmen were run down and informed, the chief's house was made ready, and all the rulers and shakers had time to put on their best dress, drape their jewelry, and get their faces painted to perfection. Meanwhile, several women were being delegated the job of gathering up whatever was cooking and delivering it to the chief's house. To do so created the illusion that superb feasts were a boringly common occurrence in Iraparakoki's mound top house. Trader's rule of thumb. The more pompous the chief, the more elaborate the preparations. While the old man rambled on about his town and chief, I watched the local women scurrying in from the fields. Most carried baskets. Some braced on their hips, others hung from tump lines, colorful straps that went around the forehead, suspending the burdened basket just above the hips. As they ducked past, they'd give me shy smiles, then hurry through the gate. They wore field dress, which consisted of a skirt of frond fiber, undecorated, and held at the waist with a rope. Most had their hair up, secured with bits of carved shell or tied with decorated string. The children appeared healthy, but in this country, if you made it past five, it was due to a tough constitution. The Timakua lands weren't for the frail of mind or body. Old Redwing was droning on about the fertility of Iraparakoki's lands, and how it had given his warriors the strength to conquer all the surrounding towns, when a delegation of warriors and head men appeared in the gate behind him. One of the painted warriors leaned close, whispered in the old man's ear, and stepped back. I gave the fellow a casual inspection. He had a string of dried human ears hung around his neck. Trophies from raids, no doubt. When he looked my way and our gazes met, I knew just who he was. The completely arrogant and slightly bitter subchief. The one who reeked of ambition and thought himself superior to everyone but the high chief. It was in the way the man stood, in his flexed shoulders and smirky expression. He looked at me as if I were just some foreign fisherman come to trade. As much as I hated guys like him, my job was to trade. And maybe steal Pearl Hand. 
The old man took a deep breath, raising his hands. Great trader Black Shell, and Neha stalks the mist, has just informed me that all is prepared. We welcome you to White Bird Lake Town in the name of Ira Paracoki. Come to this place, in the sight of the sun and ancestral spirits, and join us in sharing the Ira Paracoki's hospitality. Redwing bowed, then turned leading the way. From behind the houses, the hollow blaring of conch horns announced our entry. I signaled my dogs to stay close, and dutifully followed the old orator while warriors lined up on either side of us. Smoke rose from evening fires that had been built in shallow pits before the open-sided houses, and people crowded around, anxious to see the trader. Ira Paracoki no doubt received a great many visitors and delegations. Such things came with the conqueror's exalted chair. But strange traders were always a novelty. We marched past the charnel house on its mound. The distinctive and cloying smell caused my nose to quiver. Like most peoples, the peninsular Timakua carry their freshly deceased to the charnel house. There, with great ceremony, the corpse is washed and cared for. Among some people the bones are immediately fleshed. Among others the body is allowed to slowly decompose. No matter what the process, this is all accomplished with precise rituals and great humility to reassure the souls of the dead that they are still loved and valued. Why? Among the Timakua, it is believed that with the proper incentive, a dead person's souls will join the ranks of the ancestors who forever buzz around the living like some sort of spirit bees. These ancestral ghosts do good work by repulsing witchcraft or illness and deflecting evil influences from the spirit world. Sometimes they can appear in a person's dreams and offer sage advice. And me? Among my Chikasa, it was believed that people had five souls. The most important of these is the life soul that travels westward to the edge of the world. There, the soul encounters a cliff, a sheer drop over an abyss. Only in early spring does the seeing hand constellation appear just across the way. In the center of the hand is a dark opening or I. The soul of the dead must leap through, and only then can it seek the path of the dead. I've always been sensitive about charnel houses, probably because my body isn't likely to end up in one. Exiles such as myself rarely meet kind fates. Nevertheless, I touched my forehead as I passed the charnel house. The Timakua, like everyone else, appreciates strangers respectful of their traditions. Towns have unmistakable odors, wood smoke from cook fires, the charnel house, the delightful aroma of latrines and garbage piles, and of course, the musk of so many humans. Each town is unique when entered, then it seems to blend in with the memories of so many others. White Bird Lake Town reminded me of musty, rotting cattails. The southern Timakuans excel in wood carving. As I passed, I admired the lifelike renderings of pelicans, deer, raccoons, anhigas, and various fish. One house was supported by posts carved into the shapes of leaping dolphins, the roof itself perched on their noses. Inside the open verandas, I could see detailed reliefs showing birds, hunters, and deer. These had been painted with great care, and would have demanded a high minko's ransom and trade up north. I followed my escort across a small plaza. Unlike our great plazas in the north, this was little more than an oblong space between the houses. Ira Paracoki's palace stood atop a long, flat, earthen mound on the eastern edge of town. A dirt ramp led up to the building's front. Two exquisitely carved cougars with elongated bodies stood as guardians at the ramp top. Each had been carved from a single piece of wood, the cats rendered in a sitting position, their heads high, mouths open as if roaring. Their eyes had been inlaid with polished shell. Behind them the palace was a grand building with an open front. Each of the poles that supported the roof had been carved to represent different animals at the base, the upper portion of the poles seeming to rise from their heads. The man I took to be Ira Paracoki stood in the center. His broad shoulders, thick chest, and belly showed the effects of too many feasts, 
and not enough days on the war trail. Tattoos of sunbursts and dotted lines decorated his broad face, and did little to ameliorate his cunning dark eyes. The man's skin was liberally greased, not only for protection against the mosquitoes, but to accent his fading tattoos. Greased hair had been pulled high atop his head and tied into a bun. What must have been half of the white swan feathers in the southern peninsula had been stuck into it to create a starburst effect. A loose-fitting apron, into which a panther design had been woven, hung from his thick hips. Sunlight gleamed on the white shell gorget that dangled down over his chest, and another twenty or thirty strings of shell beads obscured his neck. He gave me a casual inspection as I walked up the ramp and stopped before him. At my signal, my dogs dropped onto their bellies, happy to rest under their packs. To Iraparakoki's right were two old men and an absolutely ancient old woman. Each had skin that consisted of little more than sagging wrinkles and faded tattoos. Their white hair barely held the few colorful feathers atop their heads. Given their undershot jaws, I doubt there was a single tooth left between the three of them. On the right stood the warriors, four muscular men, arms tattooed with rings, stars, and what looked like bird heads. Starbursts were done in dark blue, black, and red dye over each breast. Ornate wooden war clubs rested easily atop their crossed arms. The thin face stalks the mist with his necklace of dried human ears, took his place in front of them. As sub-chief, or Aniha, he was subordinate to Ira Parakoki. Anakotima Redwing retreated to the side and cried out, I present Black Shell, a trader from the Chikasa from the far north. He comes under the power of trade and would share the great Iraparakoki's hospitality. In the flat, at the foot of the mound, a crowd had gathered. People were talking among themselves, waiting to see what happened. He is welcome, Iraparakoki said with great ceremony. Let it be known to all that Black Shell can walk freely in the Iraparakoki's lands, and that no ill may befall him as long as he behaves by the power of trade. All eyes fixed on me. I thank the Iraparakoki for his warm welcome. My purpose here is to trade, and then to pass through the Iraparakoki's lands causing no harm. I welcome your warm hospitality and in return shall regale you with stories of wondrous things that I have seen in my travels, and such news as may be of interest to you and your people. I give this freely in return for your kind reception. Iraparakoki clapped his hands and then, calling, Bring food! In a lower voice, he added, I regret, good trader, that we had no word of your coming. Had we, a feast such as you have never enjoyed would have been laid before you, as it is, we pray that you will not judge us to be base and callous hosts, but we have only modest fare to set before you on such short notice. A starving man never complains, great Iraparakoki, I smiled. Then we shall see to your hollow belly first thing, he continued most graciously. Over the years I've developed a sense for men. Iraparakoki was watching me the way a kestrel did a meadow vole. That set my teeth on edge. He should have been mildly curious, intrigued at the arrival of a noted trader, and hoping for an evening of diversion from the usual. Why, then, was I getting this rapacious look? Arrangements were made for the dogs in my packs. A great fire was laid and lit. Steaming pots appeared from all over, women bearing them up the ramp like offerings, having wrapped them in old garments or carrying them on litters made of sticks to keep from burning their hands. Someone had surrendered half of a deep-pitted roast deer, and breads made of cattail and smilax root appeared as if from thin air. Arriving at supper time is an old trader's trick. And then she appeared. In the growing gloom she emerged from the back of the chief's house. Gone was the drab dress. Her freshly washed hair was decorated with white feathers and bits of polished shell that accented those raven locks. Shell bracelets made a clattering as she moved her arms. No less than twenty necklaces of shell, bone, and colored wooden beads hung from her slim neck. A striking white skirt clung to her hips and swayed suggestively with each step.
Every eye in town was fixed on her as she walked so elegantly up to the great fire. For protection against the evening mosquitoes, Pearl Hand had greased her skin with a combination of pacoon and other herbs that discouraged the vicious little bloodsuckers. The perhaps unintended result was that every curve of her marvelous body reflected the fire's light. When I managed to tear my gaze from her, it was to see Iriperakoki staring almost breathlessly. The man's pulse was jetting in his neck, his eyes dilated, mouth hanging in a soft O. He wasn't the only one. Only the ancient priestess seemed unaware. Pearlhan glanced around, flashing a knowing smile. Then she fixed her liquid dark gaze on me, an eyebrow arching in challenge, as if to say, Well, do you really think he'll part with me? Chapter 3 Trade is a sacred concept, revered among all peoples in our part of the world. Through it, articles move from people to people, but there is more. The spiritual aspect. Everything is born of power, derived from ripples of creativity that breath-giver exhaled into the world. When something is made, say a copper pendant, the craftsman takes a bit of raw copper and meticulously pounds it flat. He places the copper on a carved wooden mold, and then uses bone or antler dowels to carefully press the copper down over the mold. This must be done ever so slowly, lest the thin metal tear or ripple. Or perhaps it is a shell carver who laboriously cuts a large round piece from a whelk or conch shell. His concentration, creativity, and ability all go into the piece as he meticulously engraves a revered design or depicts a scene from one of the sacred stories. Power has gifted him with this skill, and part of that gift is imprinted into the piece he creates. So, too, is a reflection of an artisan's souls, imbuing his work with a bit of himself. I've seen woodcarvers in the final act of carving physically breathe life into their creations. Anything made flows from spirit power, from breath-giver's exhalation. Hence trade is about the movement of spirit between peoples, not just the meaningless exchange of pretty trinkets. And then there's the unique relationship between the trader and the party he's dealing with. Relationships are the basis of life, whether it is with other nations, between people, with the spirit world, or even with the plants and animals we rely on for survival. A shell carver up on the Tennessee River cannot practice his craft without the movement of whelk and conch north from the Gulf. A healer among the Calusa can't cure certain diseases without medicinal plants from far inland. Trade can be likened to the blood flow of creation. The result is that trade, too, is an art. How many times have I talked to young boys, wild with the dream of running off to become a trader? In their imaginations they see the adventure and excitement, but not the reality. Trade doesn't just happen. It must be orchestrated and is best considered as a grand game of strategy. I didn't just walk into a strange town and exchange a Muscogee pot for a Calusa carving. It was never that simple. Instead, an intricate game of hawk and mouse had to be played. Sometimes I had to barter for days, exchanging a bag of corn for two sacks of clamshells. I traded them in turn for heron feathers, that I exchanged for the Appalachian pot, that I traded for two bags of corn. See where this is going? Hoping to wrap Pearl Hand into my bed soonest, I laid all of my trade out for Iriperakoki's inspection the morning after the feast. Fact was, I didn't think it would take much. When it came to trade, I was a rich man. The copper alone should have been worth any captive woman's value, even if she were a chief clan matron. Add the carved shell, the buffalo wool, the spirit plants and dyes from up north, the furs, the wooden carvings. Well, I should have been able to buy the whole town. The day was partly cloudy, with the breeze blowing in from the south. Iraparakoki, as was his right, inspected my trade, saying nothing, though his eyes lingered on the skeins of buffalo wool. Then he made a gesture with his hand, and people, one by one, according to rank and status, came up to see what I had.
While trade was brisk all morning, mostly trinkets in return for the usual bags of corn, dried turkey meat, colorful feathers, paint pigments, and so forth, Irapera Koki just observed. You'd think he was a Muscogee High Minko instead of a petty southern Timakua war chief. Every time he'd walk over and look at one of the more valuable pieces, Pearl Hand would scoff, saying something like, That gorget, great one? I've seen them in the north. Most of the outlying farmers wear them as tokens to call rain to parched fields. Of course, the peninsula needed no more rain that year. Worse, it was a bald lie, and she knew it. The piece in question was of Yuchi design, their most sacred image of the sky world, and only the elite in the chief clan could wear it. Why are you doing this, woman? Do you seriously want to stay with this oversized two-legged windbag? I ground my teeth, struggling to keep my expression in check. Blood and pus, she's playing with me. Red Wing rose to his feet as two sweaty young men came trotting across the plaza, then climbed the ramp. They both dropped to their knees just short of the porch, heads down. Red Wing, ever the immaculate Arankatima, strode over and bent toward them, glistening as they spoke. He nodded, making a gesture with the flat of his hand to order them to stay, then hurried to Iraparakoki, whispering in his ear. The man made a face, muttered back to Red Wing, and strolled over to his raised bench. There he sat, arranged his apron, preened his hair, and with a gesture, signaled Red Wing. I watched the two runners scurry up to kneel at the feet of their great leader. It was the opportunity I'd been waiting for. What are you doing? I asked Pearl Hand. For the moment, there was no one within earshot. I couldn't read the thoughts behind her pensive eyes. Traitor, how badly do you want me? So much it makes my heart ache. But the question is, do I want you? But I thought, what? That I'd allow myself to be traded off for a few trinkets? Is that all I'm worth to you? I sputtered, unable to respond. She sniffed in disdain. Oh no, Black Shell. If you want to lie with me, even for a night or two, you'll pay what I think I'm worth. Do you really want to stay with him? Do I want to go off with some scruffy trader and his flea-bitten dogs? Absolutely not. But I will go with a smart and cunning man who values me as a challenging and capable partner. Partner? That set me back. Her eyes seemed to enlarge as she stared into mine. For a moment I thought I was drowning. Are you that man, Black Shell? I could be of great service to you in your trade if you're smart enough to meet me halfway. Her lips parted the slightest bit, as if an invitation. Lost in her gaze, I'd forgotten to breathe. Partner. I must have been gaping like an idiot. She just gave me that challenging arch of her eyebrow in reply, then walked over to stretch out on a shaded mat. She stared at me, eyes measuring. She didn't even glance over at where Irapera Koki was ranting at the two hapless runners. Whatever news they'd brought wasn't making Irapera Koki's day pleasant. Partner? Was she serious? The idea was outlandish. Among my people, women and men were prescribed to specific roles. Different and anything but equal. Men could be partners. But a man and a woman? I was still trying to get my head around that, and my heart beat back to normal when the Irapera Koki stomped back. His lips were set in a pout. Then he growled, Fools! Do they want me to go down there with a war party and break a few heads? Do you play Chunky? I asked hoarsely, ignoring his frustration. Pearl Hand had me that flustered. No, traitor. I make war on idiot subchiefs who refuse to follow my instructions. From the moment the idiot in question seemed to be the Paracousi in Sandhill Town. His tribute is half of what it should be. Half! The fool thinks that just because a whirlwind flattened his town, he's not responsible for the shell beads he promised me. Some say you're very good with a bow. I pointed to a small wooden statue of his. Perhaps we should shoot at marks for that piece you have. My trade certainly doesn't seem to excite you. Pearl Hand watched this with subtle amusement. She was lounging like a great cat, her sinuous body stretched out on the cattail mat. A slight breeze fingered her glossy black hair. 
Ira Perakoki shot another glance at the skeins of buffalo wool. For the most part, buffalo hair had to be imported from the north. While buffalo had once ranged all the way down the peninsula, their numbers always reflect population. More people means more hunting pressure, means less buffalo. Ira Perakoki gave me a slight smile. I have something you might trade for. Oh, I'm sure you do, I answered with a smile, hoping he didn't see my triumphant glance at Pearl Hand. To my surprise, he walked back into the recesses of the chief's house, appearing moments later with a long, leather-wrapped item. At the sight of it, Pearl Hand's eyebrow arched. Then she turned speculatively to watch my reaction. Ira Perakoki dropped to his knees and slowly unwound the leather from a long metal sword. Among my people, we make swords of stone. These are very rare and valuable and owned by the high minkos, tissue minkos, and hopaya, or holy men. Chipped of a single piece of flawless chert, only the finest flint nappers can craft one. Such swords, almost as long as a man's arm, have only one use, the ritual sacrifice of prisoners. The sword Irapera Koki presented was unlike anything I had ever seen. The handle was leather, wrapped with a metal wire. The blade, a muddy brown in color, was clearly metal of some sort, but the cross piece that made the handguard was silver. I'd seen silver before. Little nuggets of it are still traded down from the far north. It's Cristiano, Irapera Koki told me, taken from one who was shipwrecked among the Tequista. Their chief sacrificed the man to mother's son a couple of years back and sent this to me as a token of his respect. I took the blade, marveling at the light weight and how the handle seemed to fit the hand. I ran my fingers along the weapon's gritty but still sharp edge. Then I ran a thumbnail along the flat, fascinated by the slight ringing noise it made. If they could make something like this, what other marvels did the Christianos possess? It's so light. I whispered. Not so light a Cristiano can't slice your arm off with it, Pearl Hand said dryly. It's stronger than you'd think. Almost impossible to break. The Cristianos keep them polished and oiled. She cast a dismissive glance at Ira Perakoki. A wise man would take better care of such a fine blade. Ira Perakoki's backhanded blow caught Pearl Hand by complete surprise, rocking her head back. The slap of it made me jump. The Ira Perakoki doesn't need a stupid woman to tell him his business, he roared. Pearl Hand averted her eyes as she raised a hand to her cheek. In that instant, I could have run him through with the blade and seen just how effective the Cristiano weapon was. Perhaps several years before, I might have. That I lived this long proved I'd picked up a little sense and experience. I was bound under the power of trade. One doesn't murder one's host under the power particularly when said host is disciplining his own property. And there was the practical aspect. I wouldn't have made it off the chief's mound alive. Every warrior in the town would have felt honor-bound to kill me on the spot. No, this was a thing for clever minds. Pearl Hand's humiliation and rage were apparent, but I forced myself to ignore it and concentrated on how to work the trade. Ira Perakoki was reading every twist my plotting brain was taking. The knowing smile on his fat lips was beginning to irritate me. He said, If you leave all your trade here and come back later with just as much, I might let you have that sword. I snorted, as if at a ridiculous notion. He'd entered the game. No, for such a silly trinket as this, I hefted the sword. You ask too much. Then what is enough? he countered. That gorge of pearl hand thinks is so common, and perhaps your choice of three of my copper pieces and several of the pouches of medicine plants. I paused, as though pained. And I'll throw in that buffalo wool. He threw his head back and laughed. And you think my offer is ridiculous? Well, what would I do with a Cristiano's sword? You can't call it any kind of practical weapon. It's certainly no use for hunting deer and it won't give a man any more advantage in single combat than a war club. Why me? I take a good bow and carefully fletched arrows any day. You won't trade any bow for that blade, he muttered. My bow's not for trade. I paused thoughtfully. 
Of all my possessions, I'd never part with it. He glanced mildly at me. And why is that? Because the bow is special. It has a unique spirit power. If I call on the power of the bow, I cannot be beaten in a contest no matter how skilled an opponent may be. I gestured at my trade. What would the wealth of the world be against that? Pearlhan's expression had changed from seething anger to blatant amazement. She was giving me the kind of look she'd give a raving maniac. Ira Perakoki continued laughing from down deep in his gut. You expect me to believe that you've never lost a competition? Not since I obtained that bow. And where did you get it? I stole it from a Thai snake's lair, under the bank of the Alba Amaha River. I lied. Actually, I traded for it with a caddo from way out west. But by the power of the bow, I must tell you the truth. There is one man the bow will not let me beat. One man? he asked. Who? I don't know yet. Ira Perakoki narrowed his eyes skeptically. You don't know? I'm told the man who finally outshoots me will be the greatest warrior who ever lived. His life will be the stuff of legends. Young men will sing his praises for generations after he is finally dead of old age. Ira Perakoki cocked his head. I think you spin stories like an old woman spins cord, out of anything around. You're playing me, traitor. Sorry, you're not fooling me with your fantastic creations. I stiffened, sniffing in mock disdain. I create nothing. Really? He was on the verge of rising, taking back the sword and leaving. All of my trade, I said firmly. I'll wager all of it that my words are true. My skill with the bow against yours. The best of five shots to determine the winner. Your reputation as an archer is known as far north as Alocaliquin Town. I hesitated until he opened his mouth to speak, and quickly added, But I understand if you won't take the challenge. It wouldn't be a fair contest you against me, not while I use my bow. Not fair? A sly appraisal hid behind his eyes. Well, not worth losing your reputation over. Not that people would speak ill of you. It's a thing of power. He was remembering the part of the story where I'd mentioned the world's greatest warrior who would beat me. He had to ask, And what if you win? I tapped the sword flat with my knuckles. I keep this and Pearl Hand. I could feel her interest, but kept my eyes locked with Ira Paracokis. The sword, he said softly, but not the woman. As you wish, great chief. That being the case, I'll take my trade and continue on my way south in the morning. I'm sorry that we'll never know. It would have been a great contest between us. He'd expected any response but this one. Stakes are too high for you? I shook my head. Too low. You see, it's a failing among us Chikaza that goes back to the way we perceive power, the forces that underlie the very creation of the earth by Breathgiver. You ask me to wager everything, years' worth of trade, while you will wager only a small part of your wealth. Were I to accept, power would perceive me a fool and ensure that I lost. He nodded, considering my words. Even this far south, people understood the Muscogee principles of red and white power. He glanced thoughtfully out at two large herons flying along the palisade. Beyond, several canoes bobbed on the lake as fishermen pulled in lengths of netting. Sunlight cast sparkles on the water, and in the distance, the lumpy green horizon of trees contrasted with low, fluffy clouds. Ira Perakoki said, There is no man among my warriors better with a bow than I. I understand your reluctance to damage your power, but it was the disappointment on his face that filled me with joy. Sometimes the willingness to walk away from trade is the most important incentive of all. Oh, yes, I had him. This ends Disc 1. Coming of the Storm, Disc 2. Chapter 4 all through my early years, I had been trained to observe and study how people think and act. That said, to be a successful trader, one has to entice another person to one's point of view. Trading is like warfare in many ways. 
The goal is to obtain something. In a trader's case, as in a war chief's, strategy and tactics are employed. A trader must understand the basics of behavior, especially those of a high chief's. The following morning, just after breakfast, I left my packs under the Ira Paracoki's guard, took my bow and bird arrows, and called my dogs to me. Leaving the packs was a calculated risk on my part. I know my trade, how many pieces of shell, how the knots are tied on the medicine sacks, and the precise count of bone beads and feathers. I would indeed be the wiser should one or two pieces be missing, or even if a pinch of herb had been removed from a sack. The disadvantage would be, if half of my goods were missing when I returned, especially if Iraparakoki swore on the sacred honor of his ancestors that no one had touched the trade. Does a single trader dare call a prickly chief a thief? Not if he wishes to tell the tale. My advantage, and what made it worth the risk, was that Iraparakoki was probably bound by the power of trade. Second, and what I was counting on, was that he couldn't resist the temptation to finger through the packs. Then he'd spent a hand's time obsessed by the wealth. Greed is a wonderful thing. Traders live off it. The dogs and I proceeded out through the gate as though we had no concern in the world. I'd wave, calling a cheery greeting to the people we passed. I acted like a man without a care, interested only in a morning hunt. The way led through the scanty cornfields and past the stands of cultivated goosefoot, corn, and sable palm. Off to the right stood a series of raised wooden boxes surrounded by colored poles decorated with feathers. Such sights are common among the peoples of the peninsula. I've already told how, when someone dies, the corpse is taken to the charnel house. Among the southern Timucua, I had learned family and friends hold vigil for four days, pray, and make offerings to the souls of the dead. After the fourth day, the priest cuts off the limbs and head, removes the entrails, heart, and other organs. These latter are taken out and offered to the vultures and crows. The still flesh bones are stripped of meat and then placed in a large jar of water until the last of the flesh comes loose. After the bones are completely cleaned, they are taken out and placed in these raised plank boxes. There they will wait until the winter solstice, when they are collected, and, at the height of the ceremony, buried in the town's burial mound. The purpose of this is to ensure that the souls of the dead remain happy and close to the living. If all is done correctly, the spirits will return in dreams and visions, sharing their wisdom from the afterlife. Hopefully, they will also protect the living from witchery, curses, and evil that might cause havoc. Should a trader like me die while in the town's proximity, his body will be dumped in the nearest river. You never know about a stranger's ghost. Better to leave his souls unmourned and conveniently disoriented so that they go off to haunt somewhere else. I headed north up the trail I had traveled with Pearl Hand. With the dogs coursing ahead, I broke into a trot, my bow in hand, the alligator hide quiver bouncing on my back. The way led into the trees, and I was just catching my wind, grateful for the exercise. The dogs enjoyed a chance to crash through the brush, seeking rabbits, voles, and squirrels. I was giving them the opportunity to run free, and they relished every moment. The sun hadn't moved a finger's distance across the sky before I stopped, inspecting a trail that led off into the brush. Then I glanced back surreptitiously, seeing a lone man trotting along some distance behind me. He seemed to be staring absently at something off to his left. I recognized him. Stalks the mist, the guy with a necklace of dried human ears. Maybe they helped his hearing. Slapping a hand to my thigh to call the dogs, I trotted off down the side trail, then backtracked, leaped off to the right, and into a thick patch of grass. I then zigzagged, using a half-hearted attempt at hiding my trail. Of course, with five dogs bashing their way through the underbrush, it wasn't much of a serious endeavor. I finally found what I was looking for, a small clearing bounded by low brush grown through with grass. Just the thing to absorb an arrow's impact without damaging it. The grass at my feet gave a ripping sound as I tore it loose and twisted it into small loop around the circumference of my fist. Stepping off twenty paces, 
I tied it onto brush stems and returned to my mark before pulling up my bow and stringing it. Bird arrows must be perfectly crafted, absolutely straight, and fly with perfection. Most birds, after all, are small targets. Bird arrows don't have stone heads, but are blunt dowels of wood, meant to break bones and knock a bird flat so it can't fly away. Mine had provided many a meal while on the trail. Drawing the arrow, I knocked it, drew back, and picked out my target circle of grass. Siding over the blunt head, I released and watched it sail dead center through the grass circle. The dogs were chasing around, creating a ruckus, and I called them to me. They burst through the brush, tails wagging, tongues lolling, with the look of sheer delight in their eyes. You come lie down now, I ordered, giving them the signal to drop flat. Bark and Skipper, always thinking of their comfort first, found shade and flopped down. The others just lay down where they were, taking time to scratch and watch me with lazy eyes. I took another couple of shots until I heard Squirm growl. He had his head fixed on a patch of palmettos a little more than a hundred paces away. Bark, always ready to live up to his name, rolled onto his stomach, his thick head craning as he searched for the trouble. Quiet, I said softly. No barks, no growls, understand? I drew back, aimed slightly to the right of the grass ring, and watched my shot skim harmlessly past. I shook my head slowly, then went to retrieve my arrow. Just before making the next shot, I noticed a big black beetle crawling along beneath the target and pulped him with a center hit. I shook my head again, plodding dejectedly over to stare down and kick at the unoffending grass with an irritated foot. Squirm, bless his little canine heart, remained fixed on the distant palmettos as if he'd seen a deer or a quail. I pretended to ignore him. Enjoying myself, I drove the next three shots through the target's center, chortling happily as I retrieved my arrows. The next shot I aimed at a snail on a blade of grass that stood to one side. The broad point blasted him to oblivion, but I cursed loudly under my breath as I walked out and propped my hand disgustedly on my hip. Finding my arrow, I left the circle of grass hanging from the bush and did nothing to disguise the gashes my missus had made in the damp soil. Come on, dogs, I hollered just loud enough. The way I keep missing, you'd think someone witched the arrow. I never allowed myself so much as a glance at that patch of palmettos before I stomped out of the clearing, my movements those of an unhappy man. On the way back, I went slowly stomping once in the trail to pull out my bird arrows, and one by one glance along their perfectly straight shafts. I made an effort of double-checking the fletching. I muttered to myself, shaking my head before replacing them in the alligator hide quiver. As I strolled into Iriparacoki's town, people were polite, nodding, and smiling. I trotted up the ramp, seeing Iriparacoki on his veranda, a cluster of his sub-chiefs gathered around in a circle. A huge whelk shell cup that contained black drink sat to one side. Black drink is the sacred tea made from a certain variety of holly leaves. It is only used on special occasions involving state business, religious observances, and sacred ceremonies. The presence of black drink meant Iriparacoki was doing official business. A quick inspection of my packs proved satisfying. They'd been gone through, as I'd hoped, but everything seemed to be present, though I didn't individually count the feathers. It would have looked bad since Iriparacoki was shooting evaluative glances my way. Pearl Hands stepped out of the back, and I fought the desire to grin. She looked stunning, her long black hair hanging down her back, a bright yellow skirt knotted at her slim waist. Pearl Hand glanced at Iriparacoki and his counsel, then turned her evaluative eyes my way. As she walked over, her bare feet whispered on the woven floor mats. I pulled out a carved wooden sculpture, a rendering of an eagle on a flat piece of wood that I'd obtained in Ocale. Then I straightened. I've got to go find food for my dogs. Want to come? She glanced at the council, her lips quirking in a curious way, her expression oddly amused. I would. Doing so will infuriate Iriparacoki. 
payment for that slap he gave me. He might just give you another one, or worse. Not if I tell him I used the time to discover if you were determined to take all your trade away. Besides, it would be a chance to see a master trader at work. A pause. You didn't do so well with the Ira Parakoki today. I did well enough. After ordering the dogs to stay and guard the packs, we started down the ramp. I could feel Ira Parakoki's eyes on me. Could almost sense his irritation that I was with Pearl Hand. As we reached the bottom, Aniha stalks the mist past, giving me a slight nod. Did he ever go anywhere without his necklace of human ears? The man's face wore a curious expression, as if he knew something I didn't. Then his gaze fixed on Pearl Hand's high breasts, and that irritating smirk bent his lips. He was still staring even after we'd passed. Who is that warrior? The Aniha. Her voice was filled with distaste. Most everyone just calls him Ears. I take it you don't like him. He thinks that when Ira Parakoki finally tires of me, I'll be gifted to him. You have my sympathy. Then you really will leave without me? Pearl Hand said ironically. Possibly. Ira Parakoki doesn't appear tempted by my trade. He was full of himself last night. She nodded back towards Ira Parakoki's counsel. He lays the fact that you wouldn't wager against him to his prowess with a bow. According to him, word of his abilities has traveled long and far. Long and far mean different things to different people in different places. As we passed the houses, I was taking note of where game was strung up on the racks to smoke. Most consisted of ducks, fish, and other treats. Traders who valued their dogs tried to keep them from eating fowl, especially cooked. The bones splintered in the gut, and it wasn't a pleasant way for a valued animal to die. And where were you off to this morning? Pearl Hand asked. It was a topic of considerable speculation. And if I know your chief, no little suspicion. He gets wary about strangers wandering off into the forest. I was looking for birds but didn't find any, and I needed a little target practice, just to keep the edge. You know, if you're a pair of Koki, decided to change his mind. How did you do? I'm glad the man turned me down. Somehow, power didn't seem to favor my skills. Losing a whole load of trade like that would take months to recover, not to mention what it would do to my reputation. But your bow is blessed, remember? You can only be beaten by the greatest warrior alive. And fortunately for me, if he's the chief here, he wasn't interested in proving the fact. I'll keep my mouth shut in the future. I finally found what I was looking for in the form of a deer quarter, freshly skinned, hanging from a door frame. Greetings, I called, and a middle-aged woman emerged from around the corner of her house. She nodded pleasantly, then her expression dropped as she realized who accompanied me. Pearl Hand seemed to have that effect on the locals, well, with all of them but ears. Greetings yourself, traitor. The woman turned her attention back to me, but she crossed her arms defensively. How can I help? I produced the little carving. I just happen to have this obtained from Ocali Town. It's a masterful work, and I wondered if you would trade for that deer quarter. She took the piece, glancing distastefully at Pearl Hand, and inspected the carving. From Ocale, you say? Like your people, they revere Eagle and the virtue he can bestow on a household. Generally, these are placed above house doors to invoke good luck. She held the flat piece of wood up to the light, inspecting it. Fine workmanship. Excellent attention to detail. Almost as good as we make here. The man who made it said that he used wood from a tree where eagles nest. I tapped it with a fingernail. Over time, it is said such wood absorbs the bird's power. She nodded, shot an evaluative look at the deer haunch, and added, I've got a marriage to attend in a couple of days. It would make a good gift. Within moments, I had the deer quarter, and we turned our steps back toward the chief's mound. She didn't seem to like you, I noted. Most consider me a foreign woman with too much influence on their chief. The dry way she said it brought a smile to my lips. Do you? Do I what? Have too much influence? Her laughter hinted of mockery. Traitor, I've been all over. 
the sprawling and insignificant empire Irapera Koki has built, exists only because no one else would want this country, let alone the squalid little towns he has managed to cow into paying tribute. Look at the soil. With the exception of a few fields, it's wrong for growing corn. Mostly these people hunt and fish, collect roots, and scramble around for food. If they had anything of real value, someone like the Calusa down south would have crushed them and taken it away. How did you get here? She shrugged. To save you the long story, I was running away from a man and charged full into one of Iraparakoki's deer hunts. You know, a surround where all the hunters form a circle and close in. I just happened to be in the middle of it. By the time I was caught, my pursuer, a Hororo subchi from over east by the coast, caught up. He wasn't properly deferential to Iraparakoki. Poor man. His skull still hangs above Iraparakoki's bed. The lines at the corners of her lips tightened. I reach up and pat him every so often, a reminder of old times. I'll try to stay on your good side. Sometimes I wonder if power isn't punishing me for being who I am. Maybe it's my father's blood. She gave me a searching look that went all the way to my soul. Some say I bring bad luck. Traders live on luck, don't they? We live mostly on tricks, patience, and skill, I replied, slowing our pace to enjoy every moment with her. She made a gesture with her slender arm, the fingers bird-like and delicate. You could have any woman in the town for the right trade. Why are you fixed on me? Sometimes it just happens, Pearl Hand. It was the moment I first saw you beside the trail. I shook my head. You already know you're a beautiful woman but there's something about you, a quality of soul that fascinates me. A quality of soul, she repeated softly, stepping slowly, her hair swaying. Traitor, these souls have been battered and scarred, but you're free to make up any fantasies you like. A somber pause. I'm used to being the stuff of men's fantasies. Maybe you should just have a chance to be yourself for a while. And who is that? she wondered. I wouldn't know if I encountered her, and I'm not sure I'd like her if I did. That's a hard attitude to take. She gave me another of those suspicious glances. You're a hard man yourself. What drove you, a Chikaza, in good health to forego your own people? I can see it in your eyes, like a hard callus that's grown over the souls. You, too, are a bitter man in your own way. I avoided her eyes, inspecting the heavy deer quarter. My people and I, we had a little disagreement. Amusement hid in her voice. Oh, yes, Chikaza warriors can be so touchy about little disagreements. Tell me, it wasn't a matter of your silly Chikaza honor, was it? You people have the reputation for being much too preoccupied with putting on fronts, strutting around with all the pomp of mating turkeys and believing yourself superior to all others. You don't think I'm superior? I cast it as a joke. I knew full well what other people thought of the Chikaza. They made jokes about how the Chikazas didn't learn to walk until a lance had been shoved up their rears. Many a riotous moment was had by mimicking Chikaza mating, generally with a wooden phallus the length of a man's leg strapped about the waist. The joke was that the man in the charade couldn't manage to lower himself to his waiting woman without jamming it into the dirt and getting stuck halfway like an awkward tripod. It's too bad you won't reconsider, she said as we stepped onto the ramp. I might have liked spending time in your company. Yes, well, traitor, Iraparakoki bellowed from the veranda above. The council had apparently broken up. I strode up, dropping the deer quarter for the dogs to demolish. To my relief, Bark didn't pick a fight when Fetch sank his teeth into the thick haunch. Araparakoki came striding across the matting, a grin on his face. I have given second thoughts to your challenge. I shall take your wager. The contents of your packs against the Cristiano sword and the woman here. I caught sight of ears standing back in the shadows. The fool wouldn't have been more obvious if he still had palmetto fronds stuck in his hair. Pearlhand glanced at ears, then back at me, an amused smile playing at her lips. Iraparakoki missed it, his attention fixed on my packs. 
I could see the excitement in his eyes as if he were already fingering his new property. He added, Yes, things are indeed turning your way. While you will not win my sword, word has just come that Christianos have arrived in the big bay several days march west of here. A great many of their floating palaces are just off the Uzita coast. Some of the smaller vessels have entered the harbor, and the large ones are offloading to obtain a shallow draft to pass the harbor entrance. Perhaps after you lose everything to me, you can start over by stealing from them. His grin went tight. Assuming they don't catch you and make a slave out of you. To set the hook, I shook my head. I'm not so sure that I want to shoot against you. That was yesterday. No, better that I... The woman and the Cristiano sword, Black Shell. His grin widened. Surely your blessed bow won't let you lose. Or was that just the silly tale I thought it was? I gave him a pained expression. I suppose if I don't gamble against you, the story will be all over the peninsula. Tales have feet of their own. They go where they will. I sighed. All right, but only half of my— All of it, he growled, as you said yesterday. Or do you mock the power of trade and go back on your word? I glanced at Pearl Hand, aware that her large eyes had taken on a strange gleam. I fought the urge to reach out and run my fingers along her smooth cheek. Very well, Ira Paracoki. Let's see which of us power favors. Evaluation She sat on the high Minko's raised dais at the far right, just at the edge. To be placed there was always symbolic of the honor bestowed upon her. To her relief, they seemed to ignore her failing bladder the constant cough and infirmities of bones and joints. They cared not that her legendary beauty had degenerated into the wrinkled mass of loose skin, the curious dark brown spots, and stringy gray-white hair. Loose teeth had fallen out one by one, as if to mark the passing of her few dreams, until her pink gums were as featureless as the aspirations she no longer clung to. She blinked to clear the haze from her vision, but it never helped these days. Things remained clouded and colorless. From where she sat, she could barely make out the Hopae, the high priest, who stood just to the high Minko's right. The Hopae raised his hands. The clatter of his thick shell necklaces carried to her ears. Thankfully, her hearing wasn't fading like the rest of her. We have to go back to the roots of our heritage, the Hopae cried holding up two feather wands, one red, the other white. Our world is interlaced with opposites, love and hate, peace and war, predator and prey, fire and water. Is there life without death, light without darkness, or pain without pleasure? We call this the sacred balance of existence. Why? Because these opposites lie at the very heart of creation. Yes, in the beginning times, Breathgivers separated the sky world from the below world, and sacred crawfish dove to the depths and brought up mud. Giant vulture flew across and flattened it with his wings, forming the mountains and plains. The great horned serpents crawled down from the heights, and where they went the waters followed, creating the rivers. And binding this all together are the two powers, the red and the white, equal and opposite, they weave through time itself. The red is that of creativity, reproduction, cunning, and innovation. And when unleashed, it loosens chaos, war, and suffering. The red power motivates us, fuels us with ambition, pride, and courage. It allows us to meet the struggle head-on and to strive against adversity. Red power drives the passion in life. And the white? There lies tranquility, peace, and goodwill toward others. Without the white power, we cannot appreciate harmony and contemplation. Compromise and understanding flow from it, as does knowledge, patience, virtue, and compassion. What, I ask you, is life without order? How can any achievement be appreciated? Pearl Hand jutted out her jaw in a grin. Black Shell would have enjoyed this. 
Balancing the power always obsessed him after Napatuka. As if he heard her, the Hopaya cried out at the packed palace great room. Breathgiver, in his wisdom, created the red and white to balance, and it is the act of balancing them that absorbs each of us throughout our lives. Without the red, we fall into stagnation and sloth. Without the white, life becomes nothing more than a savage contest without satisfaction. She was nodding, remembering, the Hopaya's voice fading as she recalled the day Black Shell had gambled for her. Gods, that was so long ago. Nevertheless, the memory came rushing up between her souls, as though but a day had gone by. How clever you were, she whispered to him. Already I was falling under your spell, daring to hope that you were more than just another man. Her head bobbed as she recalled the way he looked at her. Wanting? Yes. In those days, what man didn't? But Black Shell had seen her differently, with eyes that looked beyond her breasts, flat belly, and long legs. I thought it would fade. All the ones before you, they just wanted what they saw on the outside. She grunted derisively. But what did I know of real men? To those others, I was just a toy, a plaything. Pearl Hand shook her head, feeling the bones in her neck grinding softly. What fools we were, Black Shell and me. He actually bought that crap I dangled in front of him. Oh yes, become a partner, equals you and I, and you swallowed it, like a fish takes a baited hook. She rubbed her face, aware that her chin was wet from a trickle of drool. That was the line that would tow me out of that fat Eric Paracoki's grasp. And then I'd be away, leaving you with empty blankets to find your fate among the Christianos. She wiped her chin, then dried her hand on the corner of her white fabric dress. Such things were presented to her with great regularity, honors for a woman such as herself. People were just as silly as Black Shell had been. Oh, yes, she whispered. It was just going to be a couple of nights, enduring your bed, and then, in the darkness, I'd lift some of your precious trade and be gone, no one the wiser but Pearl Hand. She laughed at herself, rocking softly back and forth. We danced with the red power, Black Shell, both of us for our own reasons. Cunning was our creed, crafty, plotting, and bold. And in the end, old lover, whose trap did we fall into? She smacked a gnarled fist into her bony palm. Power had laid its snare, and why we wished desperately for the white, it was the red that slipped around us like a ghost. It played on our weakness, my beloved traitor. Horn Serpent gave each of us the last thing we ever thought we'd get. And in the end, it doomed us both. She realized that the room had gone silent, and images of Black Shell stringing his bow faded as she opened her eyes to see the crowded palace great room. Ranks of seated people had fixed their gazes upon her. To her left, the High Minko, the Hape, Tishu Minko, and Pakachathauko were all staring at her with reverent eyes. Sorry, she whispered. Go on, Hopaya. You were talking about the balance between the powers. The Hopaya, a young man perhaps of forty, well, young to her way of thinking, walked over, spreading his hands. Reverend Elder, what did Horn Serpent give you? We would hear, all of us, and learn. She squinted at him with her roomy eyes, then out at the audience. He gave us our hidden desires, Opaya. You know, the things you want so desperately that you can't even admit to yourself. What were yours in black shells? She heard the pleading in the Hopaya's voice. She snorted. Black shell? The fool wanted a destiny. And me, idiot that I was, I only wanted to be loved. Is that so bad? The Tishuminko head chief of the raccoon clan asked. Only if it comes at a price, she murmured. Chapter 5 Ira Perakoki made me wait until the sun was low on the western horizon. Rarely do I ever chafe, but this was one of those times. 
I was told to go down into the village to wait, so I asked a man I had traded with the day before if the dogs and I could rest under his ramada. It might have been early spring up north, but down in the peninsula, things got downright hot. I lounged around, sweating in the muggy hot air, and sipped from a gourd water bottle. Fetch used the opportunity for a prolonged game of stick. I flipped his ever more slobbery stick as far as the next house. He brought it back, a look of adoration filling his eyes. Finally, the heat got to him and he trotted off to gulp water at the Palisade Ditch. Then he returned to flop on his belly and began the laborious task of turning his stick into splinters. Around me, people continued with their daily routine. The woman across from me was weaving a new skirt on a backstrap loom. She kept glancing my way as she fished sable palm fibers from a pile beside her. Over by the palisade, I could just see two men using a hafted whelk shell to shape a section of log. I couldn't tell what sort of image they were carving, but the steady chop, chop of the sharpened shell made a reassuring rhythm. They didn't have greenstone axes as we did in the north. Down here, carving is done with sharpened shell, and believe it or not, shark's teeth. When the breeze came just right, I could smell cootie root bread baking. After having seen the young woman four houses over draining water from the pounded roots, I imagined it was hers. Meanwhile, people kept walking by, casting me appraising glances as words spread of my coming contest with Iraparakoki. With each passing finger of time, the number of people just strolling past increased. Some grinned knowingly, as if already savoring my defeat. The sun continued to slip across the sky. I began to pace, anxious to have this over and have Pearl Hand and the Cristiano Sword in my possession. Only after I spotted several of the priests leaving the chief's house and scurrying back and forth to the temple did I understand why Iraparakoki postponed our contest. These were what the Timakua called Yaba, shaman conjurers, who tried to wield power to their own designs. Hey, kids, I called to the dogs. They cast me lazy glances where they lay sprawled in the shade next to the packs. We're being witched. The dogs didn't seem to care that each of the old buzzards was carrying a hide bag and looking furtively in my direction. The two old Yaba hurried up the ramp to the veranda and ducked inside. Iraparakoki had called them to make medicine, or power. Their incantations, sacrifices, etc., were to bless his bow and arrows. Only after being imbued with power would he trust himself against me. Meanwhile, the dogs had flopped onto their sides in the shade, eyes closed. That or the wizened Yaba had succeeded in placing a sleeping curse on them. If so, it was strong medicine indeed. At the same time, I noticed another of the old men peering at me from behind the charnel house. The Yaba was dressed in his best white apron, his face and chest painted in blue, white, and green pigments. Only when he thought I wasn't noticing did he shake the buzzard feathers in my direction and spray what looked like urine out of an old bladder. Given the stakes, any chief worth his spit would have tried conjuring. They're a silly bunch of geese down in the peninsula. Me, I'm Chikasa, born a breath-giver's chosen people, and this wasn't my first gambling match. As a countermeasure, I opened my medicine pouch, removed my blessed shell gorget, and placed it around my neck to ward off any of their paltry spells. To be sure, I used a sprig of dried bald cypress leaves and pelted my head, chest, and back. Finally, I rubbed an ointment made from alligator oil, beaver castorium, and deer's gall onto my arms to ensure that power maintained their strength and skill. Pearl Hand appeared, strolling towards the ramada where I made my preparations. She stopped short as I finished rubbing on the ointment. He's up there conjuring, you know. Of course, he thinks he's going to win. A sparkle was dancing in her eyes. He's been told you're only fair with the bow, and that the only way you'll win is by magic. The only way I will win, beautiful woman, is by outshooting him. I thumped my breast with a fist. And any advantage I have is in here, down between my soles. My uncle started me on the bow when I was four. By the time I was six, I didn't get supper if I didn't hit ten for ten at twenty paces. I made a face. 
It's that Chikaza preoccupation with honor, you see. That, and if a man can't hit the mark, he'll be a laughingstock among the other warriors and nobles. Nobles? she asked, that eyebrow rising again. We're Chikaza. If you ask us, we're all nobles. Even those peckheads in Deer Clan. She glanced back at the chief's house. Sunset was turning it a pleasant shade of yellow. A pale thread of smoke was rising from the roof eaves. Then her measuring eyes turned back to me. Black Shell, can you really win this? At the seriousness in her voice, I nodded. Let's put it this way. If I can't take an overblown peninsula war chief, my uncles would track me down and smear my face with fresh bear shit to add to the insult. He's a high war chief with a growing gut. How often does he shoot, Pearlhand? Once or twice a week? And when he does, who does he shoot against? His subchiefs. Oh, yes. The fawning subordinates who agree to never make the great man look bad. I do this for a living. She stepped closer, lacing a firm arm around the Ramada pole. Would that arm ever wrap so intimately around me, I thought? If you win, he's going to be upset. The power of trade? Well, it's a nice policy as long as it doesn't involve Ira Perakoki's prestige, his Cristiano's sword, and his trophy woman. I met her earnest eyes and shared a slight nod of the head. In other words, we'd better be out of here in the middle of the night. And long down the trail come morning. I took a moment to study her. I'd known a lot of women. Where did that sultry quality come from? She should have been broken, given the trials she'd endured. Instead, when I looked into those eyes, I saw a steely resilience. It gave her cat-like body an added attraction. I asked suddenly, What makes you think I'm the man to go with? She gave a slight shrug. Maybe you're not. But back on the trail that day when you looked me in the eyes, I saw your souls. A faint smile graced those marvelous lips. If you are who I think you are, it might not be so bad. A traitor's woman would have freedom found nowhere else. You know what freedom is? Since the day my mother... I'm just a possession. She glanced back at the chief's house. You've never been owned by anyone, passed from slobbering man to slobbering man. I saw her close her eyes. I could imagine. I've already told you. Freedom means cold, wet trails, bad food, endless travel, and sleeping in the mud. Two sleeping in the mud is warmer than one, she shot back. Besides, wherever you're going, it's away from here. I'm an exile, a man without status. My people would spit on me. Then we are alike. Her smooth brown shoulder rose in a casual shrug. And we might get along. I've seen the desire in your eyes. You want me, and if you win this thing, you'll have your full measure, provided, that is, I come to your bed as an equal. Ah, we're back to the partner thing. A soft laugh broke from her throat. A cunning woman could help your trade. She hears things from other women that you, as a man, never will. Such knowledge could give you an advantage. Men like to talk to a beautiful woman. They can't help it. I can drop a word on occasion, mislead, and manipulate. Could it really work that way? Could I really throw out all that crap my people had pounded into my souls about the roles of women? I tried not to stare at the way her hip was thrust suggestively against the Ramada pole. A tingle of anticipation ran through me. Of course, if I turn out to be as bad as the rest, you can just slip away some night. It's easy to elude one lone man on the trail. It's not like here, where Iraparakoki can send all of his hunters and trackers out to drag you back. I watched that hit home, gaining even more respect for her. Oh, yes, she'd already thought that idea through. Then I added, On the other hand, what if I'm different from the other men? Different how? I've thought a great deal about your offer of a partnership. It goes against everything a Chikaza man is taught, which makes it exotically appealing to me. Would you be willing to stay with me for a while? Try it? Her brow lined as she studied me. Maybe, if you can win this thing. A conch horn blew, and I turned my head to see the trumpeter at the corner of the chief's house veranda. Ira Perakoki emerged and started down the ramp, his priests and a collection of warriors following behind. Time, I said. 
You want to help me carry the packs over? She grabbed up two, and I admired the toned muscles in her arms. Calling the dogs, we carried my trade to the edge of the small plaza. All right, so it was only a trampled opening in the center of the town below the chief's house. Among the great nations to the north, such a place would have been constructed of packed clay, smooth, and perfectly surveyed. Ira Perikoki gave me a look of anticipation as he stopped short, his retinue behind him. Ears carried the Cristiano sword. He was grinning like the contest had already been won by his august leader. The priests hovered behind in a knot, waving eagle fans, singing softly as they called power. People were coming from all over. It wasn't every day their chief played a renowned trader for such high stakes. My people, Ira Perikoki began, the trader known as Black Shell has challenged me to a contest. He wages all of his trade goods, his dogs, and packs. What the? My dogs? But there was no time to object, and he had neatly boxed me. Changing the wager now would make me look petty and small. In return, Ira Perikoki continued, I wager the Cristiano sword and the woman Pearl Hand. Then he lifted his face to the sky, arms out. Hear me, mother son. Hear me, my ancestors. Grant me strength and skill. In your name, I represent our people. Make my eye keen and my heart stout. Steady my hand and guide my arrows true. And on it went, long enough that I should have gone off to take a nap. Pearlhan's face might have been carved from walnut. She just stared flatly at Ira Perikoki. I stared at her and wondered what it would be like to untie the knot that held her skirt around those provocative hips. I imagined the cloth floating loose, sliding down the length of her long legs. Finally, after having recited an endless list of ancestors and invoking aid from each, Ira Perikoki rolled on to a grand finish and made a gesture. Two of his warriors stepped out twenty long paces and twisted two sticks into the dirt. Then, to my surprise, they produced the same grass circle target I'd used that morning. It had been sewn onto a piece of matting that they tied to the sticks. I glanced at Ira Perikoki, and he was grinning back. You scheming clever weasel, you mock me fool. To turn the tables, I bent my head back and laughed from deep in my gut. Ah, the games we play. Five shots each, Ira Perikoki cried. And should we tie, we will play until one misses and the other doesn't. Done, I agreed. You first. He stepped to the mark as one of his warriors walked up and offered him his bow. The polished wood rested on a cougar skin along with five cane shaft arrows, all dewed with some liquid from the conjuring, probably black drink. I took another look at the man. Please, tell me he'd quaffed the whole shell filled with the stuff. It gave a man the shakes. Ira Perikoki reached for his bow, capably strung it, and retrieved an arrow. Taking his stance, he drew back, and the crowd went silent. His release was perfect, the arrow whistling down and passing just inside the lower edge of the circle. Shouts, whistles, and stomping feet demonstrated the crowd's pleasure. I took my place, knocked an arrow, and felt a sudden nervousness. For several heartbeats I stilled my souls, remembering Uncle's long-gong lectures on the bow, found my target and released, watching the arrow lance the matting beside Ira Perikoki's hole. The crowd didn't whistle, stomp, and carry on for me. Who would have thought? Ira Perikoki's next shot was nearer to center. I kept mine just within the ring, and so it went, one for one, until we had worked up to fifteen. Now the crowd was silent. I glanced at Pearl Hand. Her posture had grown stiff, and I could see worry each time I stepped up to the mark. So, beautiful woman, you really are dedicated to this. At eighteen each, we'd shot away the matting inside the target. Ira Perikoki's nineteenth arrow sliced the grass circle, leaving a hanging U-shape. That counts as a hit! Ira Perikoki cried. Agreed, I shrugged, walking to the line. I took my time, breathing deeply, charging my muscles. 
My arrow sliced through the center of the ring. When I looked at Ira Perakoki, a gleam of sweat gave his tattooed skin a dull sheen in the growing twilight. He was pacing, clearly anxious. Too much black drink, and it was becoming apparent that he might lose. How long had it been, I wondered, since he'd lost at anything? His next shot shaved grass from the broken loop. Had the circle been whole, it would have been a miss. I take that as a hit, I called. If it touches the grass, we should call it good. And then I drove an arrow through the empty center of the target. Ira Perakoki began muttering under his breath, calling on his ancestors. The sun had sunk below the palisade, sending shadows across the plaza, marking the target in gloom. He took his mark, and I could see the tremors in his arms, the beaded sweat on his forehead. Pulling the arrow back, the man seemed to tense. At the release, the arrow sailed just outside the grass loop. A low moan went up from the crowd. Pearl Hand was working her jaws, as if her mouth were dry. A sudden desperate hope shone in her eyes. I took my mark, knowing that I had prepared all my life for this moment. I drew back, took a breath, let half of it out, and drove my arrow straight through the center of the target. The crowd was silent, shocked. I raised my hands high. Praise the Iraperakoki! He has shot a most excellent game! What other man here could have done so well? A cheer went up from the crowd. They stomped and whistled, some breaking out and yodeling while others sang. It was a nice try, but when I walked up and offered my hand, Ira Perakoki hissed, witchery, and stalked off. I stepped over and retrieved the Cristiano sword from ears. The look in his eyes was seething, like a pot at full boil. Then he turned, back stiff, and stomped away. Maybe he should change his official name to He Who Stalks in Anger. I turned to Pearl Hand. By blood and pus she was mine, all mine. You shall have your full measure. The words thundered between my souls. She waited until the others had walked off before saying, I suppose this means we're not invited to a feast. That would be my thought. I cocked my head, trying to read the expression on her face. Once more she was the property of yet another man. I couldn't tell if she was pleased or not. Come, she said, bending down for the packs. The smart thing is to go back to the Ramada. It's close to the gate. She paused. He really thought he was going to beat you. He had a man spying while you were out practicing. I just wasn't at my best out there. Maybe it was the lack of a crowd. The studious look she gave me was almost unnerving. You planned it all, didn't you? What do you think? Are you the only clever one? At least that brought a slight smile to her lips. My question, I continued, is how do we keep someone from sneaking up and cracking my skull in the night? And how do we keep you from being dragged back to Ira Perakoki's house up on that dirt pile? She gave me a level glance. After dark, the guard at the gate will have to empty his bladder sometime. And we'll be out before he can get back. Then, to my surprise, she reached down and took my hand. Her touch sent a jolt through my system. She gave me a squeeze, saying, That would be smart. I like smart. It's a whole lot more fun than stupid. From beneath the Ramada roof, we watched night settle over Ira Perakoki's town. I rested on my stomach, propped on my elbows, the Cristiano sword held in my hands. I just liked the feel of the thing, let alone its incredible value. In the nations up north, such a weapon would be worth more exotic trade than I could carry. Pearl Hand had laced up the packs, and they were ready to be loaded onto the dogs as soon as darkness was complete. Her glances were speculative, perhaps trying to decide if she'd really made the right decision. I smiled to myself in anticipation. The guard at the gate was lounging around, looking bored. On a hunch, I had Pearl Hand take him a gourd full of tea I obtained from an old lady two houses down. 
what are in, what are out? The chief's house, up atop its mound, was silent and dark. The two old Yaba, both looking shaken, burst from the veranda and hurried down the ramp for the safety of their temple. They were covered with some gray powdery substance that wafted after them to mark their passage. The ultimate humiliation, he doused them with the ashes from the fire pit. Gods, he must be in a foul mood, Pearl Hand said as she came and settled beside me. She was fixed on Ira Perakoki's high dwelling. This is one night I'm glad I'm not up there. He's blaming me too, you know. Regretting your freedom already? She flipped that raven wealth of hair back. Not yet, but maybe soon, if he's so mouth-foaming mad, he charges out of there with a pack of warriors to recover his property. He'd do that, offend the power of trade? He might, by claiming sorcery. As far as he's concerned, that's the only way you could beat him. It would ruin his reputation. Chiefs don't spit on the power of trade. Once other traders hear about it, they'll steer clear of his towns. You're not in the north anymore, Black Shell. Trade here, it's different. If he comes for us, it will be in the middle of the night, when there are no witnesses. These people are backward and ignorant. You're used to the great nations where old traditions dictate how people behave. You won't understand until you get it out of your system and start thinking like a dumb fisherman. Do you use this tone with all of your men? You're not all of my men. Most would have crawled between my legs by now, pawed my breasts black and blue, grunted themselves to satisfaction and fallen asleep. We're going to have to find you a better class of men. Her teeth flashed in the gloom. I like what I see so far. Just wait. I still have time to disappoint you. She reached over and laid a cool hand on my shoulder. Partners, that still holds. For as long as you want. I took a moment to study her shadowed face. If after a couple of weeks we'd rather go separate ways, we'll do so. Why? She sounded suspicious. You could claim me just like you do that sword. You've run before and you could again. I'm a lone trader on the move. I can no more own you than I could the wind. Besides, what good is a partner you don't want to be with? Why should I trust you? Her suspicions were growing. We will eventually go through a large town with another chief like Ira Perakoki. You could sell me to him when you finally get tired of me. My chance to run would be long gone. I could. But stop just thinking about yourself for once. Here's the thing. I like what you said about trade. You know, about how you'd hear things from women that they'd never say around a man. I may be in exile, but I'm not stupid. I paused, turning my attention back to Ira Perakoki's dark palace. And to tell the truth, Pearl Hand, I'm tired of being alone. She, too, turned her attention back to Ira Perakoki's, the silence lengthening between us. Finally, she said, It's dark enough to load the packs on the dogs. That tea should be running its course through the guard. A half-hand of time later, we crept over toward the gate, only to discover the guard slumped against the palisade, his chin on his chest, sleeping soundly. I whispered into her ear, I thought he was supposed to go pee. Maybe he had a very long day, she mouthed, and added a shrug. On tiptoes, we eased through the opening, and Pearl Hand laid fingers on my arm, leaning close to whisper. If we follow one of the trails, pursuing warriors will be on us by midday. Old Rand's canoe is beached next to the palisade. I say we take it and cross the lake. They won't expect that. Who's Old Rand? He's gone to Ocale for Ira Perakoki. No one will miss his canoe in the morning. Smart woman. I followed her down to the lake where she located a dugout that we dragged down to the water. The dogs, of course, clambered in without hesitation. In the north, we traveled up and down the rivers in canoes all the time. A pointed paddle lay in the bottom, and I pushed us off, sending us south across the lake. Pearl Hand pointed from the bow. There, to the right. You see those tall trees? That's a good landing, and there are rushes off to the side where we can hide the canoe. Really, smart woman. 
Once offloaded, the canoe hidden, we took a faint trail south. A hand of time later, we slipped off into a tree-thick hammock and wound our way through the pines and palmettos. It was a difficult business, walking through the forest in the dark. I have to say, Pearl Hand was motivated. She pushed herself to the limit, almost running. Given the frantic pace she set, I could begin to understand her desperation to get away from Ira Paracoki. We were constantly muttering as we bungled into spiderwebs, tripped over deadfall, and speared ourselves with palmetto. The patter of the dog's feet, plus our own blundering, made enough racket that even the water moccasins slithered away. In the first light of dawn, Pearl Hand's face was smudged, her hair tacky with gray strands of web accented with bits of leaves and pine needles. She had scratches all over her normally sleek skin, and her skirt was caked with mud, but that smile on her weary face was like sunlight through rain. Gorgeous. Do you need a rest, I asked. In reply, she looked back over her shoulder, desperation returning, and shook her head. Let's keep heading south. I'm going until I drop. Meanwhile, he'll be scouring for our trail to the west. He knows you want to see the Cristianos. He'll expect you to head in that direction. That was true. I did want to see them. To know they were real. At the same time, I wanted even more to avoid any run-in with Irapera Koki's warriors. South it is. Finally, it was the dogs that determined our need to camp. They were literally staggering under their packs. Bark's white-tipped tail drooped. Skipper was limping. Fetch had taken to stumbling over his own feet. Even Pearl Hand could see they had nothing left. Sunrise shot orange and yellow across the underbelly of threatening clouds. I watched them coast eastward in the silent majesty across the sky. They kept the sun's heat from sapping us even further, while the low lights shot rainbows through the coming storm. With the first spatters of rain, I led us to a copse of pine, gumbo limbo, and poison wood. Then we stopped, surveying the needle-strewn ground. This'll do for now. I slipped the quiver from my shoulder. We've got to rest the dogs, get them something to eat. I bent to the packs as the heavens opened. While I cared for the dogs, she walked to the edge of the trees. Dropping her skirt, she used the rain to wash her smudged skin and wring out her hair. I pulled the packs and shook cornmeal from a fabric sack into the dog's bowl. Then I joined her in the rain, untying my apron and scrubbing the mud and mire from my hide. She was just standing there, naked, her head back, rain beating on her face. I watched the water streaming down her sleek brown skin. It beaded on the hard brown nipples jutting from her breasts and trickled in writhing paths down her muscular belly and thighs. Had mortal woman ever looked so marvelous? She smiled, raindrops pattering on her lips, and slicked water from her face. Then she turned to me, dark eyes meeting mine. Instead of the fatigue I expected, a glorious peace filled them. Her smile grew as she walked over and used her palms to wipe the rain from my skin. The feel of her hands running over my arms, chest, and belly can't be described. I grasped her shoulders, reveling in the solid feel of her bone and muscle. I closed my eyes as she continued to run her hands over me to conjure sensations no woman ever had. With a hip, she playfully bumped my straining erection. Come, if you're not too tired, let's see what your earnings have won you. Chapter 6 We slept hard. The mat of pine needles insulated us from the mud. An onion of grease mixed with datura, pine resin, and gumweed kept the biting insects at bay. And she was proven right again. Two sleeping in the rain was warmer than one. I awoke a hand of time before dawn. I was on my side, chest to her back, her round bottom cushioning my groin. The darkness was complete. Life, I thought, couldn't be better than this. Memories kept replaying in the eye of my souls. She had played my body the way a master musician did a flute. 
Each time the melody would rise to that last final note, she'd back off, only to take me higher the next time. And when she finally brought me to the peak, my shaft hardened until I feared it would wake her. It did. She stirred and shifted, reaching around to grasp me. I groaned at the squeeze she gave me. Don't you ever sleep? she asked gently. Are you a sorceress? She shifted onto her back, maintaining her distracting hold. Where by the spirits did that come from? A sorceress? I feel enchanted. You were supposed to. Why? She paused for a moment. I think for the first time I wanted to share myself. You don't just take Black Shell. I don't understand. Out there in the rain, what would you have done if I hadn't wanted to lie with you? I would have thought you were as exhausted as I was, and we'd have gone to sleep. Why? Huh? Because you needed sleep. That's the reason I gave you so much. Did someone hit you in the head real hard when you were a little girl? It's because you cared about me, Black Shell. That's a new thing for me. The men I belong to... When the silence stretched, I added, Most women would have concluded that all men were the same by now. I'm not most women, and I've known some very good men. She growled irritably. I just haven't belonged to them. You don't belong to me. Like I said, if we don't like each other, we can split trails any time. I'm still having trouble believing that. I gave you my promise. When a Chikaza gives his word... Blood and pus, spare me a lecture on Chikaza and their ever-so-holy honor. Gladly. She raised herself on an elbow, trying to read my souls. I really could just walk away? Just like that? Just like that. My answer seemed to perplex her, and she lay back, staring up at the pine boughs overhead. How are we doing so far? I asked. She softly asked, you're really Chikaza, right? Your people, they have peculiar notions about women and who they couple with. Does it bother you that I've had so many? Unwanted images arose to torture my souls. I couldn't help but think of her, naked like this, besides the likes of Irapera Koki. A little. But I'm not just another Chikaza. Pearlhand, I haven't been among my people in years. Meanwhile, I've been everywhere else. Who knows the ways of power? Maybe I was cast out to learn a broader way of life. For now, I'll just be me, and you be you. I shrugged. I'm not perfect, so I'm asking that you tell me if I do things to irritate you. I usually get hit if I criticize. That sounds like a way to ensure I wake up alone the next morning. She laughed. Probably true. A pause. Most likely you'll grow tired of my ways and it will be me who wakes up alone. I followed her gaze to the branches overhead, savoring the moment. So far, partner, I'm pretty satisfied. But I meant what I said. I don't want to be like the other men you've known. You're not. She looks slightly confused. Gods, if I didn't know better, I'd say you were conjured from my dreams. That made me feel warm inside. Thank you. I could say the same. Some of the things you did to me, I thought my skull would explode. Those skills kept me alive and living well instead of working my life away, bent double under loads of firewood, fleshing hides and pounding corn as a common slave. I wasn't born a traitor either. That skill too had to be learned, along with the art of the bow and chunky and all the different languages. You wait, you'll see. We haven't even scratched the surface when it comes to the things I can do to a man. But you keep waking the dogs. Then she proceeded to show me. I think I woke the dogs again. Two days later, having seen no sign of Ira Paracoki's warriors, and having skirted several villages, we headed west toward the coast. Taking time to hunt, we managed to kill a deer, most of which the hungry dogs devoured and several ducks fell to my bird arrows. Along the way, cattail root, yellow lotus, and smilax root provided stock for evening stews. 
The more time I spent with Pearl Hand, the happier I became. She showed me how to polish the Cristiano sword to a silver sheen, to grease it, and with a sandstone paint palette from my trade collection, how to grind the edge to sharpness. One bright morning, I was sitting on the trunk of a fallen pond cypress overlooking a small forest lake. A whirlwind several years earlier had felled most of the trees, several having fallen into the water. New growth was already sprouted, saplings reaching fresh leaves toward the sky. Water lily and duckweed floated near shore. I had the sword cradled on my lap and Fetch perched beside me, a partially chewed stick at his feet. He was giving me that desperate look, but my arm was almost worn out. Even the strongest arm can only throw a stick so many times. Mosquitoes were humming over us in a tall column, repelled by the last of my ungent. Pearl Hand strode out of the elderberries and honeysuckle that shrouded the down trees. As she sat beside me, Fetch took the opportunity to spit his stick at her feet. She obligingly tossed it out into the brush. What are you doing? she asked. With a sword, I pointed at two lumps that protruded from the film of duckweed just down the bank. Watching. She spotted it immediately. Alligator. Maybe as long as my leg, right? Right. I'm hoping he comes close enough that I can spear him with his sword. It should go right through an alligator that small. And then? Then we render the fat for grease to make more mosquito repellent, roast some of the meat, and feed the rest to the dogs. She nodded. Whatever you do, don't put too much bend on that sword. They're strong, but they can't take a lot of weight sideways. Once bent, you can't straighten it. I considered that, having worked with copper, and could understand her point. Maybe hunting alligator with a sword wasn't such a good idea. In our short time together, I'd come to appreciate her knowledge. How many peoples have you lived among? I asked on impulse. She dropped her chin onto her palm, staring thoughtfully at the water. I've lost count. We'd been talking in Muskogean. I switched to Kusa. You speak most of the languages? In fluent Kusa dialect, she answered. Most of the eastern ones. And Cristiano? Si. Un poquito. Which means? Yes, a little. Very well then, beautiful woman. What shall we do when we get close to the bearded Cristianos? Stay well away from them, partner. They aren't very good at sneaking around in the forest. They clank, talk loudly, and bash their way through the brush. If we're smart and leave the dogs behind, we'll have ample warning of their coming. Just take a peek at them and let's get away. I could hear the concern in her voice. I just couldn't believe it, so I asked, they really don't honor the power of trade? The wariness in her eyes left no doubt about her sincerity. Black Shell, you simply must trust me on this. Will you? I nodded slowly. I will. They are not like other men. They don't abide by the rules that govern us here, except that they are vicious and remorseless. She raised her hands and let them slap to her sides. I know I can't talk you out of this, but I wish you'd let us head north to the great nations. The Christianos bring nothing but misery and death. I dropped my gaze, saying doggedly, I just want to see them. I've heard so many stories, things I can't believe. Don't you understand? To see is to know, Pearl Hand. You promise? You just want to see them, that's all? I do. But I didn't like it. I really wanted to see one up close, look him over like one did a strange and unique animal. Too many of the stories that were told stretched a man's belief. Could they really build floating palaces that moved like magic? It was said they tied white clouds to trees in the middle of their large boats. I take your promise and your word upon your honor. Honor? She certainly knew how to bind a chikaza. At that moment, two anhigas surfaced, one with a lump in its long neck, as an unlucky fish slid down to become breakfast. The wary anhigas eyed the alligator and launched themselves to the safety of one of the fallen pond cypress logs. There they spread their wings to the sun, perching like worshipping lords. 
The male jerked his spear-like beak in our direction, as if pointing us out to his brown-throated mate. I've swam with them, I offered, indicating the Anhigas. They fly underwater like birds do through the air. It's a magical thing seeing them down there. Then they fly out and spread their wings, worshipping Breathgiver. They are so like us in that regard. They have great power, she added reverently. They travel between all the worlds. This ends Disc 2. Coming of the Storm, Disc 3. Both of the Anhigas craned their long, skinny necks to watch us. It was an eerie sensation, as if they were studying us, listening in. I shifted uncomfortably as a third Anhiga appeared from the depths, splashed out of the water, and settled on another of the fallen logs across from its brethren. Water dripped from its feathers as it spread its wings to the sun. Why were you outcast? she asked. You let the sacred fire go out or something? Among the Muscogee people, the sacred fire was kept continually burning in Archikofa, or council house. To let it go out was to bring disaster down on the people. That's a boy's job. Your face isn't tattooed. They do that when a boy becomes a man. Even I know that. I didn't quite make it to manhood, and that's all I'm going to say. We're partners, you and me. Do partners keep secrets? Will you tell me everything that ever happened to you? Things you're ashamed of? She laughed, the sound of it bitter. Oh, yes, partner. I've lived with shame for so long it fits me like a well-worn dress. But tell me, what is your clan? Chief clan. Ah, one of the nobles, so you were raised to be a high minko, a supreme chief. I was. I glanced nervously at the Anhigas. Pearl Hand was getting too close to sensitive issues. Even the Anhigas seemed to be waiting for the answer. I hear the tone in your voice. Don't be so defensive. Why are you asking these things? To know you, Black Shell. She threw a glance over her shoulder where Fetch was searching the brush for his stick. Isn't that what partners do? Know each other? You have a handle on me like that on a prize water jar. But you, you keep slipping out of my grasp. What would a man like you be doing, passing your life as a lowly trader, when you could sit atop the high Minko's mound in a great palace? Another Anhiga shot up from the water to perch beside the others. This one, too, turned its dark brown eyes in my direction. I thought about that long-gone day when Horn Serpent's voice whispered in my ear, Run! The sibilant tones echoed across time and memory. Well. I cleared my throat. For one thing, I'd never have won you away from Ira Perakoki. I'd never have shared your bed. Instead, I'd be locked up atop a mound, fretting my stomach into a burn over clan politics, sleepless, wondering who was plotting to undermine my rule. Sounds like great fun, doesn't it? She chuckled. Great fun indeed. But you can't change who you are. You're a plotter, Black Shell. You knew that Ira Perakoki would send a spy to watch you practice with your bow. You played him like a fish on a line, didn't you? He's a very predictable sort. I had to let his greed get the better of him. She looked at me and winked. That's what I like about you. You're a clever man, but one with so many layers. Knowing you is like peeling a wild onion. With each layer, the scent grows stronger. You're saying I'm stinky? No, you're Chikasa. You've been trained to bathe every day. The Cristianos now, they stink. They think bathing makes a person sick. How do they stand each other? By pouring water scented with flowers and such on their bodies. I made a face. That sounded ridiculous. Why not take a bath and get it over with? Black shell, she said seriously. I'll get you your look at the Cristianos, but that's it. You understand, don't you? I won't take the chance that they'd capture me. I'd die first, even if it means driving that sword through my heart. Gods, you mean that? As I have never meant anything before. If you do anything foolish, 
try and meet with them or get captured, no matter how much I like you, I'm gone. I nodded. But then, just a look? What would that hurt? The Inhigas were watching me with eyes that reminded me of obsidian beads. Gods, why were they studying me so? Yet another emerged from the water, shaking and extending its wings. When it, too, turned to study us, I felt a shiver filter through my souls. For five days we traveled west, avoiding towns, hunting and fishing, making camp in glades, and enjoying the night fires. We would talk of places we had been, people we had known, and then retire to the blankets, where Pearl Hand and I explored the wonders of our bodies. I thought my life blessed for the first time since that fateful day when the voice of Horn Serpent forever ruined my life among the Chikasa. I managed to spear a small alligator, answering my questions about the Cristiano sword. It would definitely do the job, but a barbed wooden spear would have served better. In camp, we rendered his fat. Into this, we mixed pine needles and gumweed to create an insect repellent. We kept a roast. The dogs enjoyed the rest. Still avoiding villages, and the chance that our appearance would cause word to be sent back to Iraperakoki, we followed winding trails. On one such trail, we wound our way through clumps of saw palmetto and sable palm, avoiding the pointed leaves. Bark began to growl. I signaled for quiet as the other dogs stiffened, low growls deep in their throats. A party of people rounded the bend a bow shot ahead. At sight of us, they stopped short, eyes wide, expressions tense. They looked for all the world like a bunch of rabbits ready to break. The women had tied their hair back, and heavy packs hung from their shoulders. The man carried a long spear tipped with wooden prongs, the sort of thing meant for fishing, not war. He immediately brandished it, as if for defense. He was a skinny specimen, nothing more than brown skin over ropey muscle. His belly, however, protruded, as if he were full of intestinal worms. I held my trader's staff high, calling out in Timakua, Greetings! The man stepped forward, clearly nervous, and spoke in a language I didn't understand. Nor could I place the zigzag tattoos that ran down his cheeks. When I glanced at Pearl Hand, she just shook her head. Resorting to signs, I signaled, We come to trade. The man signaled back, Run! Bad work's behind us. Bad work's how? I signed. Cristianos, he shouted. With that, they pushed off into the pointed palm barbs, heedless of the discomfort. The women followed, shooting frightened glances our way. Circling wide around us, they returned to the trail and headed inland at a dog trot. Skipper cocked his head, watching them go with his blue eyes. Bark used a paw to peel spiderweb off his scarred muzzle. Pearl Hand, however, cast nervous glances down the now foreboding trail. If they're running, Christianos are somewhere nearby. I have to get close to see one. You have to get close to get captured or killed, she growled, backing warily down the trail. Listen, let's find a place to stash the packs and work up through the brush. You yourself said they weren't any good at sneaking through the forest. She gave me a look that pulled at my heart. Black Shell... No good is going to come of this. We will be careful, I told her. I promise just to look. Don't you understand what this means for me? She closed her eyes, almost reeling in defeat. A look, and then we leave, no matter what. You promise that? I do. I have. I promise it again. If this goes wrong, so help me. Like smoke through the trees, I'm gone. If we're spotted and separated, don't bother looking for me. I mean it, Black Shell. I stepped close, taking her hand, meeting her worried eyes. If anything goes wrong, head for the deepest forest, and then, well, it's your life. May luck grace your feet and souls. She shook her head as if annoyed. What is it about you? Why am I doing this? Come on, let's find a place to leave the packs and dogs.
Then I'll get my peak, and we'll be off. I turned, ducking through the palmettos, trying to thread a trail. Besides, with my luck, we'll get to the beach and they'll be gone. These raids don't last long, do they? A couple of days to a half moon? That's what I've heard. Sometimes they stay. Remember how I got here? They wanted to build a town. The venture failed. Like us, they probably learned from their mistakes. You're an idiot. Then why haven't you fled with those others? Maybe I want to see you get caught. It'll bring me satisfaction when I'm an old woman sitting in the sun, remembering the great fools in my life. She sounded angry and scared. In a clearing, we found a place where lightning had blasted an oak, splintering the tree and burning out the underbrush. This will do. Help me with the dogs. She'd become fond of my little pack and quickly helped remove their harnesses and packs. Then we fed them long strips of dried alligator, and I gave the order for them to stay. Squirm and Fetch promptly laid down by the packs, tongues lolling. Bart gave me that searching look, as if he didn't quite understand. They won't leave? she asked. Not until hunger or thirst drives them away. I left my trader's staff but took my bow and arrows, just in case. Then I carefully laid the oiled Cristiano blade atop one of my packs. The thing would just get in the way in the brush, and I wasn't sure how one used it anyway. Unless, of course, the opponent was a small alligator. Leaving the clearing behind, we picked our way carefully, both of us studying the trail we would use to return to the spot. In places, I broke branches and left scuff marks and other clues. Night was falling as the trees thinned. I could smell the dank odor of salt water and mangroves. So much the better, not even Christianos could see in the dark. Crouching down, we crept forward until we could see the water. The surface of the bay seemed to gleam a copper color as the setting sun glowed molten off the low swells. The beach here was nothing more than a tangle of mangroves, and for the most part, impenetrable. After several attempts and lots of backtracking, we found a trail that paralleled the shore, heading westward. Do you see to have several towns off to the west? Pearlhand wiped a spider web from her face and scowled down where a banded water snake slithered under the leaf mat. Christianos don't like work. They'd rather take a town someone else built so shelter is ready-made. A fork in the trail led toward the water, and we hurried down it to find a slender section of beach white with shell. Stepping out, I looked past the screening mangroves and caught my breath. To the west, silhouetted by sunset, I could actually see the floating palaces. I counted nine of them, rounded hulls with pointed boughs and what looked like winter bare trees rising from inside them. How could such trees grow? Were the insides filled with dirt? And how were they watered, just by the rains? Or did the Christianos trees live off salt water like the mangroves? They are magical, those trees, I whispered in awe. Idiot, they're just tree trunks with the cross pieces tied to them. Then they hang big squares of fabric to catch the wind. That's what moves them, like holding up a sheet in a canoe when the wind blows. I felt slightly humiliated, but couldn't tear my gaze away. Gods, Blackshell, you're hopeless! They're just men, and nasty ones at that. I don't know how long I stood there, watching as the sun's orange globe sank behind the far horizon of trees that marked the western perimeter of the bay. As the light faded, I could see little lights on the distant vessels. Judging distance, we were only a couple of hands' time to the east. As the light faded, I reluctantly followed Pearl Hand back to the trail. Does this lead to Izida? I wondered. You've seen them, let's go. Only the floating palaces. I want to see the men and their great beasts. And no, don't say it. I don't want to meet them. Just spy from the trees. She was shaking her head, and I could see the fear and resistance. If I ask you, will you come away with me? Please? I'll do anything. Be your woman. Serve you. Black Shell, you don't know what you're risking. I turned, placing a gentle hand on her shoulder. You know the way back to the dogs. Go on. I'll be there by tomorrow night. I promise. She nodded wearily, defeat in the slump of her shoulders. It figures, 
First man I ever care for, and he's going to get himself made a slave. Her voice turned bitter. Go on, ruin your life. Just don't expect me to ruin mine. Then she turned, starting back down the trail. She didn't even look back. Not once. Chapter 7 My heart dropped in my chest and I took a couple of steps after her. Then I stopped, glancing back down the dark trail toward the Cristianos. She'd at least seen them, but me? What would I say for the rest of my life? That I was this close and just walked away? Grudgingly, I turned my steps west, working through the gloom. If I hid at the edge of the clearing, I could see them in the morning, get my fill, and slip back into the forest. I'd be back to Pearl Hand by mid-afternoon at the latest. Of all the names I could be called, Coward was the one that sent my souls into a quivering rage. You're a fool. I was surprised as Pearl Hand's shadowy figure loomed in the dark trail behind me. She stalked past, fists clenched. Come on, she said through gritted teeth. Let's get this over with. Maybe, the God's willing, I can keep you from doing anything too stupid. The sensation of elation and joy that burst in my chest came as a complete surprise. I wanted to leap after her and crush her to me. But, well, I'm still enough Chikaza to have my pride. A partial moon shining through puffy clouds provided a little relief as we made our way along the trail. I caught the faint reek of something and almost stepped on dark splotches in the trail. Slowing, I bent and picked one up. The thing was partially dry, a ball of something. I lifted it to my nose and sniffed at the sharp odor. What's this? Pearl Hand leaned close, taking it and sniffing. Dung, my foolish lover. Puss and blood, I never wanted to smell that again. It's left by the animals they ride. Christianos call them caballos. They treat the animals better than they do their slaves. If you feel in the damp places, you'll find the caballo tracks. Once you see one, you'll never forget it. Where a stream ran through, I bent down, tracing the rounded impressions. They were huge, like a buffalo's track, but from a single rounded hoof. By midnight, we had forded several more streams and followed the trail to an open clearing. I knew we were getting close to a town. All the easily collectible firewood had been scavenged, and occasional stumps from cut saplings could be seen in the moonlight. At the clearing, I eased along the fringe of trees and honeysuckle. I could see the village now, a palisaded thing with a surrounding ditch. Around its perimeter, some kind of conical fabric shelters have been set up. Fires winked, and I could see distant people moving among them. I stared, amazed. So many people? Just how big were those floating palaces? There had to be hundreds in the camp, not to mention the ones inside the palisade. The hollow sound of chopping, faint human voices, and laughter carried across the calm night. Metal made a distinct ringing sound I'd never heard before. Someone shouted in a language I couldn't understand. This is no slave raid. Pearlhand whispered. There are more than even landed at Chikora. Something made a snuffing sound in the distance, and peering through the moonlight, I could see a herd of giant animals off to the right. One seemed to have an unnatural protrusion in the middle of its back. I hissed and pointed it out to Pearl Hand. She squinted across the distance and said, It's a person, a rider on the creature's back, what they call a caballero. He's the night guard to keep the herd safe. There, you've seen them. Let's go. You need to work on your languages. There are more words than let's go. Come on, let's find a place to hide and you can explain everything to me. You've seen them. Let's go. I pointed at the black forest behind us. Through that? I say we wait for first light. We'll get back quicker and without breaking a leg or stepping on a water moccasin. A large fire could be seen inside the palisade. Christianos were there, feeding it. They're real, I whispered in amazement. Pearl Hand only shook her head in weary acceptance. The middle of the night isn't the best time to find a hiding place, 
but I located a stand of dogwood overgrown with nightshade, and we wiggled under the stems. Come first light, she gripped my hand, squeezing hard. Once you've taken a good look, we leave, right? No argument, no discussion. I promise. Gods, I'm betting my life on Chikaza honor. There are worse things to bet on. Like a Cristiano slave collar? They're metal, the same stuff as your sword. You can't cut them. I was filled with questions, but each time I asked, she just shook her head. In the end, she burrowed down in the leaves and went to sleep. I kept staring at the large camp and the Usita town the Cristianos had captured. Beyond the flicker of the great fire, only the thatch roofs could be seen above the palisade. I looked at the caballo herd and noticed the guard kept circling his mount around and around them. As they grazed closer, I caught the faint sound of singing. With a shock, I realized the man was singing to the caballos, and the melody was unlike anything I'd ever heard. It reminded me of a mother crooning to an infant. They sing to the animals? Traders never sang to their dogs. What was the point? A dog just flopped on his side and went to sleep. Then the breeze off the bay carried the scent to me, a slightly acrid odor new to my nostrils. Sometime in the night, I dozed off. A slight nudge to the ribs awakened me. Morning light was gleaming in the east, sending orange rays across the high clouds in the sky. Pearl Hand poked me again and gestured silently. Shifting and pulling myself up, I peered through the leaves to see the caballo herd, now no more than a bowshot away. At first I thought they were all cow elk, but they came in so many colors, black, white, brown, and splotched. The males had no horns. Then I got a good look at the night guard. He wasn't more than a youth. A silver plate with armholes was fitted over his chest. His legs were clad in a pale cloth, and his shirt was similar. Light brown hair hung down over his collar. Something about his face reminded me of a wedge, thin, with a straight nose like an ad's edge. At first I thought his face was dirty, only to realize that straggles of hair had sprouted on his chin and cheeks. You've seen one, Pearl Hand whispered next to my ear. Now let's go. She gave my arm a no-nonsense tug and began crawling back through the brush. I took a moment longer, fixing the sight in my memory, and carefully began crawling behind her. Within moments, we were under the spreading oaks and trotting eastward. He sang to the animals all through the night, I said in wonder. Do caballos actually listen? It keeps them calm she said, casting nervous glances at the forest as we circled to pick up the trail. I'm such a fool. I forget how the caballos can smell. It's luck, Black Shell, sheer luck that the wind held. If it had blown the other way, the caballos would have smelled us. The guard would have known we were out there. We hit the trail, and Pearl Hand dropped into a distance-eating jog. Running behind her, my souls replayed everything I'd seen. The floating palaces, the caballos, the man astride one of the great beasts, moving as one with the animal. For years I will talk of this, I almost cried with joy. I've seen them, and the North people will listen with awe. They'll listen all right, Pearl Hand was shaking her head. And if your breath-giver is kind, the Christianos will just keep to the coasts. They'd better, I replied. If they were to go seeking slaves among the nations, the warriors would put a quick stop to it. It would be the Christianos who ended up as slaves. You've never seen them fight, Pearl Hand growled over her shoulder, and you wouldn't want to. You keep telling me they are men. Men can always be beaten. These can't, not in a stand-up fight. And you know a lot about war? About their kind? Yes, a little. She was getting angry so I kept my own counsel, remembering the massed ranks of Chikasa warriors. No one could stand before a Chikasa assault, not the Choctaw, the Kusa, the Yuchi, or the Tuscaloosa. No one. Pearl Hand didn't know what she was talking about. The sun had just crested the trees, 
and we had almost reached the fork in the trail that would take us back to the little clearing and the dogs, when I heard an odd staccato behind us. For a moment, I was puzzled. Then I shouted, Buffalo! Behind us! A large herd! Pearlhan's panic registered on her face. Caballos! Run! We sprinted full out, reached the fork in the trail, and pounded along. I was faster than she, and urged her onward. I could hear the animals stop at the fork behind us, buying us valuable time. Then, faint shouts came, and I heard the caballos crashing through the brush, turning our way. They must have seen our tracks, I panted. How could they have come so fast? You've never seen a caballo run. If they have dogs, too, we're done. And she ran even harder. Behind us, I heard branches snapping, and the odd snuffling sound made by the caballos. If they're that fast, we have to hide. Maybe they'll pass by. Quick! Off the trail! Take to the forest! She darted through a hole in the sumac and palmettos, wiggling through vines. I crashed along behind her, hoping we weren't leaving a trail. We broke into a grove of live oaks, darting between their trunks and low branches. Then we were in pines, stumbling along, gasping for breath. Beyond them lay a stretch of open grass and tangles of briar, probably an old burn. Running here was impossible, our feet tangling in vines, the footing treacherous over old rotting logs. Honeysuckle and nightshade seemed like snares, and sawgrass raked our legs. We just reached the sumac and dogwood at the other side, bashing into the brush, clawing our way through. I heard a shout behind us, and saw a rider push his caballo into the mess. The big animal shied and pranced, the man sawing at the straps running to its mouth. Run, I said as I gritted my teeth, pounding away under an open canopy of gum, live oak, and pines. This gave way to swampy ground, thick with palmettos, gum, and occasional water hickory. Vines tangled the ground and wove a web through which we ducked and dodged. Each step sank in the black mud, sucking as we pulled our feet free. How long did we stagger and stumble through that mess until we reached firmer footing on the other side? I don't know, but the sun was several hands above the horizon when we hobbled out into a stand of live oak and pine. Pearlhand wobbled along on trembling legs, and as winded as I was, I knew she'd pushed herself to the limit. Onward we pressed, powered by terror. We had to have lost them. Those big caballos just couldn't follow us. I was sure of it. Rest for a moment, I called between heaving gasps. Then we'll head east, back toward the dogs. She dropped to her knees, chest heaving, sweat running down her scratched and muck-smeared skin. You're sure? Caballos would sink in that swamp. If they want us that badly, they'll have to find a way around. Meanwhile, we can't run much further. Not this winded. I flopped down beside her, panting, my heart racing. Beads of sweat trickled down my face. Gods, how did they find us? Tracks, she whispered. We should have kept to the forest. I nodded, feeling like a fool. Happy, she asked. Glad you've seen the Cristianos? Never again. At least you learn. She shivered then, eyes closed. That was too close. Then she gave me a pleading look. Promise. If it looks like they'll catch us, shoot me. Drive an arrow right through my heart. I blinked from the sweat running into my eyes. You mean that? Like I have never meant anything before. It won't come to that. I rose wearily to my feet, giving her my hand. Come on, let's walk. Too much rest will make us stiff. I tugged her to her feet and we plodded wearily eastward, my eyes searching for some sign of our trail back toward the packs. The thoughts running through my souls were sobering. When had I ever been that scared? Even that fateful day, when Horn Serpent's insidious voice ruined my life had been nothing like this. For a hand of time, we worked our way east through thickets of plum, buckthorn, and titus, then wound through pine and palmetto stands. My empty belly felt like a hole. At a small creek, we dropped, slaking our thirst, and proceeded.
We crossed a trail, and I bent down, seeing in daylight the round imprints of Caballos. A chill frosted my soles. They were bigger than my palm, and fresh, made within the last hand of time. Glancing up, I saw a lightning-riven oak, a familiar tree. We had come down this trail yesterday. Raising a hand for silence, I listened to the bird song and whirring chatter of insects. You said the Christianos clank when they travel. She nodded, panic so bright in her eyes they seemed glassy. The trail is that way. I pointed in the direction the caballos had gone. It's not far. If we stay behind them, we'll find the cutoff. But walk quietly. If we hear them clanking, we ease up without leaving sign and take to the forest. And if they see us, you hide. I placed a hand on her shoulder, staring into those eyes I had come to love. I'll lead them away and lose them in the swamps. You wait for a day or two. If I don't return, the packs and dogs are yours. Why would you do this, sacrifice yourself for a woman? I hesitated, hurt at the disbelief in her words. For you? Yes. You understand why, don't you? She nodded, a veiled expression, something I couldn't read on her dirty face. Then a single tear slipped on the corner of one eye. Weaving with fatigue, we set off. A finger's time later, I saw more of the distinctive round droppings left by the caballos. This time, I had no interest in inspecting them beyond a touch. Still warm. We weren't that far behind them. Where was our trail? It had to be close. I kept searching for the broken limb I'd left to mark the route. Finally, there it was. I almost dropped to my knees and wept with relief, but shot Pearl Hand a warm smile and eased off the trail. We were going to make it. I was almost shivering with joy. Carefully, I retraced our route, eyes searching the forest. We were back from the bay, the ground drier, more open under the trees. Get me out of this breath, Giver, and I swear I'll head north and never visit these lands again. There, Pearlhand said, pointing. You left that branch on the ground to mark the way. We're almost there. My souls were singing. We'd rest until dark, eat, and restore our strength. Then, with nightfall, we'd head east, away from these terrible men. Pearlhand was staggering along, stumbling over her own feet. She had used up all her reserves. We were just going to reach camp before she collapsed. I remembered the trail we'd crossed the day before. Dimpled with deer tracks, we hadn't taken it because it ran east-west. Pearl Hand plodded wearily across it and into the brush on the other side, scraping through the palmettos, and disappeared into the brush. She'd fixed doggedly on our hidden camp, her only concern being to reach it. I stopped, just long enough to make sure the soil wasn't marked by caballos. Only the deer tracks marred the ground. In relief, I took a moment, just a couple of heartbeats to catch my breath. As I was about to follow Pearl Hand, I shot a glance back down the trail, just in time to see the rider pull up his caballo. We weren't more than two bow shots apart. The scene is embedded in my souls. Him sitting there, holding the straps. The caballo stopped short, staring at me with pricked ears. Dappled sunlight was gleaming on the man's breastplate, and he wore puffed-out sleeves on his blue-striped shirt. A black beard graced his cheeks and went to a point below his chin. His eyes, like polished stone, met mine. They seemed so dark, unlike the shining metal hat on his head. Time stood still, an eternity measured in heartbeats. Then it broke, shattered by his shout. He pounded his heels against the animal. I could see other riders coming behind him. How many? Christianos, I shouted as I raised a fist at the rider. I'll meet you at Ocale Town. Then I turned and ran with all the strength I had left. The caballos are incredibly fast, like stampeding bison. They can be on you in less time than it takes to draw a deep breath. I was just about to leap to the side when something hit me from behind. The impact lifted me off my feet, slamming me into the ground. I lost hold of my bow. My body bounced, 
and bounced again. After that, nothing but blackness. The Gamble What do you think? That heroes are just sprung from nothing? Popped out like pots out of a mold? She lifted her head, hearing the joints grind in her neck. The warm sunshine had soothed her aching body, allowed her to drift off into shallow dreams, where faces of the long dead floated against a hazy backdrop, like images overlaying morning mist. She blinked, hearing the old man's voice, and glanced off to the right. Yes, it was throws his fist, so named for the time when a Cristiano sword lopped off the man's hand. The hand, and the war club it held, had flown off to disappear in the middle of a fight. Now the grizzled elder sternly lectured his wife's grandson, pointing with his left index finger to emphasize his points. The old man had his bony butt planted on a log, while the wide-eyed boy, all of eight summers of age, stared up worshipfully. Of course power can influence the world, but that's the point. Influence. Decisions, you see, lie within the hearts of men, creatures, and chance. Men can only be set on the path. After that, power gambles. Ah, yes, she thought, as she closed her eyes, leaned her head back against the clay-plastered wall, and turned her wrinkled face up to the midday sun. Power made a gamble, perhaps an informed one, but an uncertain gamble nevertheless. Christianos don't believe that God gambles. She smiled at the notion, remembering Black Shell and how he'd struggled to understand the incomprehensible Christiano God. Her passionate voice came from memory. But Black Shell, you have to think deeper, if that's the case. If God controls everything, even knowing the fate of men not yet born, what is the point of creation? And worse, what does that say about the nature of God? He must be bored stiff. Power must gamble with men's lives. God cannot know the outcome. Otherwise, the universe has no reason to exist. She smiled at the memory of Black Shell's perplexed expression. Even back then, smack in the middle of it, he'd been blind to the very wind that blew him toward destiny. Oh, blind, all right just as blind as I was. She chuckled at herself and coughed, thankful for the sunlight beating down on her withered body. Memories of the day Black Shell was captured rose to play behind her sun-reddened eyelids. The image unfaded. She remembered Black Shell's cry of warning, and she'd thrown herself to the ground, crawling like a snake into a thick tangle of grape. There she cowered, panting for breath, sweat trickling down her face. She heard the pounding of hooves, a triumphant cry, and then voices. The old familiar cadence of the language had stirred a latent terror deep inside her. For a moment she'd lain frozen, as desperate as a deer hearing the soft padding of a passing cougar. Oh, how foolish I was. A toothless grin spread, heedless of who might see and wonder. Power made its gamble all right. And all along I thought it was Black Shell upon whose fate the gaming pieces had been cast. But in the end, she'd forced herself to raise her head, to see his limp body being bound to the caballo saddle. After they had ridden off, she had managed to rise, stagger back to the camp, and throw her arms around the anxious dogs. Only then had she been able to bury her face in Bark's fight-scarred neck and sob her terror. Chapter 8 For what seemed an eternity, my soul's twisted sickly, colors of black and red swimming before my eyes. The pain in my head cannot be described, short of a burst skull. My first conscious memory was of my gut heaving and bile filling my mouth. When I blinked my eyes open, it was to see the ground passing just below my head. That reek in my nose came from Caballo and my body seemed to be bobbing like a stick on rough water, jerking up and down. My gut cramped again, pumping more bile into my mouth. 
I was too weak to spit. Periodically, branches and saplings slapped my head or feet, and my gut ached in minor sympathy to my cracked head. I'd never known such misery. Finally, the realization sank in that I was strapped across the back of a caballo, my head hanging down. No amount of effort would move my arms or feet. A cheery voice spoke to me in a language I could not understand, and a fist smashed into my side. The mocking voice continued, the language rising and falling, finally ending in a laugh that sent a quake through my souls. Shades of light darkened and grew blood red behind my throbbing eyes. I drifted away into memories of my boyhood, of running with friends, learning stickball, a long gone racket in my hands. Images of warriors returning from battle, walking through the palisade gate in bright sunshine, drifted behind my eyes. I could see them so clearly. White feathers filled their greased hair. Their shining faces were painted in the colors of war, black and red. White teeth gleamed behind smiles as they marched in a double line. Three times they circled the Chikofa council house, parading in the opposite direction of the sun. Then my mother's face rose from the mist, her eyes dancing as she told me what a great high minko I would make. I could see firelight reflecting on her proud cheeks, hear the hope in her voice as she told me how I would meld the clans into the greatest of nations and conquer many enemies. Then, from nowhere, came the voice of Horned Serpent, just as it had those many years ago. Run! Sibilant and terrible, it forced its way through the sounds of battle. The force of it stilled the clacking of war clubs against shields. Hissing arrows fell silent, and the cries of wounded men, the shrieks of rage and defiance, ebbed into silence. Run, or you will die here. Then I was running, tearing through the forest, leaping roots, my feet pounding on the leaf mat as I pelted off through the dim light shadowed by a thousand great oaks, hickory, and maple. Run, Horned Serpent's voice goaded me to panic. Voices intruded and ate their way into my sick pain. Real or dreamed? I blinked, forcing my neck to crane. What I saw was horribly real. We were in a clearing, and I recognized the palisade from the night before. Uzita. Christianos were walking up, all sizes and shapes of them. Their voices sent spears of terror and hopelessness, like needles through my souls. Then they were around me. One, a pale-haired man, lifted my head by the hair, staring into my eyes. His were blue, the color of a spring sky, and behind them coiled a violence that threatened to lash out, like slivers of chert. A rope was loosened around my gut, and I tumbled off the caballo like a limp sack, slamming into the ground. I heard the grunt from my lungs as if it came from a great distance. Exhausted, I lay there, a ringing in my ears. Christianos were bending over me, their fingers picking at the rope that bound me. Rudely, they ripped them from under me, burning my skin. Someone shouted an order I could not understand. Then I was kicked. The order was repeated, and I looked up. Christianos surrounded me, repeating the order, gesturing with their hands that I stand up. More kicks followed, and I finally got my hands under my chest, heaving. With my right leg, I pushed up, only to topple as it collapsed under me. The kicking continued, each stab of pain growing more and more distant. I began to float, and a gray haze settled over me soft and comforting as it grew darker and I drifted away. I remember dreams of Pearl Hand. We were young, living among my native Chikasa. She was smiling, handing me raspberry tea. Then her soft hands were stroking my skin. And over us crouched the mighty form of Horned Serpent. He looked exactly as he had that day of that fateful battle, Sunlight glistened in tiny rainbows from the scales that armored his skull. 
The horns that jutted from his head were forked and might have been made of translucent red jasper that almost glowed. Awesome crystalline eyes stared down at me in glittering splendor, like faceted quartz. And in their gaze resonated a power that sent its waves through my souls. Chevrons, dots, and dark-centered circles decorated the length of his huge body. Each consisted of a symbol from the first days, drawn upon his hide by Breathgiver during the creation. And finally, those mighty wings rose from the center of Horn Serpent's back and spread above us, large patterned feathers almost transparent in the sunlight. Despite their immense spread, I was drawn back to the great serpent's eyes. Under their intoxicating stare, I was frozen, stiff with fear. Why? My voice croaked, as if the words were forced of their own volition. You are about to find out, Black Shell of the Chikasa. The dream shattered when someone placed water to my lips. A ceramic cup grated against my teeth. Liquid splashed into my mouth, and I coughed, blinking my eyes open. I heard all over, and couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. A man's face, bearded, looking concerned. He spoke, the words nothing more than a babble. Then he tried again, using language after language. Finally, in Timakua, he said, Drink. This time, when he placed the cup to my lips, I greedily sucked down the precious fluid, feeling it run cool in my belly. The cup empty, he dipped more from a wooden bucket. Time after time, I emptied the cup. From a sack, he removed bread placing it to my lips. Eat. I took a bite of the bread, chewing, wondering at a sweet taste different from any bread I'd ever eaten. Who are you? he asked. Black Shell, a trader of the Chikasa. I come under the power of trade, I replied in my native Chikasa dialect. He shook his head. Who are you? His hands formed the sign, Name. Black shell, I repeated, and finally gathered enough sense to look past him. I was inside the Uceta Palisade. Houses were scattered here and there, and around them were placed great round wooden containers, banded by metal. Boxes were stacked, and occasional caballos stood tied off from the palisade just down from me. I could see Cristianos walking around, some chopping at wood, others passing with heavy boxes on their shoulders. At the far end of the town, Caballo stood hitched below the chief's house atop its mound. A large gathering of men, apparently at a conference, were talking and gesturing. Then I sniffed, smelling wood smoke, cooking, and the now offensive odor of Caballos. Where, the man said, making the hand sign for the word. Where, what kind of question was that? Uzita, I guessed. He spoke in some foreign tongue. At my lack of comprehension, he added, You not Uzida, and Timakua. Chikasa, I told him, finally getting his meaning. He shook his head. Don't know. Then he pointed to himself. Ortiz. I made signs with my hands. Was I captured alone? He studied them and nodded. Only you. I started to rise, only to hear clanking and feel a tightening around my neck. Reaching up, I fingered a thick metal collar around my neck. Craning my head, I could see it was attached to a series of metal links that had been fastened to the palisade by means of some sort of heavy-looking loop. Ortiz grinned at me, then signed. Where are you from? Chikasa, I replied once again. Then I pointed, saying in Timikua, North, far. Oro? At my incomprehension, he asked in Timakua, Metal there? Not like this, I pointed at the collar and shook my head. Yellow metal there? Did he mean copper? Yes. He nodded, grinning. You take us to metal in Chikaza? Why go that far just to find copper? I shrugged, then nodded.
If he was fool enough to march on Shikaza, I'd be happy to watch his accursed Christianos mowed down like summer grass before the ranks of disciplined warriors. I come under the power of trade, I told him. Remove this. I pointed at the collar. Do you understand? Power of trade? I am protected by power. A traitor. You work for us. I'm a traitor, protected under the power of trade. Take me to your chief. With that, Ortiz gave me the sort of look he might have given a rock. He handed me the rest of the bread, picked up the bucket and sack, and walked off toward the council. I tried to stand again, realizing the short length of metal loops wouldn't allow it. Having nothing else to do, I inspected the Cristiano chain, running the sun-hot rings through my fingers. I pulled hard and didn't see them stretch in the slightest. Then I fingered the collar, realizing it was sealed by two metal buttons. One look at the palisade post was enough to convince me I wasn't going to pull that down. So I sat there, eating the bread, looking out at the great floating palaces and the bay beyond the houses, and studying the Christianos as they passed. I didn't want to see them this close. And then it came crashing down on me. Gods, they've made me a slave. When I glanced out at the floating palaces, a new sickness deepened in my belly. Pearl Hand's words echoed between my souls. Cristiano's slaves die within a season. No one has ever come back. Hearing the clanking of metal, I stared through the palisade to see a long line of slaves, native peoples approaching from along a forest path. Each one bore a heavy box on his or her shoulders, and they were tied together at the neck with a chain. On they came, more than a hundred walking past in a shuffling gait. From their tattoos, the shapes of their faces, and the cut of their hair, they were from no people I'd ever seen before. A handful I'd noticed with amazement had skin the color of charcoal, with broad noses and skull-tight curly hair. The Christianos must have brought them in the floating palaces. Large islands lay to the south, far out on the sea, and periodically they traded with the Tequista and the Calusa peoples. Maybe the Christianos had captured some of those. I watched them deposit their loads while the Christianos shouted orders, and then they shuffled off, back down the trail. What really horrified me was the lack of expression in their eyes, as though their bodies had been left soulless, empty, and gutted by despair. I lost track of the time, watching the arrival and departure of the slave line, drowning in a cold and bottomless sea of despair. Oh, how I knew that soul-sick sense of disbelief. It cores a person out, leaving him as hollow as worm-chewed acorn. I lived it for days after my banishment from Chikasa. But you survived, the words formed deep down inside me. Yes, I had. I blinked, looking around. And maybe there was a way of surviving this. Think, Black Shell. It came to me. What did they want with copper when they had metals like the stuff binding me to the post? Take them to Chikasa? The idea was foolish nonsense. If the Christianos wanted copper, all they had to do was offer their metals in trade, and they'd have every high minko, chief, priest, and trader in the nations beating a path to Uzida. To obtain the copper, they'd scour towns and relatives and raid others for every scrap to trade for Cristiano goods. Within a year's trade, the Cristianos would have piles of copper heavy enough to scuttle their floating palaces. It just didn't make sense. Figure this out, Black Shell. Do that, and perhaps you can win your freedom. So I sat there for the rest of the day, watching the Cristianos. How do I explain them to normal people? Their hair comes in black, brown, tan, yellow, and even red. Their eyes range in color from black to brown to greenish to sky blue. They like heavy moccasins that rise to the knee but are much stiffer than ours. Their clothing, ah, now there's a marvel of weaving, cut, and dyeing. They have a stouter cloth than we do, 
much more durable. We can make colors just as bright, but theirs do not fade as quickly. The quality of their leather is superior to ours and stronger. They brought women with them, obviously slaves. These wore tattoos I had never seen before and went about cooking, tending fires and other menial tasks. None of them looked the least bit happy. Then I saw my first Christiana woman. Her skin was pale like theirs, her black hair done up in a style I had never seen before. She walked from one house to another, at the edge of my vision. To my amazement, she wore a full dress with a tight collar, sleeves to the wrist, the hem dragging the ground, despite the heat. It looked terribly uncomfortable. And no, she didn't have a beard. The next marvel announced itself with a curious grunting. I peered through the gaps in the palisade to see a herd of most peculiar animals. These things were round-bodied, long, with thick triangular heads, flapping ears, and no hair. They had flat noses and tiny curling tails. The legs were short, leaving the beasts close to the ground. The result was a bouncy gait. I watched in amazement as perhaps a hundred of the pink and black splotched animals were herded past the palisade. They were so close I could see their little beady eyes and watch their splayed feet as boys used long poles to keep them moving. I shook my head at the grunting and squeals, trying to place the creatures. What on earth were they here for? And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how such a beast could survive without hair. They looked completely incapable of defense. On first glance, you couldn't help but think that a bear or a cougar would shred one to pieces. They won't last long. I muttered to myself. But then, would I? I leaned back, trying to find a comfortable position. Fear was returning to settle around my bones. The only good news, if there were any, was that now Pearl Hand and the dogs were headed east. At least I saved you, I whispered, remembering my words to her on the trail. I closed my eyes, thinking back to the time I'd spent with Pearl Hand. A smile came to my lips. If only I could go back, turn my stupid steps to the north, I could have lived the rest of my life with Pearl Hand. In anger, I looked around, watching the Cristianos. That's when another long line of slaves appeared behind the palisade. These two were chained together at the neck, each with a heavy box on his shoulders. Guards walked along, armed with curious bows mounted sideways on wooden handles. Some carried whips that they used to keep the line moving. They had dogs with them, big things with long muzzles. I wondered what they needed dogs for when they had caballos to pack with. I called once, but the dog didn't cast me more than a glance. The sweating slaves labored under their burdens as they entered the palisade, and began stacking yet another pile of boxes. I looked at their chains, then at my own, giving it a vicious tug. Puss and blood, Black Shell, you're a fool! At sunset came another group on Caballos. They drove a collection of four men and five women before them. I watched with interest as these were taken one by one to an overturned wooden pestle. A Cristiano used a metal-headed hammer to fasten the buttons on the collars. It was an interesting process, watching them kneel while the buttons were driven through. This was for the men. The women were taken to a hut, where, one by one, the Cristianos entered, and from the sounds, what they were doing with the women was obvious. You got away, Pearl Hand. May Breath Giver grant your feet speed as you make your way north. The men were brought over, a length of the metal chain was passed through their collars, and they were fastened to the palisade posts next to mine. The thing that locked them in place was a lump of metal, the loop of which clicked shut and couldn't be opened again. I inspected mine again, seeing a little slot on the side with a round opening in the top. Greetings, I called. The men looked broken, staring at the ground. None bothered to return my welcome. We just sat, all of us despondent.
I kept dreaming of Pearl Hand, remembering how she pushed herself to get away from Iraperakoki. Breath giver, tell me she's far away and gaining distance by the moment. Run, girl, run. As evening fell, my thoughts were interrupted by the clanging of metal. For the first time, I watched men fight with Cristiano swords. Well, practice, actually. I was trained to the war club, having learned to parry, dance, and swing. Compared to a Cristiano sword, a war club is a slow and brutal weapon. For the first time, I began to appreciate the brilliance of the sword's design. Light and fast, it could block, cut, parry, and stab. I watched and marveled. Then came a terrible thought. How can warriors with clubs stand against swordsmen such as these? It was a miserable night sleeping there. The mosquitoes found us just at dusk and hummed in huge columns as I slapped them by the hundreds. The other captives didn't even bother, perhaps figuring if the little beasts drained them dry, they'd simply fade away and die. Is that what you want, Black Shell? I wasn't sure. Chapter 9 The following morning Ortiz arrived again with his bucket and sack of bread. He fed us one by one, and then, from a pocket, removed a thin piece of metal and inserted it into the slot in the lock. It clicked and sprang open. I was amazed. I stood up, looking around as he freed the others. Did I dare take a chance and run for it? Ortiz clapped his hands to get our attention. He spoke with the other captives, then looked at me, saying in Timucua, Work! With hand signs, he added, Do not run! Dogs hunt! And he pointed to a man who walked over with three of the big dogs trotting behind him. So that was why they had dogs. Ortiz, I tried to sound reasonable as I could. I'm a trader, and come under the power of trade. Work, he stated simply, almost dumbly. A length of the heavy chain was run through my collar, leaving me a little more than an arm's length from the man ahead. I followed as a Cristiano gestured for us to move. The way led out through the palisade gate and along a beaten trail that paralleled the shore. Ortiz, followed along behind. Do any of you speak Timakua? I asked my fellow captives, but I might have been speaking Muskogee for all the comprehension in their eyes. I tried hand signs, and only got a shrug from one. These were locals, probably Uzita, ignorant fishermen and hunters who hadn't had the need to learn the sign language of the trade routes. We arrived at the mouth of a small river, and what a sight. Boxes, the round wooden containers, and piles of goods covered with stiff fabric blankets were everywhere. Wide boats, manned by ten men plying curious flat-bottomed oars, were unloading yet more boxes and wading ashore with them. What wealth of trade did they contain? Ortiz stepped past the dogs, speaking to the locals. Then, to me, he added, Work! Pack! Then he imitated the motions of lifting the heavy boxes. The local Yazida caught on first, one of the men bending and lifting a box to his shoulders. I shook my head, refusing. At a sign from Ortiz, one of the dog handlers brought the beasts forward, and with a single command, he pointed at me. The dogs began snarling, snapping with their powerful jaws. I grabbed a box. I still have nightmares about those dogs. I watched a woman run from the hut where the Christianos bedded them. Evidently, she'd had enough of filthy men between her legs. She barely made it past the palisade gate before the dogs were loosed on her. Her screams still fill my nightmares. Then, to my astonishment, the funny little grunting animals were turned on her corpse. Within a finger's time, they stripped her bones. It was a horrifying lesson to us all. Puercos, Ortiz had told us, observing our shock and disbelief. What are they for? I asked in Timucua. To eat, he answered. 
Eat. I stared at the now despicable creatures. Eat the dead? Or what? Surely not even a Christiana would eat such a vile beast as a puerco. For three days I carried boxes, all heavy, from the landing to Izita. The collar on my neck wore through the skin, and blood began to leak down onto my shoulders. The heavy chain jingled and clanked as it hung down my back, making the thought of running even more unreasonable. The dog handlers had added a whip to their assortment of threats, and if we didn't move fast enough, it would come curling out to snap welts on our backs and sides. Each day more men were brought in by the caballos. Every morning and night we were given bread and water. They did let us drink from the side of the river between loads. I am a traitor, I called out once as Ortiz passed. Do you understand? I am protected by power. That brought a snicker from one of the men down the chain line. He was a recent addition to our line, having been brought in the night before. As I met his eyes, he made a dismissive gesture, saying, Ortiz was Chief Makoso's captive for ten years. He speaks only a little Timakua, a smattering of Calusa, and knows even less of your laws of power. He barely understands the ways of our own Uzita. But doesn't he understand that power will turn on the Christianos if they ignore it? The man dropped his eyes as one of the guards walked past. These people spit on your power. Why then do they exist at all, huh? And then we were ordered back to labor. The world shrank, becoming the trail, the heavy load, and the endless plodding of our feet. I still hear the shouts, cringe at the feel of the whips. It comes back to me at moments when the souls wander. I could feel my strength waning, dimming, as I stumbled along. Our burdens varied. Once it was a collection of curious wooden things padded with fabric. They were beautifully made, the wood intricately carved, the fabric decorated in little designs of incredibly bright colors. Upon delivering them to the plaza below the chief's house, we were amazed to see one of the Cristiano leaders cry out with delight, hurry over, and plop his bottom into what turned out to be a chair. I stared in amazement. They brought chairs, of all things, just to sit in? Then we were ordered away, and by the time we made the return trip, the chairs had all vanished, evidently into the Uzita houses, where the new occupants could now sit to their pleasure. Another oddity was the heavy collection of metal parts that we toiled under. Moving the pieces from the landing to town took more than a hand of time. Parts were so heavy we had to shuffle along, sidestepping just to carry them. We left the pieces at one end of the plaza where a muscular Cristiano, with a big smile, clapped his hands and chattered on cheerfully as he inspected the pieces. By the time we were locked to the palisade that night, the contraption had been assembled and a fire had been stoked inside. We watched that night as the smiling Cristiano and two younger men tended the fire inserting bits of metal until they glowed red. These in turn were hammered on another lump of metal. I'd seen copper worked, but never hot like they did the yero metal. On the fourth day, one of the Uzida fell, dragging the rest of us down with him. Broken, he refused to get up. They turned the dogs on him. If you've never seen such a thing, hope that you never do. I pulled back to the length of my chain, horrified, as the dogs literally ripped the man apart. They went for the throat and face first, then his belly. One great black dog tore the man's side open, hooked his guts, and backed away, pulling living intestine from the wound. Then the others were on it, grabbing, pulling, emptying the screaming man's body of its contents. What manner of monsters are these? The guards were laughing, slapping their sides. I watched them howl with delight, and, but for the dogs between us, would have leaped for their throats. When it was done, one of the guards removed a great metal knife from his belt and called the dogs off. I watched in disbelief as he severed what was left of the ravaged corpse's neck, kicked the head off to the side of the trail, and ordered us to drag the body next to it. 
For the rest of the day, the empty, blood-blackened collar hung on its chain, sliding back and forth to remind us of our fate, should our strength give out. Breathgiver, I would kill them all. This ends Disc 3, Coming of the Storm, Disc 4. The morning of the sixth day, the numbers in my gang had grown to nearly sixty, all bound along the palisade. The new captives looked like startled quail, having no idea what was in store for them. Ortiz arrived with his bread and water. We woofed the meal like starving creatures, then washed it down. At that point, the Christianos began to assemble before the chief's house. A wooden cross had been erected there, and I watched, a dull hatred twining around my souls, as the Christianos knelt in lines. Several robed men walked out, taking a position before the cross. They spoke in soft tones that barely carried to where the line of us captives watched. I had figured the robed men were priests of some sort, and now they touched their foreheads bellies, and each breast. The priest droned on, calling out on occasion, to be answered by the kneeling men. Then, one by one, the Christianos rose and went forward, drinking something from a gleaming gold cup and taking a bit of food. I fixed on that golden cup. We had the medal, of course, but just in little, mostly worthless nuggets. I didn't know it could be used like copper. When Ortiz returned, the guards were in tow. I called out in Timucua, Ortiz, I am a traitor! He glanced at me and gave a shrug. What? I'm a traitor from the far north, I pointed to emphasize my point. What you are doing, it's against the power of trade. He gave me a blank stare. Power? Trade? I don't understand. Traitors are not to be treated this way. Doing so offends the spirits. It's a way that... Kayata! We care not for your magic. A new way has come. We serve the true god. You are but an animal. Work! came the order. I stared in disbelief and was jerked into motion by the chain. That day it rained, making footing treacherous. In the afternoon, another of the Uzita collapsed and again the dogs did their vicious business. This time, I looked away. All of my concentration went into the task of staying upright. At midday, a terrible pounding had started inside my skull. But an irritant at first, it grew to a throbbing, as if someone were stabbing giant cactus spines into my head. When we passed one of the headless corpses by the trail, the smell of it made my stomach lurch and I kept from vomiting by will alone. Gods, when would this day be over? It seemed hotter, and my nose was running. When my muscles began to fail, I reached down inside and pulled up hate. Oh yes, wonderful hate. It can burn like a fire and rouse the muscles. Used as a distraction, I could imagine myself sliding my Christiano's sword deep into the guard's guts and watching his insides spill like a load of eels onto the ground. I wasn't feeling right, something more than a lack of food. A different fatigue had left me weak and hot, desperate for water. A sudden shiver ran through me. You're sick, Black Shell. Perhaps witched some terrible evil inflicted by the Christianos. And then I tripped, falling, jerking the rest of the line down with me. For a terrified second I lay there, stunned, and then struggled to my feet. The others were staring at me in horror as I grabbed with mud-slick fingers for the box I had been carrying. Lifting it, we all managed to scramble to our feet. The whip cracked along my back, almost sending me tumbling into the mud again. But somehow, through brute will, I kept my footing. When I glanced at the guards, they were watching me, anticipation in their eyes. The dogs were poised, tails out, anxious for the order to attack. Grinding my teeth, tears leaking out from my eyes, I managed to bowl my way forward on wobbly legs. Concentrate. Think. 
Hate. Another slip and they wouldn't hesitate. The sensation of teeth ripping my flesh sent a live terror through my bones. By dint of will alone, I made the last three trips of the day collapsing against the palisade as they fastened me for the night. Had I ever felt this hot? Sweat was beating on my skin one moment, and the next, I began to shiver, as if in the deepest of winter. I wolfed my piece of bread, drank my water, and lay wearily, panting. When have I ever been this sick? How will I survive tomorrow? I wouldn't. The dull knowledge lay deep in my souls. I recalled Ortiz saying that they would keep me, perhaps as a guide to the Chicasa. That simple hope now lay dead. But for that last surge of fear, my gutted corpse would already be lying beside my severed head along the trail. Food only for the seagulls and crabs that scuttled ashore with the darkness. I didn't dare think about the puercos. I was feeling oddly lightheaded, my vision wavering like staring across a hot swamp at the height of summer when the air grows wavy. And oh, was I thirsty. Shivers ever more violent continued to run down my arms and legs, first hot and then cold. I glanced up at the dark sky world, seeing the familiar patterns of stars, but an inky darkness was my only reward. As light as I felt, I could firmly believe that without the collar, I could have floated up there, past the clouds, to the path of the dead. Blinking my eyes, I watched the murky clouds turn watery. They seemed to melt and run across the sky. In the shimmering, I saw a large wooden square raised upright. A man was tied, wrists and ankles at each corner. His head hung down over his chest. Angry patches of skin showed where lit torches had been pressed against his flesh. Dried blood traced lines down his naked arms and legs, the cut still open and clotted. Dark bruises marred his ribs and face. My uncle was standing beside me, and I remembered the time. I had just passed my seventh winter. The captive had been taken in a raid against the Choctaw, who lived south of us. Do you understand what is happening here? Uncle had asked. He was my mother's brother, High Minko of the chief clan, and the most important man in the world. We are bringing power back into balance, I replied. Warriors from his town raided us last fall. We retaliated and he was captured in battle. That is correct. Uncle then walked forward, lifting the prisoner's head to look him in the eyes. How are you feeling? Fine, the hanging Choctaw managed, though his voice was scratchy. Dogs like you know nothing of courage. Then the man twisted his head away, staring up at the stars, his eyes glittering. A low song rose in his throat, the sound of it weak from the pressure on his lungs. It wasn't easy to breathe hanging like that. The pain had to be unbearable. The words were slurred to the point I couldn't understand them. Uncle walked back, kneeling to look me in the eyes. This man is a warrior, nephew. Tomorrow at high sun I will cut his heart out and set his souls free. By his courage he has earned an honorable death. He paused. Do you understand the lesson here? I remember nodding. By attacking us, the Choctaw upset the balance between the red and white power. One of our people was killed. The dead man's souls cry out for revenge. By setting this man's souls free, the balance and harmony are maintained. That's right. Uncle clapped his hand on my shoulder. After this is done, we will send emissaries to the Choctaw under the White Arrow. The White Arrow is the gesture of peace, I replied. That's right. Uncle smiled at me. Together with the Choctaw, we will return the balance. Each of us has been tested and each of us has proven our strength. Red power was loosed, and now it must be brought back into harmony with the white. I remember how Uncle walked out the next day, a long stone sword in his hand. Around us, the people watched. The Hopaya and the lesser priests were singing. The warriors in solid ranks stood between the prisoner and the rest of the people. 
Uncle was resplendent in his fine white apron, a gleaming copper pin holding his tightly curled hair. My little brother and I stood just behind him to the right. The war chief and Tishu Minko to the left. I watched sunlight flash on the long church sword blade as Uncle held it high, calling the blessings of Breath Giver and the powers of the Sky World. The Choctaw had pulled himself up as straight as his weak muscles would allow. His broken voice was still singing as Uncle deftly drove the sword into his chest and cut the man's heart from his body. Honor, a true man died with honor, even surrounded by enemies. It had been beaten into my young souls. Now those same souls were floating, drifting in and out with each breath from my hot and sweat-streaked body. I will die without honor, pulled apart by dogs. What did it matter? My people considered me a coward. I wouldn't even have the chance to die as the Choctaw did that day. I wasn't even being given the opportunity to measure my souls against fate. Where would my souls go? How would they find their way to the West, to the edge of the world? We were taught that the life souls of the dead traveled westward, where the earth ended in a mighty cliff. There they were judged, and those found worthy made the leap, passing through the seeing hand's great eye to land in the sky world. Those judged unworthy hesitated at the last instant, their doubts sapping their muscles enough that they fell short, as they did in life. The endless fall was only interrupted by water cougars or tie snakes reaching out from caves in the underworld to snatch them. And, assuming my souls didn't hesitate, would the great seeing hands snap shut as it judged them? Would they slam against the hard knuckles only to fall? Tears began to leak out of my hot eyes, trickling to cool on my sweat-damp cheeks. Breathmaker, how can you allow these Christianos to even set foot on your land? I was so engrossed in despair, I almost missed what happened next. The woman who appeared out of the night wouldn't have drawn my attention, except that she dropped a bundle on the ground and spoke with the guard. Eres la guardia? Si, sí, he replied. Tienes un nombre, mujer. Maria de Lopez. Conoces Miguel de Lopez? Es mi hombre. ¿Qué haces aquí? Es tu cumpleaños, no? Yo soy tu regalo. ¿Qué? She pressed herself against him, running her hands over his body. Within moments they were on the ground. Some of the newer captives watched this with interest. Then I heard him grunt, and a rattling came from his throat. I glanced over, seeing the woman fingering through his pockets. She rose like a wraith, picked up her bundle, and hurried along the line of captives, calling in Muskogee. Black Shell! In my growing delirium, I asked, Mother? Idiot, she muttered, placing a hand to my face. Then she drew back. You're sick. Pearl Hand? My thoughts were reeling as she reached over my shoulder and inserted the thing the Christianos call a yave into the lock. I heard it click open. This was a dream, and what a wonderful one it was. Come, she said in Muskogee. The captive next to me called something. Pearl Hand hissed, Cayate, hijo de gusano. We all knew Cayate, Cristiano for shut up. She pulled me up, only to have me almost collapse. Glancing warily back at the Cristiano houses, she unfolded the bundle. I was hardly helpful as she pulled a long sleeve fabric shirt over my arms and around my shoulders. It was the sort of thing a Cristiano would have worn. Then she was yanking white fabric pants onto my weak legs, belting them at my waist. Why are you— Shh, she warned. Lacing my arm over her shoulder, she struggled to get me upright. I wobbled, the world spinning and wavering in my sight. The skin of my legs, arms, and torso tickled, irritated by the fabric rubbing against it. Why am I in these clothes? 
so you look like a house slave, she growled. A what? We started down between the houses, my weight staggering her. My legs had turned oddly rubbery, bending and folding beneath me. The dress she wore felt damp and oddly sticky. I wondered where she'd managed to get into such tacky liquid. I tried to smell it, but my nose was thick and running. A Cristiano coming towards us asked, Que pasa aquí? Manuel es muy borracho. Pearlhan replied to the dark figure and hurried us past. She had her hand on the chain to keep it from clanking. Es muy malo por un indio, the man muttered. Dios lo ayuda cuando el jefe lo descubre. Si, sí, Pearlhan replied in a fear-tight voice. The man followed for a couple of steps, then shook his head and continued on his way. But for the clouds, he might have managed a better look and seen the collar and chain. As it was, we were just two figures passing in the night. At the shore, Pearl Handmore dropped and lowered me into a dugout. Then she struggled to shove it out. I heard her sloshing as she scrambled in, climbed over me, and paddled us out into the night. I'm dead, aren't I? I whispered. This is a dream. A dream? I could only wish, she muttered as she threw a quick glance over her shoulder and drove us out into the bay. To the west I could see the floating palaces, the little yellow lights flickering, and to think I'd once thought them pretty. Then I drifted off, happy to float on the swells, my souls rising and falling with the waves, while fantastic dreams unwound like a magical spiral. Chapter 10 I walked in the twilight below a giant forest. This was old growth, perhaps dating back to the beginning times. The bowls as big around as a muskogee's house. Looking up into the great interlaced branches, the tops of the trees seemed to vanish in an infinity of leaves. Giant roots, gnarled and thick as a man's torso, wound through the rotting leaf mat like great snakes that dove into the soil. Overhead, Birds flitted back and forth, and the angry calls of squirrels could be heard. As I went, I kicked moldy walnuts and hickory shells before me. I could see deer peering at me from behind great trunks that six men would need to circle, fingertip to fingertip, whether to have any success at girdling them. A soft melody, born of bird's song and the whirring of insects, carried to my ears. As I proceeded through the cavernous depths, I came to the realization that a faint trail marked the route I followed, as if thousands of airy feet had trodden there before me. Here and there forest snakes lay, their colors blending with the leaves as they marked my passing with shining eyes. Where do you go, man? a voice asked. I stopped short, staring around, to discover a thin green snake perched atop a mushroom as big around as my head. That way, I motioned down the faint trail. To do what? the small green snake asked. I'm not sure. Neither are we, the little serpent replied. Have you decided that the time has come? For what? To surrender the price of life. I puzzled at his words. The price of life? It must be paid by all, the little snake uncurled. There is work to be done yet. Go, make your choice. I nodded, continuing on my way. Some memory, a thing that haunted me, lay just beyond my soul's ability to grasp. I puzzled over it as I continued, aware that the forest had a slight rise to it, the going ever harder. Ahead I could see patterns of light shooting rays between the great trunks, and only as I approached did it become apparent that I had reached the edge of a mighty cliff. I stopped at the precipice, staring out into a vastness of stars. They seemed to twinkle against the velvet blackness, and looking down, I could see no bottom. Across from me, a familiar constellation beckoned, the great seeing hand of my people, the gateway to the land of the dead. I studied the familiar pattern of stars so close I could almost reach out and touch them. The wrist was made from a line of three stars. 
the outline of fingers and thumb easily determined. In the center was the eye that observed those who leaped for its center. It was said that those dead souls who brought power with them and attempted to do with sorcery what they could not through worth would be identified in mid-leap and slapped into the abyss. Those who passed through the portal would find themselves safely on the other side. According to the story, in the beginning times, one of the hero twins made the leap, battling with the sky god who guarded the entrance to the sky world. After slaying the god, he hung the severed hand to mark the way for those who followed. The leap, however, was just the first test. Only on the other side did the dead souls find the path of the dead, that hazy band of light that stretched across the night sky. At its base, during the summer months, lurked Horn's serpent. Each spring, he spread his wings and flew up from the underworld to guard the entry to the path. Did I dare jump? I swallowed hard, thinking back on my life, on my exile so many winters past. What had I ever done that would be worthy? Lost in indecision, I heard a grating sound from just below the cliff's edge. I started to peer over when a giant bird's head reared over the drop-off's lip. Crying in terror, I backpedaled, lost my footing, and fell hard on my rump. I scrambled back like some awkward crab, staring down the length of an incredibly huge, pale beak. A woodpecker's, to be more precise. The point of it, a mere hand's length away, seemed to fill my vision, and looking down its length, I found two brown eyes taking my measure. A high crust of feathers lifted, giving the creature an even more fearsome appearance. Don't hurt me! The cry was torn from my throat. Black shell of the Chikasa, the bird said in a hissing voice. Come to measure his souls. No, I, I mean, are you dead or aren't you? Mildly, I squeaked. I don't know. What, who are you? The great ivory-billed woodpecker leaned his head back, and laughter like thunder shook the world. I am the west wind. I watched his huge wings unfurled and stretched across the horizon as far as I could see. The west wind? Well, I could believe it. With one mighty beat, those wings would have flattened even the mighty forest through which I'd just passed. My mouth had gone dry. It was believed among my people that a great woodpecker guarded each of the cardinal directions, hovering at the edge of the earth, battling forever with the giant water panthers of the underworld. The beatings of the wind's gargantuan wings powered the gales that shook and rattled roofs and toppled trees. The giant turned to inspect me with one fierce eye. But if you are not dead... Do you do here, Black Shell? You are Horned Serpent's creature. The smell of him is all over you. It is? I dared not sniff, afraid of what such a terrible spirit creature would do to me. The head tilted as if in thought. The great battle is joined, isn't it? Great battle? For the hearts and souls of the people. The beak opened and snapped shut with a crack that deafened. Though why Horn Serpent would choose you, I have no idea. You aren't much of a hero. Turned your back on your own people. I clamped my eyes shut, a terrible fear deep inside. He called me, told me to run. Yes, a clever story, I'm sure. I began to shake, aware that alone and unarmed, I had no chance against such a powerful creature. Your answer doesn't lie here. Try the south next time. Horned Serpent rises in the night sky, guarding the southern entrance to the path of the dead. Perhaps he'll talk to you, give you meaning, or take it away. The last was said with scorn. Go on, on your feet. I pushed up with my feet almost scrambling against the bulk of the tree, my fingernails eating into the bark. Now, the great bird hissed, run! 
I dodged sideways as that long beak opened and darted in my direction. The sharp points slashed two great gouges in the old trunk's bark where I had been. Turning, I ran, as I had once run from the Christianos. Glancing back, I saw the immense head dart at me, the beak snapping but a hand's length from my back. Then I was in the trees, and laughter rang out, turning to thunder that shook the earth beneath my feet. Black Shell? I cried out, gasping, my legs thrashing. Black Shell! At the same time, I felt hands gripping my shoulders. No! My voice came as a distant croaking sound. Again thunder boomed, farther away this time, and I blinked my eyes open. I felt hot and gulped cool air into my lungs. Black Shell, it's a dream. You're safe. It's Pearl Hand. Do you hear me? I kept blinking my eyes, but they didn't seem to focus, as though I were seeing through water. What? Who? It's Pearl Hand. You're safe. I flinched when thunder rolled across the land and sat up. I was in a small clearing, and a dark evening sky was filled with brooding thunderheads. Distant lightning flashed white through the clouds. Pearl Hand? I raised a weak hand and rubbed my roomy eyes. She was clearer now. A small fire was burned down to coals, the grass around it mashed flat. My dogs, Skipper, Bark, Fetch, Gnaw, and Squirm, were lying beside the packs, watching me with soft brown eyes. Squirm wagged his tail when my eyes met his. Fetch immediately picked up a chewed stick, tail wagging as he dropped it suggestively behind Pearl Hand. To one side I saw my bow and arrow quiver, evidently recovered from where the Christianos ran me down. After all, what use did they have for a bow and arrows? My trader's staff rested beside them. The presence of my weapons was oddly reassuring, though I didn't have the faintest notion, given the way I felt, where I'd get the strength to use them. Where am I? A camp, which is the little inland from the bay, far from the trails. It's higher here, surrounded by swamps. The Christianos won't come here. Not unless we give them a reason, like you shouting at the top of your lungs. What about the west wind? She bent down, lifting a water gourd to my lips. You're sick, fevered, half out of your head. I drank the gourd dry, then sank back onto a blanket, no strength left in my arms. In the process, the collar chafed my neck, and the metal links rattled. It took several attempts before I could identify the dark stain on her cloth dress. Dried blood. I tried to think back past the spirit dream. It was dark. You came. The guard. Where did your dress get bloody? Pearl Hand lifted a little stick of metal, what the Christianos called a yave. I needed this to unlock you. Then she produced a large knife, made of the metal Christianos called hierro. They are so predictable they lose any sense when a woman like me will lie with them. You killed him? I wondered, seeing the world begin to shimmer. My body had grown light and seemed to be floating. Would you rather I hadn't? she asked dryly. No. I was having trouble keeping my eyes focused. I thought you were far away, running. Images of fleeing the west wind wove themselves into my souls. Running. But I couldn't seem to keep my thoughts centered. I'm Horned Serpent's creature, in the south. South. The world began to fade, my souls floating lightly as thunder bangs somewhere off to the west, and a sudden gust of wind roared out of the night. The country consisted of broken hills and ridges, outcrops of crumbling sandstone protruding from just below the ridge crests. The forest here consisted of patches of hickory, black walnut, red and black oaks, with pines and red cedar interspersed. Sassafras, plum, and firebush grew in the bottoms. The way proved difficult with grape, prickly greenbriar, and thorny smilax, weaving an impenetrable maze. With my trader's staff, I pressed the smaller vines out of the way. The older ones were as thick as a man's leg. Panting for breath, 
I paused, my gaze following the great vines up into the forest heights. Daylight gave the canopy above a light green glow, and I could see birds up on the distant branches, staring down, watching my progress as they leaned their heads close to each other. Their chirped comments rose in lilting melodies. Resuming my way, I clambered over roots, my feet sinking in the spongy leaf mat that carpeted the forest floor. A damp, mellow odor from the rotting leaves filled my nostrils. The question of what I was doing or where I was headed didn't seem important. I just had to get there, wherever there was. As I proceeded, I could again make out a faint trail that wound through the forest, following the path of least resistance. It led me along the steep-sided ridge and traced a sinuous route around the old gray sandstone boulders, all covered with moss and lichens. Water stains had left black streaks down the stone. I noticed raccoons peeking around the boles of trees, their hairy little hands grasping the thick roots that shielded them. Curiosity filled their dark and gleaming eyes, as if they'd rarely seen a human like me. A copperhead watched from its lair in a cracked rock, the eyes seeming to gleam as its tongue flicked in and out. Near the bottom of the forest, great beech trees rose from the soil, their smooth white bark almost pearlescent in the forest twilight. High overhead, leaves rattled with the soft breeze, and I could hear cicadas rasping. Occasional flower petals fell from on high, drifting down and sweetening the air. The trail clung to the ravine side, following just under the sandstone outcropping. Deep inside the overhangs, I could see carvings pecked into the stone, and in other places, painted pictographs of Eagle Man, Water Panther, Buzzard, and large renderings of Rattlesnake. The glyphs were old, weathered, and sometimes spotted with moss, but the spirit beast effigies seemed to watch me with living eyes. Through the trees, I caught glimpses across the ravine and realized it was narrowing. The way became steeper, the bottom closing until I reached a dead end. There, the thick layer of weather gray sandstone created an overhang, the interior of which was obscured by an inky blackness. I could hear water trickling and became acutely aware of great thirst. My dry tongue rubbed dully over my teeth and scraped the roof of my mouth. Desperate for a drink, I stumbled forward, crushing mayapple and holly, pushing through thorny raspberry and currants, until I passed under the overhanging stone. I would have run right over the top of the slick-sided serpent, but some trick of the light shining on those polished scales gave me just enough warning to slide to a stop. Gods, what if I'd awakened the monstrous snake? I'd never seen a snake like this. The thing was as big around as a canoe. In the dim light, patterns of chevrons could be made out, and as my eyes adjusted, I could see they were black, red, white, and blue, the sacred colors of the cardinal directions. I couldn't swallow down my parched throat, and the sound of splashing water within the cave was likely to drive me mad. Frantic with fear, driven by thirst, I hesitated, then slowly took a step back. The great serpent shifted slightly, and the head rose in eerie silence. There is no going back, the words it uttered were sibilant, as if hissed from deep inside the monstrous reptile. I'm sorry, I croaked. I'm just so thirsty. I took another step back, and the triangular head poised behind a coil. I gaped in disbelief. The thing's head was as wide as my leg is long. A forked tongue shot out, and I could feel the breeze it created as it flipped back and forth, then was withdrawn between those plated jaws. Snakes can swallow things three or four times the size of their heads. My body wasn't even a snack, let alone a challenge. I'm sorry I bothered you. I lifted my foot to take another step back. The head drew back to strike, vertically slitted eyes locking with mine. Don't, the thing hissed. The only way left to you is forward. Choose. Ahead of you lies life. One more step back, and you're mine.
Yours? Oh, yes. That is my power. I've been given the ones who surrender to fear. I survive on those who flee. Run, Black Shell. Turn tail and make just one more step toward escape. Listen to your fear, skinny man. Give in to it. Run. I couldn't have moved had I wanted. Terror had locked my muscles. The head moved closer, and I flinched as the arm-thick tongue lashed out, flicking along my shivering flesh. I'm going to die. The realization was shouted between my souls. Best to make it quick. With all my resolve, I stepped forward, eyes closed to avoid the sight of that mouth opening. Nothing. Not even the flickering tongue. I blinked, staring uncertainly. The head had drawn back, but the slit-pupiled eyes remained fixed on mine. I took another step, right up to that hide, the scales large enough to use for plates. The snake's hiss reverberated inside the cavern. My leg was shaking as I reached out and started to clamber over the cold thickness of its body. The hiss grew louder, and then I was over, every muscle in my body trembling. Yes. The hissing voice said at last, You may pass. I guard the way, and it can be followed only through me. The way? I could see the water now, a crystal pool of it bubbling up from the rock. If I bent and drank, would that be the signal for the giant snake to strike? Cautiously, I took a step to the water and eased down, eyes locked with the snakes. Then it moved the head drifting to the right, the monstrous jaws split then opened. All the while I was fixed on that midnight slit of a pupil as it watched me. But to my surprise, the head slipped over to where the bulbous tail rested on dark stone. The mouth opened and slowly engulfed the tail, button by button, until it closed on smooth hide above the rattles. A snake eating its own tail? The story was told to children everywhere. Yet here I was, seeing it with my own eyes. Drink, now, while you can. I bent down over the water, shocked to see light rising from beneath. Placing my lips to it, I sucked draft after draft. Did I lose my balance, or was I pushed? Water, cool and pleasing, closed around me, and I was swimming, striking this way and that, seeking the surface. But no surface could be found. Panic left me thrashing, turning and twisting, desperate for the surface and life-giving air. In the tumult, I lost my trader's staff. Drowning, my soul screamed in realization. When the end came, I sucked frantically for air. I coughed as I drew a lung full of water, chest spasming, pulling water, expelling it. But the gray mantle of death didn't darken my vision. Instead, I slowly sank into the light, as though descending through a hole. Things began to grow clear around me, a different world unfolding. Instead of sky, I could see roots slipping down from the rocks overhead, and my feet settled on a floor covered with waving mosses and water grass. Fish darted this way and that, and to one side the biggest snapping turtle I'd ever seen lay half buried in mud its round eye giving me a thoughtful look. This can't be happening, I muttered. Oh, but it is. The voice was deep and came from behind me. I turned. My people draw images of the water panther, the piazza, and we fear him for his power in the underworld. This one was as tall as I. Feathered wings rose from the beast's back speckled with brown and black bands. All four legs ended in scaled bird's feet, the claws sinking into the mud. While the body and head were that of a cougar, the long whipping tail was that of a large snake, scaled and marked by dark circles with white centers. Adding to the fearsome appearance, long canines could be seen protruding from beneath the upper lip. I backed slowly away, wary of where Snapping Turtle waded in his mud lair. 
What do you want from the underworld, Black Shell? Water Panther asked. You are a man of the middle world, not ours. I don't know why I'm here, I told the beast truthfully. I was captured by the Christianos, and then— I frowned, having vague memories of Pearl Hand and waking in a camp with my dogs. But was that real or a dream? I clapped my hands to my head, suddenly unsure of anything. Horn Serpent, the West Wind, the great tie snake guarding the portal to the underworld, even the Christianos. Were any of them real? Movement caught the corner of my eye, and I turned ready for some new threat. Instead, Anhinga, the snake bird, flew down through the water, wings flapping gracefully as it pulled up, seeming to float just off to Water Panther's left. I'd swum with Anhingas, seen them fly beneath the waves in the pursuit of fish and crawfish. Not so long ago, I'd watch them, pearl hand at my side. The bird cocked its head, inspecting me with a knowing eye. To Water Panther it said, Last I heard, he was bothering the west wind on the edge of the world. He wouldn't make the leap to the seeing hand. We're not sure if he's dead or alive, or just hanging in between. Now he's here. He mentions the Christianos, Water Panther replied, his gaze never leaving mine. Says he was a captive. Look at his neck, the wound is still there, and Hinga pointed with a wing. Smell him, he reeks of their captivity. The west wind says he's horned serpent's creature. But why would he choose a man like this? Surely better warriors than this common trader can be found. Water Panther took a step forward, sniffing, lines of whiskers quivering behind the pink nose. He smells of Cristiano metals and disease beneath its horned serpent's musk. He seemed to consider. And Inga makes a good point. What sort of warrior are you? Warrior? I muttered in confusion. And Inga barely stroked with his wings. In the Middle World he is known as a traitor, an exile from the Chikaza. We watched him with his woman one day. We weren't impressed. I stared warily at Anhinga. All peoples considered Anhingas to be exceptional power beings. Like ducks, they soared in the sky, walked the earth, and dove into the underworld. To share power between all three worlds made such creatures incredibly unpredictable, and at the same time, marvelous. A Chikaza, what a panther mused. Great warriors, but this one hasn't the tattoos and doesn't introduce himself with the name of Man-Killer, the mark of a blooded warrior. I don't understand any of this, I said slowly, wishing to be anywhere but here. But to escape. Where? All around me was water, rock, and endless passages. He must have courage, Water Panther said reluctantly. Otherwise, the tie snake guarding the portal would be digesting his bones as we speak. I nodded, hoping the notion of being courageous was worth something. I'm just a traitor. Water Panther's head rose at the admission. And what have you brought to trade? I looked down at my body, naked but for a breechcloth. My trade is back with my packs. We don't want your middle world trinkets. What a panther stalked closer, although copper has a certain value here. What do you have to trade? Trade for what? Your souls, Black Shell. Only the greatest healers, dreamers, sorcerers, and shamans make their journey here, but they come prepared, having learned the ways of power in order to pass without being devoured by spirit creatures like me. You come alone? and in ignorance. What have you to trade for your souls? I tried misdirection. But Westwind says Horn Serpent, he's not here. Water Panther watched me with the same intent a cougar did a cottontail. Horn Serpent has flown up into the southern sky, guarding the path of the dead where it leads to the sky world. He'll be there for several moons, 
You, however, are here now, and unprotected, seemingly without trade to give for your souls. I have to return for my packs. I'll have something to trade, perhaps a Cristiano sword made of— That metal corrodes here, turns brown and flakes away. Most ugly. Water Panther reached up with a bird claw foot. I tried to twist away, but the cold, taloned foot grasped me like an osprey did a fish. I can crush you with just a squeeze, Water Panther said softly. It's not painless, but it's quick. You won't be around to feel what it's like to be eaten. I give you my word, I'll do anything. Taken. As quickly, I was free, Water Panther staring at me, the black pupils like dark pools in those yellow orbs. I staggered back, coughing after the restriction to my lungs. A bone-deep fear clung to my bones like old spider webs. I have your word, Water Panther repeated. You'll do anything when I finally ask it of you. Now go! I felt myself being thrust backward, my body rising as I thrashed, suddenly aware that I was suffocating, unable to breathe. Then a great pressure bore down on me, a crushing weight that felt sure to snap my ribs. Black shell, breathe! The weight vanished, my chest expanding. I tried to cough, water blocking my windpipe. The weight crashed down on me again, and I felt my guts being squeezed. Water Panther. He was crushing the souls out of my body. Black Shell? came the frantic cry. Please, breathe! The weight went away. The blockage in my throat loosened. I coughed, feeling something slimy and foul in the back of my mouth. I spit it out, coughing and coughing, the very act of it shredding my throat. My eyes fluttered open, and I lay gasping desperately for air. Above, a night sky was partially lit by a low moon. The stars looked as pale as scattered patches of frost. The path of the dead, like a band of hazy smoke, arched above. A small fire gave just enough light to see the dogs watching anxiously. My cheek rested on cool grass. Blessed gods, Pearl Hand muttered, climbing up from where she straddled me. Blow your nose. I did, my throat still tickling from the violent coughing. Mucus filled my fingers. I wiped them on the grass. Water Panther, I whispered. He tried to drown me. Pearl Hand sidled over, her face shadowed by night. I could tell she was inspecting me carefully. Water Panther? First the west wind, and now Water Panther? Her shoulders drooped. Your fevered black shell. It's a wonder you've hung on this long. Your lungs are making more fluid than you can expel. I've seen it before. People drown in their own phlegm. I was in the underworld. You were almost dead. The only thing I could think of was to roll you onto the ground and jump on your back. She looked at the slimy wad in the grass. I guess it worked. Pearlhand looked exhausted and sad, so I asked, Why are you doing this? After a pause, she said, Because I have to. You owe me nothing. No, she whispered. But that's the point, isn't it? God, she made even less sense than Water Panther. For a while we were silent except for my coughing and wheezing. I told her, Whatever sickness this is, you could catch it. She tipped her head back, long hair tumbling down past her shoulders. Moonlight illuminated her enchanting face. I've had most of their diseases as a child. All but the pox. That's a horror I'd soon avoid. Pox? I'd never heard the word. Don't even say it. Some people think just the mention will bring it upon them. I spit again and gasped for breath. A watery rattle sounded from my lungs. I was in the underworld. Underwater. I thought I'd drown. You were here, Black Shell. Drown? The same as, I suppose. If you hadn't been thrashing so, I might have slept right through it. She ran nervous fingers through her hair. 
I'd have awakened beside a corpse. Thirsty, so very thirsty. She placed the gourd to my lips. At the odd angle, some went down my windpipe. Unlike when I passed through the Guardian Serpent's portal, this was most unpleasant. I couldn't stop coughing, fear of drowning clawing at the back of my thoughts. Later, after she'd gone to sleep, I lay spent on the ground, riding the waves of fever. As always, it was Fetch who came over and pawed at me, a soft whine in his throat. But I had no energy for a game of stick. Finally, he lay down beside me, nose on his paws, watching me with worried brown eyes. I've given Water Panther my word that I'll do anything. But what did that mean? As if in answer, my entire body began to shake, my jaws clattering like hail on an ice-covered pond. Decisions A hacking cough brought her bolt awake. Black Shell, gods, is he all right? She sat up, wincing from the pain in her back and hips, and looked around, her heart racing. The fire pit, located in the center of the room, was marked by a pattern of red embers, and a roof blotted the sky she expected to be overhead. Pearl Hand rubbed a calloused hand over her withered face, hearing the rhythmic breathing of the others. I was dreaming, back there, in the camp with Black Shell, so long ago. She sighed grunting as she lowered herself to the pole bed where it jutted out of the wall. Rolling onto her side, she pulled the blanket up to her chin and stared at the glowing embers in the fire pit. Pulling the blanket's thick weave across her fingers, she looked back over the years, rekindling the dream that had haunted her sleep, remembering. A grunt of amazement marked her disbelief. How did I ever conjure the courage to go into that town and get him out? The dogs, seeing them, watching them, forever staring down the trail waiting for Black Shell, that had been even worse than her own tortured indecision. Fetch had been the worst, his preoccupation with sticks forgotten. Bark had refused to eat, although Gnaw had been happy to gulp Bark's meal before she could stop him and there had been something desperate expressed in Skipper's oddly blue left eye that had driven her half mad. I did it for the dogs. Of course. In the darkness, a smile curled her thin lips. The infinite ways in which a woman could lie to herself were an unending miracle. I couldn't admit, not even to myself, that the mighty Pearl Hand had come to love him. What a savage master pride is. But given the choice, which master demanded more? Pride or power? At first she hadn't believed. Oh, no. He'd just been sick, fevered, his souls loose from his body, driven out by the witchery of Cristiano disease. The dream's black shell. They changed our lives. Changed the very world. The embers winked and flickered as a draft played across the floor mats and stirred patterns in the coals. When did I finally come to believe? Was it the glow of the spirit world reflected in your eyes? Or was it that I could never conjure the courage to leave you? Chapter 11 I awakened to an early morning sun that peered through the gaps in a cloud-puffed blue sky. I still lay on the trampled grass, a blanket wrapped loosely around my body. I could see mangroves, thick with waxy green leaves in every direction. The remains of a fire smoldered in its pit. Sticks of driftwood had been piled nearby. One of the Cristiano's metal pots lay on its side near the fire, and behind it, my packs rested in a line. Of the dogs, a pearl hand, there was no sign. My eyes seemed to have trouble focusing, being roomy and crusted. Breathing through my hot, plug nose was impossible. I tried to sit up, and only did so by the greatest effort. A quaking tremble ran through my arms as I propped myself up. A terrible thirst burned in my dry throat. 
I peered around for the drinking gourd and spotted it just beyond arm's length. The simple act of crawling over to it drained my body of any reserves. Despite the shakes, I managed to get most of the liquid into my mouth and reveled at the cool sensation rolling through my gut. After emptying the gourd, I flopped on the ground, panting, hating the shimmering at the edge of my vision. For the time being, I was happy to just watch the clouds floating across the sky and listen to the birds and insects. A flock of seagulls in flight came wheeling over, glancing down at the camp with curious eyes before drifting away on the breeze. At least my weapons were close. I reached out, laying a hand on the bow stave where it protruded from its alligator hide quiver. Squirm, his white blaze and bib shining, and gnaw, with tipped tails slashing, came crashing up the trail. Tongues lolling, they paused at the edge of the clearing, just long enough to see me before charging over and mauling me with their mud-spattered paws. I enjoyed the sensation of their hot, sloppy tongues as they licked me on the face, hands, and arms. Then the rest of the pack appeared, Bark bellowing his pleasure before leaping full onto my belly. Pearl Hand walked behind, the hem of her skirt wet, a net bag of something over her shoulder. She caught sight of me under the pouncing dogs and called them off with a word. To my astonishment, they obeyed her perfectly, trotting over and plopping down at her feet to look up with adoring eyes. Only Fetch kept throwing me longing glances. You're awake, she greeted, and slung the bag down. I could see fish, crabs, and a couple of swamp rabbits, the latter looking a little worse for wear beneath the cording. I've never been this weak in my life. I rolled my head to one side, the collar chafing my neck. How would we ever get the accursed thing off? You're lucky to be breathing. She walked over and lifted the flap of blanket that covered my hips. From the relief on her face, I assumed I hadn't fouled myself. We were out of food, she remarked. The dogs and I were hunting. That and I managed to sneak a look at the Christianos. And? Most of them have left. Perhaps four tens of caballeros, and maybe six tens of foot warriors remain. Most of the floating palaces have gone too, but for some of the small ones anchored offshore. The rest of the army is headed inland. Which means? Pity Chief Makoso. I think they've gone his way. All but a handful of the slaves are gone, carrying the supplies and food for the Adelantado's army. Adelantado? I asked. That's what they call the Cristiano chief. His true name is Hernando de Soto. I heard that the night I sneaked into their camp to rescue you. They thought I was a slave woman, property of one of the nobles because I spoke their language. My souls were firmly enough anchored in my body to ask, Why did you do that? Come back for me. She poked at the fire, adding sticks, bending down to blow the coals into flames. Then she glanced at me. Because I'm an idiot, Black Shell. Who? My pearl hand? Not a chance. You have no idea how much I wanted to run. She gave the smoking fire a distant look. Had you ever asked, I'd told you I'd risk myself for no man. She shook her head. I never understood what women ever saw in men, or why they did the foolish things they did. And then you came along. Maybe it was in your eyes, or the way you talked to me. She shrugged. Maybe it was the way you held me, as though I were something precious. Whatever it was, I couldn't bear the thought of leaving you behind especially when you gave yourself to save me. I'd do it again. I let my gaze linger on her, even now knowing what being captured by Christianos really means. She smiled shyly. Good, because after what I've been through caring for you, you owe me. Owe you what? More than you can ever pay, traitor. I'll make good on it. The world was starting to shimmer again, and I pressed my eyes shut, as if to make it go away. Well, you got to see your Christianos. She was grinning when I cleared my vision enough to look away. What do you think now? I'd rather face spirit beasts.
which got me thinking about West Wind and Water Panther. We're not alone in this, you know. Oh, really? You got a Chikaza army hidden around here that I don't know about? She began pulling animals from the net bag, laying them out. Big old gnaw had begun to drool at the prospects. I've been having spirit dreams. I glanced down at my hand, seeing something under the nails. Weak as I was, it took a couple of tries to clean my fingernails, and was surprised to find bark wedged under one. I stared at it stupidly, remembering how West Wind backed me against the tree, and how I clawed at the bark in an effort to escape. Your souls have been drifting in and out of your body. You cried out a lot. She frowned. Things I didn't understand about great serpents, water panther, odd things that frightened me. If just hearing about them frightened you, you should have been in the dream. I shook my head, which made the metal collar clink against the links. Fetch took it as an opportunity to bring a stick and drop it before me. I gave it a half-hearted toss, barely worth the effort, but it was all I had. What do you think it means? She had busied herself pulling the hides off the rabbits. I could tell by the look of them that the dogs had run them down. It was enough to distract Fetch from his slobbery stick. I don't know yet. I swallowed hard, wishing for more water. Somehow I've always believed, but never really believed. Does that make sense? Everywhere I go, people have spirit helpers, guardians, ghosts, something not of this world. Once a long time ago, I thought I saw and heard Horn's serpent. I made a face. It didn't end well for me, and I was never really sure after that. Now all these spirit creatures in my dreams are saying I'm somehow tied to Horn's serpent. She had the fire crackling and placed the fish down in the coals to cook. The dogs were paying close attention to her every move. Squirm caught the rabbit skin she flung in his direction. A small melee burst out as the rest of the pack tried to take it away. Horned serpent, she mused. Then she glanced absently at the mangroves that blocked the view to the south. It's early summer. He's flown into the sky just above the southern horizon. To guard the path of the dead, I added, haunted by memories of the dreams. Do you know what my people believe happens after death? That the dead travel westward to the edge of the earth and make a leap through the seeing hand? I made that journey. But not the leap. Pearl Hand arched an inquisitive eyebrow. God, she was beautiful when she did that. I wasn't worthy. I looked down at where I'd scraped the bark from under my fingernail. Maybe that's why I'm still alive. The West Wind told me there was more to do, and that the battle had been joined. Then he chased me away. I stared uneasily at the little sliver of bark. And then I went to the underworld. I had to pass by a tie snake that swallowed its tail. She was watching me with sober eyes. It is said that tie snakes guard springs, passageways to the underworld. When they devour their tails, they make an opening through which only the greatest holy men can pass. I did. But I'm not holy. No argument there, she muttered. And that's when you met Water Panther? I nodded. It seems so real. She finished gutting the rabbit, throwing the entrails to the dogs. Then she propped the pink carcasses over the fire and turned her attention to the crabs. I have to go to the stream for water to cook these in. I'll refill the drinking gourd at the same time. I need to think about this. That said, she picked up the Cristiano pot and dropped the empty gourd into it before strolling toward the rear of the camp. Don't let the dogs get those rabbits, she called. Then she was gone. I waited for a couple of fingers of time, my vision wavering, not sure if I were floating or not. Somehow I just couldn't keep myself focused, let alone the world around me. Periodically it wavered and turned glassy. The dogs could have made off with the entire meal for as much attention as I paid them. I didn't see Pearl Hand return. She was just there, talking, halfway through a statement I hadn't heard. What? I cried in surprise. I said I think you need to tell these dreams to a priest. What do you Chikaza call them? Popaye? Why? She was dropping crabs into the Cristiano pot, 
but paused long enough to give me a knowing stare. Because you were being called, Black Shell. Called for what? I mumbled, trying to keep my souls from floating off. Did you see that cross the Christianos put up in Uzita? I watched them kneel before it. They did something with a gold cup and bits of food. She was thinking, her forehead lined. Where they go, they take murder, death, and misery with them. In their wake, they leave corpses in sickness. We don't see the world as they do, Black Shell. We think in terms of order and chaos, each trying to balance the other. Nothing in our world is truly evil. Christianos are, I replied wearily. I saw nothing good in anything they did. Only misery. Only death. Which is why we have to stop them, she said softly. That is why power has called to you. It's up to us. You and me. Otherwise they are going to come and ruin our world. I was drifting, my body floating again, waves of heat seeking to burn the souls from my body, only to be chilled to the bone a finger's time later. I barely remembered Pearl Hand spooning food to my mouth, or the cooling taste of water. After that, my world turned silver and watery, warm, as my body began to float away. This ends Disc 4. Coming of the Storm, Disc 5. Once again I was walking in the dream. The difference was, this time, I knew I was dreaming. My path followed the banks of a great river. The water to my left flowed clear and dark, the surface swirling, welling, and sucking down in little whirlpools. Along the bank grew giant stands of cane, patches of willows, and berry-dotted currents. Great bald cypress trees with thick red trunks rose from leaf-crusted ground, and here and there gum trees and water oak lent darker colors to the forest. Hanging moss draped from the branches like triangular beards, vines of grape and green briar rose up the trunks in thick ropes, and blossoms shot specks of color. White herons floated magically over the water, glancing my way as they passed, and from the forest depths I could see bears watching from the shadows. At my approach, turtles raised their heads above the water, and fish splashed before diving into the depths. The trail bent inland, and I walked beneath the shadows, smelling damp leaves, honeyed flowers, and the sweet perfume of a living forest. A bobcat eased out of the gloom, paralleling my path on silent feet. The normally shy forest hunter kept giving me knowing glances, its yellow eyes gleaming. A bit farther, the way wound along a levee that cloaked a back swamp filled with bald cypress and tupelo, the large boles of the trees ringed by water. An occasional heron or an hinga perched on the cypress knees, observing my passage as if they were guardians of the place. I shot the anhingas a nervous nod of recognition. Leaving the swamp behind, I made my way up a steep terrace and stepped out from beneath red and black oaks to find a small clearing. The grass had been neatly cut, as if grazed by bison. Across from me stood a small house, the walls plastered and painted a bright white. Thick amber-colored thatch rose in a steeply pitched roof, and around the eaves smoke drifted in tendrils of indulgent blue. I walked into bright sunlight and slowly approached the house. A great bear poked his head around from behind the structure, and through light brown eyes followed my approach. I could smell the most delicious odors of roasting hominy and beans as I stepped before the door, calling, Greetings, is anyone here? A moment, came a scratchy response. As I waited, I stared at the bear staring back at me. From the animal's demeanor, I couldn't tell if it was about to attack or run. The door hanging, made of old hide, had been painted in designs once, now they were faded ghosts of themselves. The hanging moved, and an old woman ducked out. Age had curved her back into a crescent, and endless seasons had engraved deep wrinkles into her sagging skin. Her nose might have been a mushroom pasted over an undershot and toothless mouth. Whiter than snow, her hair fell over her rounded shoulders. I could see a little green snake woven through her locks. It peered intently at me 
and seemed to whisper something into a shriveled ear. When I met her eyes, a shock ran through my very bones. The effect was like staring into all the ages of the earth, dark, deep, and endless. I blinked to keep my souls from being drawn into those hollow depths. Black shell of the Chikasa, she said softly, and her voice reminded me of winter wind among the branches. Who are you? I wondered. I have had many names among many peoples. Her eyes seemed to grow in her head, as if swollen from the memories. Most are forgotten, spoken by peoples long vanished, and in tongues no human can remember. Names have power, Black Shell, but like seasons they come, flourish, and fade away. I have heard my names uttered from the lips of the great, and inconsequential, all imploring, seeking, and vain in their hopes for love, revenge, authority, or salvation. She shook her head slowly. Fools, every last one, what care I for a high minko's lust for conquest, or a whimpering youth's desire to see a pretty young woman's affection turned his way? In the end, no matter how many peoples he conquers, or how many prisoners he sacrifices to the sun, a high minko ends his crumbling bones. No matter how ripe a woman's body, or the bliss a man feels while shooting his seed into her young loins, in the end, there is only age, infirmity, and fading memories extinguished by the darkening mantle of death. I am not here to ask anything of you, I replied warily. And then I knew her. You are old woman who never dies. First woman, she agreed. Very good, Black Shell. For a man who claims to have never really believed, you almost seem comfortable in my presence. I'm dreaming. And what is a dream? Real? Or just a fantasy of the souls? I don't know. You are not alone. Then she raised a thin arm. Come, eat. We shall talk and then you shall rest. My daughter is here. She has always had a fondness for great men. Me? Great. She paused, halfway to the door, and shot another of those depthless looks my way. I felt blackness expanding, wavering, and fading as she said, That remains to be seen, doesn't it? A sudden anxiety, a weightless and falling sensation in the gut, filled me as I ducked inside. I swallowed hard, aware of a terrible hunger, literally an ache in my gut. Despite the gnawing desire for food, I looked around, seeing only the most rudimentary of furnishings. A simple pole bed had been built into the back wall, and there a woman reclined on elk hides. She raised herself on one arm, her full breasts like gleaming melons. I tried to ignore the way her hard brown nipples thrust up as if an invitation. Hair the color of raven wings fell in thick waves over her shoulders and matched her luminous eyes. She'd belted a short fawn-hide skirt at her thin waist that seemed molded around her hips and flat abdomen and emphasized her long and tanned legs. Only Pearl Hand had ever reeked of such blatant sexuality. I nodded politely, about to introduce myself, when First Woman gestured to the single mat that lay on the packed dirt floor before the fire. Sit, she cackled, a dark glow behind her eternal eyes. I can feel your hunger, Black Shell. Eat, and listen while I talk. I lowered myself to the mat, seeing the large ceramic pot that rested in a glowing bed of red coals. First woman used a cup to scoop hominy and bean gruel from the pot. Her hand trembled as she handed it to me. Our fingers touched for the briefest instant, and I felt dizzy. The sensation was as if a great gale blew through my belly, sucking my souls into separate whirlwinds. Quickly it passed, and I raised the delicious-smelling cup to my lips. Flavored with licorice root, sassafras, bumblebee honey, and mint, the hominy filled my mouth, sending a wondrous euphoria through my starving body. Though I ate and ate, the cup never emptied. The Christianos have come 
first woman said softly. But the people do not understand. They see only the glorious metals, the great caballos with terrifying riders, and the fine fabrics dyed in so many colors. To be a high chief, lord of a nation, is to covet the Christiano's wealth and strength. Our peoples are fools, black shell. The chiefs know only lust and greed, and would see it fall to them as allies of the Christianos. Between sips of the delightful mash, I said, I know them differently, and reached up to finger the scab left by their hated collar. In our world, red and white power are balanced, she said, as if I'd never heard it before. Order and chaos, ebbing and flowing. Neither is superior, and both are necessary for the survival of a people. Give the red power dominion, and all is disorder. Give the white power preeminence, and stagnation results. It is the way Breathgiver made our world. Why do you tell me this? So that you can fully understand the Christiano world. To them, everything is either good or evil. The struggle for balance is inconceivable to them, Black Shell. They claim their god is good, but in his service commit only evil. Unlike our people, they live in hypocrisy, taking all in the name of their god and leaving only wreckage, disease, and death in their wake. Some among them seek to convert a person's souls to their ways. Do you know what our people call such men? Witches, I replied feeling a cold shiver go down my spine. Only a witch would seek to use another man's souls for his own purposes. To do that involved the use of magic symbols, chants, and powerful objects. They call it salvation. Among them, God can only be worshipped in one way. Any other is considered evil, no matter what the ultimate goal may be. She smiled. To them, I am evil. I shook my head. But you gave birth to first man and corn woman. I gestured to her daughter, who still reclined, watching me through oddly smoldering eyes. Your daughter, corn woman, brought corn and beans to the people and gave birth to the hero twins, Morning Star and the Orphan. They in turn fought the monsters from the beginning times, before that cannibal turkey, stone man, and terrible sorcerers made the earth unsafe for people and animals. She laughed harshly. To the Christianos, such things reek of heresy and devil worship. They think God created the earth in six days, but it grew evil. To make the world good again, he created a son, and men slew him on a wooden cross. The Christianos are the son's legacy to the world. Perhaps a divine irony. Her toothless smile gave her wrinkled face a crazy look for they have corrupted their own god. How do we fight them? By stealth and planning, Black Shell. Massed as they are now, no nation can stand against them, but through time and slow attrition, they can be brought low. This you must remember. Your way will be difficult, and people you would help can only be made into allies when they discover the true nature of the Christianos but they can be destroyed and driven away. A pause. For the time being. What do you mean for the time being? This battle for our world will take lifetimes. You can only fight for the present. There will be victories, and there will be defeats. In the end, it falls to people, not gods, to determine the ultimate victor. I thought about that remembering the weight of the Christiano collar that still clung to my neck in a hidden camp outside the Uzita lands. Christianos could be hunted, picked off one by one, and slowly weakened. The food you have just eaten will heal your souls of the Christiano sickness. Now you must rest for the cure to take effect. First woman pointed to where Corn Woman lounged on the bedding. My daughter has made a place for you. I set the cup aside and stood feeling oddly weary. I nodded and walked over to the pole bed. Corn Woman smiled up at me, sliding to the rear and making room for me. I seated myself, and she reached up, 
her cool hands stroking my hot skin. Then I watched in amazement as she peeled the shirt from her hips and guided my hand into the spring-like tangle of her pubic hair. Her nimble fingers untied the breechcloth from around my waist, pulling it from my hips. I glanced over just in time to see First Woman waddle to the door on her age-bent legs. She paused as she pulled the hanging aside and glanced back, eternity in her eyes. Then she was gone. What are you doing? I asked Corn Woman as she pulled me onto her soft body. I stared down into her dark eyes as she smiled, spread her legs, and wrapped them around me. The sensation of her full breasts against my chest sent a thrill coursing through my tense body. Her cool fingers tightened around my straining shaft and guided me inside of her. She sighed as I entered, her hips rising to meet mine. In a moment of eternal clarity, I stared at her euphoric expression, knowing it matched my own. Time began to stretch and flow, our bodies moving together, an endless floating dance. As the tingle built beneath my thrusting shaft, she tightened, arched, and waves of ecstasy rolled through us, shared as if from a single body, but with intensity unlike anything I'd ever known. Her soft cries added to the moment, my soul's pulsing and exploding in response. I remember lying, spent atop her, cushioned by her soft body. Her black hair spread over the hides, wavering as if teased by a hidden breeze. For a time I floated and felt her shift and slide from beneath me. Rolling onto my side, I watched her stand, refasten her skirt about her hips, and walk gracefully to the door. Sleep, however, did not come. I thought about my conversation with First Woman, and how in the beginning times Corn Woman had come to the people. It was said that during her moon, menstrual blood had leaked from her sheath, spotting the ground, that she had scooped it up with the dirt and carefully placed it in a pot. Then, ten months later, she had looked inside to discover the orphan as a baby boy. According to the story, she had raised him, taught him to hunt, and fed him corn and beans, though she would never tell him where they came from. Finally, one day, the orphan had lied about going hunting, sneaking back to peek through a crack in the wall. He'd seen Corn Woman straddling a dish. With a comb, she had scratched her right thigh, and corn had trickled down out of her sheath. Then she scratched her left thigh, and beans had cascaded out of her. Discovering Orphan's deceit, she had driven him away and sent him in search of other people. When he returned, three moons later, the clearing where she lived was filled with corn and beans, but Corn Woman had never been seen again. And now she had taken me to her bed. So who does that make me? It was a terrible and important question, one that would plague me forever. In a rush, I leaped to my feet, retied my breechcloth, and bolted for the door. Outside, I turned, looking around the clearing. First woman was nowhere to be seen, but off to the side, I noticed a tall green corn plant rising above the grass. Surely I could not have missed it when I had arrived. Walking over, I found the soil turned, and in the middle of it stood the corn plant. For a moment, I couldn't identify the form at the plant's base. An old woman lay on her back, arms and legs spread wide. Her aged skin was wrinkled, scabbed with old wounds. Both breasts sagged flat on her chest. My mouth dropped open, and I staggered to a stop, gasping. From deep in her sheath, the base of the stalk cupped by her vulva, the corn plant rose high, leaves drinking in the sunlight, full ears topped by fine brown silk. Corn woman's eyes met mine, and she opened a toothless pink mouth to laugh and laugh. Chapter 12 I jerked awake, every nerve in my body electric and afraid. A body moved against mine, and I froze, fearful I would open my eyes to corn woman's. Instead, it was Pearl Hand whose face rested opposite mine. Welcome back, she whispered, 
and I was aware of her slim brown arm resting on my shoulder. I lay on my side, facing her. The cold awkwardness of the collar and thick metal links bound me to the real world. Beyond Pearl Hand, the familiar clearing could be seen in the moonlight. Was it a pleasant dream? I shifted, my racing heart beginning to slow. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Pearl Hand grinned, teeth flashing in the moonlight. I might. It was a delightful experience. What? What? I stuttered in confusion. She gave a slight shrug. You were cold when I snuggled against you. She reached down, cool fingers wrapping around my shaft. Well, it was too good an opportunity to waste, even if you slept right through it. I drew a deep breath of cool night air into my hot lungs. That was you? I hope you didn't think it was some other woman. I swallowed dryly. Gods, would I always be thirsty? Corn woman, I whispered softly. I was with corn woman. Old woman who never dies offered me her daughter after she fed me, and we discussed the Christianos and how to beat them. Corn woman? Pearl Hand raised herself on one elbow, studying me in the darkness, as if to read the truth in my souls. You mean the corn woman? From the beginning times? Her. I sagged, body and souls drained. But my body was here, with you? Thoughts were reeling in my head. I don't know what's real and what's dream anymore. It's the fever, she told me as she rearranged the blanket over us. But if you can couple like that while dreaming of her, go ahead. I don't think I've ever felt such a delight. It rolled from my hips through my entire body, and it seemed to last half the night. Parts of the dream were still replaying in my souls. At the memory of the endless hominy cup, my belly nodded with hunger. In the dream, I ate and ate. It was so wonderful. You should be half-starved, she crawled out from under the blanket, her naked body silvered by moonlight. There's some fish, and I found cattail roots. They've been baking in the coals. Let me get you some. Then maybe you could dream of corn woman again and drive me half out of my body like you just did. Food would be good, I agreed. But if you find any green shoots growing down there, I swear, I'm through forever with coupling. The fever, it seems, had broken with the dream of first woman, as if the soul food she fed me had indeed cured me. But for the next four days, I was weaker than a sick puppy. Fetch took it as an opportunity for an endless, if uninspired, game of stick. Pearl Hand, bless her, went about hunting, fishing, and collecting, doing nothing but tending to my needs. I watched her go about her duties, never complaining. When I wondered, had there ever been a woman like this one? For hands of time, I needed do no more than toss Fetch's perpetually returning stick and watch her move about the camp. What are you doing? she asked once apparently nervous under my relentless stare. I'm looking at you. She suddenly went self-conscious, pulling her hair around, checking it for sticks or leaves, then inspecting her front, as if something might have dribbled on her cloth dress. I laughed. No, nothing's wrong. Just like to watch you. It pleases me and, well, it leaves me in wonder. How? She gave me a suspicious look because you fill my souls with joy I never knew a man could have. You are the most beautiful and wondrous woman to ever delight a man's life. Are you fevered again? Oh, yes. All it takes is your smile or the slightest touch, and I'm all dreamy inside. She smiled at that. You'd think you were in love. In a voice laced with seriousness, I answered, Very much so. I would have you forever. She hesitated. As a wife? If you will have me, yes. She walked over then, taking my hand. Are you serious, Chikasa? You know who I am, what I've been. Among your people I'd be... Forget about my people. Not one of their high-born, clan-bred dainties is worthy so much as to wipe your feet. I squeezed her hand. I've been a man long enough to know the difference, Pearl Hand. You are a woman worthy of far better than me.
I wouldn't trade you for all the high Minko's nieces in Chikasa, or anywhere else, for that matter. She searched my eyes for a moment, reading my souls. You've been chosen by power, Black Shell. It frightens me, knowing that terrible times are coming. I can't see our future, but I know it's filled with blood and sorrow. I nodded slightly, aware of the collar chafing my neck. Things are happening to me, things I don't understand yet. But it's not just me, it's you too. We're fighting for our world, our peoples, all of them. I would do that with you at my side. At her hesitation, I added, but not if you would prefer another. No, she shook her head. That's not what worries me. It's that... Yes? I don't want to lose you. I lifted her hand to my lips. Nor are you. But together? Well, it makes sense that power would choose us. You know the Christianos, speak their language, and can pass among them. Who better than us, exiles versed in the ways of so many peoples, to find and use their weaknesses against them? She considered that, glancing down at the Cristiano knife lashed to the belt at her side. Thinking about the man she'd coupled with and killed to save me, no doubt. Cristiano blood was already on her hands. She met my gaze, nodding slightly. I will be your wife. And I will be your husband. No family or clan was present to witness our joining. No great feasts, exchanges of gifts, races or games marked the unification of our lives. But it was accomplished with a strength of purpose not even a high Minko could command. We left that little camp four days later, loading the dogs and packs into the canoe and paddling out from the rise in the mangroves. We paddled up the mouth of the Makoso River just after dark, lest any of Chief Makoso's people spot us. But the village, several bow shots up from the landing, was dark and looked abandoned. The Christianos, we learned later, had taken every man, woman, and child capable of bearing burdens and marched them inland. In crossing the river, the Christianos had built two substantial bridges, and the passing of their army left a beaten trail for us to follow. The soil, even after this many days, was stippled with caballo and puerco tracks, and the vegetation to either side was beaten flat. I stood there, looking down the churned route taken by the Cristianos. We need to be very careful. They may be days ahead of us, but we'd be foolish to take chances. At the first sound, even if it's ever so faint, she said, we've got to get off the trail. No matter what, we both have to keep the dogs quiet. I met her sober gaze. This might surprise you, but I don't want to see another one up close. So you do learn, she said scornfully, but there was a twinkle in her dark eyes. By morning I was exhausted, having used up all of my frail reserves on the trail. That and the weight of the metal links dragged the collar down and pulled the skin raw on my neck. With each step the metal links clanked and swayed until I wrapped them like a perverted necklace to hang down over my chest. I was staggering by the time we found a deer trail that led off into the scrubby brush. Under a stand of pines, we made camp, fed the dogs what little we had, and ate dried fish. The next day, armed with a rock and several hardwood dowels whittled from branches, Pearl Hand began the task of driving the metal buttons out of my accursed collar. The work was tedious. My position cramped as I knelt beside a lightning-riven stump. By mid-afternoon, and tens of dowels later, the final button parted. The collar swung free of my neck. In celebration, I hugged Pearl Hand until her ribs almost cracked. The collar with its metal chain went into the packs. Somewhere it would bring good trade. Still, the chafed skin around my neck would take days to heal despite the ungent's pearl hand applied to my wound. Chapter 13 Three days later, I was walking in the lead, still trying to come to terms with what had happened to me. At night, sleep was plagued by nightmares, and I relived the horror of captivity. The dogs, the whips, all of it came back to replay among my wounded souls.
That day, as I led the way down a winding trail lined with tall grass, palmettos, and scrubby pines, I kept glancing down at my hands, legs, and feet. Am I still the same man? Or had the Christianos killed the old crafty black shell? Was I now nothing more than a walking husk? We hadn't made particularly good time, having stopped to hunt, collect roots, and rob nests of their eggs. More than anything, I seemed eternally hungry, but my strength was rapidly returning. I had taken up my trader's staff again, but the old confidence hadn't returned. I am afraid, and more than anything, I hated myself for it. In an instant, as if from thin air, two Christiana war dogs were growling and snapping, leaping at me. Terror seized me, and I cried out, leaping back, my arms rising to defend my throat and face. Black Shell! Pearl Hand called from behind, breaking the vision as surely as a bubble popped on a pond surface. What is it, a snake? I gasped for air, staring in disbelief at the empty trail where the dogs had been, so clear and memorable. Nothing, just a... No, nothing. I reached up and wiped a hand over my face desperate to control my breathing and heartbeat. Are you all right? She pushed up next to me, concern in her eyes. Images, just ghosts of memory. I gave her a searching look. Did they witch me? Cast some sorcerous spell on my souls? She pursed her lips, watching me carefully, then reached up to press on my scabbed neck with a finger. You will have a scar here. This one you will be able to see, the ones they left on your soul's black shell. Those you can only feel. I took a deep breath, drawing the muggy hot air into my lungs. What did they do to me? Why do I feel this way? You've always been a proud man. It's who you are, black shell of the Chikaza, born of the chief clan, bred to one day become high minko. No matter that you're exiled from your people. You've always had that to cling to. The Christianos changed that. How? They took away everything that you believed about yourself, robbed you of who you are. Nothing in our world could have prepared you for what they did. In our world, even enemies are someone. When prisoners are taken, even if they are tortured to death, it is to determine who they are. On the square, even the most despised enemies are tested for courage endurance, cowardice, or fear, and we identify them accordingly. We see the people, animals, and plants around us as beings with souls. Even rocks are treated with respect. Christianos are different, Black Shell. They committed the most terrible atrocity. They made you into nothing. Nothing. I felt my souls drop as if suddenly sick. Nothing she insisted. Don't you see? To them, you had no souls, no identity. You were simply a convenient thing to be used for labor, and completely meaningless to them. She arched an eyebrow. What greater crime is there than to make a person meaningless? Nothing. I bowed my head, nodding. Blood and pus. She had figured it out. So what do I do? Decide who you are, Black Shell. You have a unique opportunity to do what few people ever can. Think of it. You have been Black Shell of the Chikaza, both before and after you left your people. Spirit power has spoken to you. The Christianos then took everything from you and left you empty, sick, and dying. But power carried my souls to the spirit world. Perhaps because you were dying, your souls were prepared. Power has chosen you, Black Shell. You have a choice to make. I frowned, trying to see the why of it. It's your decision. We don't have to fight the Christianos. We can go away, just you and I. You know them now, know what they can do to you. Or I can follow the path that power has laid out for me. I gave her a sidelong glance. What if I do choose to run? She gave me a reassuring smile. I'll go wherever you lead. We'll make a life together. 
I glanced back to where the dogs had laid down in the trail. Squirm was rolling his shoulders, trying the pack bindings to see if he could wiggle out from under the weight. I exhaled and said, It's so tempting. I'm afraid, Pearl Hand. Scared like I never have been. But that's the thing. If I give in now, surrender to the fear, it will never stop. I reached out and laid my hand on her shoulder. You understand that, don't you? If we don't go after them, fight them, they'll have won. It means I will have died in their chains, no matter how long this body lives. I watched her smile widen, warmth growing behind her eyes. Yes, you are still the man I fell in love with. But you have gone with me if I had chosen to run? She shrugged, taking the lead and gesturing the dogs to their feet. For a while, at least until I learned if they'd really broken you for good. She paused, then added, One thing I've learned, husband. I need a man in my life. A real man. One who earns and deserves my respect. I followed along behind her, emotions churning. Breath and thorns, yes, I was scared. Memories of captivity kept chewing at my courage, and fear lingered like webs at the margins of my souls. Then I needed only glance at Pearl Hand's back, her provocative hips swaying with each step. She'll never be a coward's woman, and you know it. I grinned to myself, contemplating that she was right. I could choose as few men had ever been able to. Power had taken my souls to the edge of the earth, to the underworld, and Cornwoman's bed. I'd married the most desirable woman in the world so long as I was worthy of her. What challenge was a terrible Christiano army compared to that? The following morning was hot, muggy, and sunny. We followed a trail off to the side of the main Christiano route. The sky above was a dull blue, fading to white at the horizons. Not even a breath of breeze could be felt. The leaves hung as though limp in the heat. Perhaps half a bow shot ahead, three men and two women came trotting around a bend. They drew up in sudden fear. As they started to bolt back the way they had come, I cried out, Wait! We come under the power of trade! I lifted my staff high. For several heartbeats they hesitated talking among themselves. In Timakua, one man called. Who are you? As if a man, woman, and five pack dogs were a hostile raiding force. I am Pearl Hand, my wife called, and this is the trader, Black Shell. We mean you no harm. I walked easily forward, motioning the dogs back to decrease the threat. The man who spoke stepped forward hesitantly. He was dressed in a breechcloth, carrying a short hunting bow. Scars covered the man's left arm as if it had been mauled by an alligator. His hair was greasy, unkempt, and littered with twigs and leaves. You should be careful. Christianos are all around the country. We ourselves are fleeing from them. The other two men were easing back, a half-step at a time. The expression in their round faces stated better than words that they'd bolt up the trail like rabbits at first sign of trouble. The older of the bare-breasted women noticed and gave them both a sour look. We would learn of them, I said easily, walking up to the man. How are you called? Most know me by the name of Sunfish. These others are of Tuloon Village, he pointed to the two women, ignoring the men, now a good ten paces back. The women stood uncertainly, both of them shooting worried glances our way. The Christianos were there four days ago. We survived by luck, I nodded. May your ancestors bless you, and may luck continue to walk with you. If you head south, there are more Christianos around Usita. Not all have gone ahead. Thank you, the man glanced uneasily at his comrades. We'll keep to the east, but try not to blunder into Iraparakoki's lands. He might think we'd make good slaves, too. The Christianos didn't go there, Pearlhand asked, curious. Some did but after several days they were recalled to join the main body. They gave Iraparakoki many wonderful things, wondrous beads, metal chisels, mirrors, and metal pots. In return they took many of Iraparakoki's people with them. He ordered his Aniha to take several hundred and serve the Christianos. The poor fools, 
No sooner did they arrive than they were locked in collars and turned into slaves. He looked suspiciously at the pack dogs, and then us. You follow the Cristiano's trail? On purpose? I nodded. They made me a slave for a while. Somehow we will pay them back. Sunfish shook his head, obviously finding the notion ridiculous. They won't be that hard to catch. They have taken local guides. The Cristianos don't know it, but they have been led into the swamps off to the west. Why not the trail to the east? Pearlhand asked. With caballos, the travel would be much easier. They know nothing of the country. Some of the ones who have escaped told us that a man named Mortis translates for them. He speaks only a couple of the languages. So he asks someone who asks someone who asks someone who knows, but then the answer goes back through all those people. Besides, I think the guides figure that if they lead the Christianos into the swamp, there might be an opportunity to escape. Good thinking, I agreed and glanced at Pearl Hand. She, too, seemed to be mulling the idea. So, if we would avoid the swamp, where should we go? The trail forks just north of Bisela village. The western trail runs straight to Decaste, where the Christianos have made camp. Bear off to the east. After crossing three creeks, you will see an old burned farmstead with a trail leading into the oaks. Take that one. If you do not, you'll be in Iraparacoki's lands. We would avoid that, I agreed. Do the Christianos march unopposed? They do not, Sunfish said with a smile. There are constant raids. Several soldiers and a couple of horses have been killed. But any time masked warriors try and attack them, the result is a disaster. Few of those who flee survive. Horror shadowed his face. They have terrible dogs. Does anyone know where the Christianos are headed? Pearlhan asked. Sunfish shrugged. Given their direction, probably Okale. They seem to travel from village to village. At each one they take all the food, spend the night, and march to the next one. Anyone who is asked will tell them that Okale has more stored food than any place. Before you go, I bent down and took a couple of pieces of shell from Bark's pack. This is in trade for your information. We thank you, Sunfish said as he fingered the shells. May the ancestors bless you and keep you safe. And you. We watched them hurry past and disappear down the trail. So, do we try to beat them to Okale? I wondered. Then I remembered that trade didn't go so well the last time I was there. That pesky business about the Holada believing I was a Potano spy. How do we know? Pearlhand asked. Power has just chosen us to fight. It hasn't bothered to tell us how to do it. Which, when I thought about it, set my nerves on end. DeSoto was up there, ahead of us somewhere with his metal-clad army. And Pearl Hand and I were supposed to stop him? The land Pearl Hand and I were marching into, meaning the central peninsula, was thickly populated. Villages tended to be a day's march apart, which, when you think about it, makes sense. People could extensively exploit the root grounds, hunting areas, and fisheries within a half-day's walk in any direction. They knew them inside out and didn't have to infringe on anyone else's territory. The hunting party could still make it home by night. Village sizes tended to reflect the quality and quantity of food resources available. The country wasn't especially rich, considering that the people mostly relied on wild game, fish and turtle traps, clam beds, and, one of the regional favorites, snails. Most villages had huge trash mounds where generations had tossed the shells after extracting the clams and snails. They made a stew of snails that I'm not particularly fond of, but the locals like it. Waterfowl contribute to a large part of the diet, especially in winter when the ducks, geese, herons, and other birds migrate south. The killing of a deer, raccoon, or brace of rabbits is considered a delicacy. Hunting pressure has exterminated the bison, and it is the lucky animal that can pick its way down from the north without ending up in a deep pit roasting oven. For our part, we skirted the little villages of Guacozo and Luca, both of which were nothing more than tossed wrecks, looted clean by the Cristianos. It made for creative traveling, since the trails all radiate out from town centers. Following deer paths is a tricky business. A well-worn trail tends to evaporate the further along it one travels. 
Two days later, north of Vicela Village, we found the trail Sunfish had mentioned. Just after the second creek crossing, we encountered a body lying in the middle of the trail. Even as we approached, the telltale round imprints of caballos could be seen in the sandy soil. The animals had circled a young man who lay face down. In the center of his back was a gruesome wound already crawling with flies. Beside him were the marks of boot heels where a rider had dismounted and pulled something from the middle of the man's back. I'd seen the crossbows during my captivity, but hadn't been able to convince myself they were any improvement over a normal bow. Imagine a short bow fixed crosswise on a handle that acts like an extension of the arm. The butt of it is placed in the shoulder, and the short arrow is aimed. A little lever releases the string lock, propelling the stubby arrow at great velocity. Nor did I understand the fire sticks the Cristianos carried. The weapon reminded me of the blowguns used by the forest hunters in the north. My people made blowguns from sections of cane, and they were excellent for hunting squirrels and small birds. Cristianos hunted men with theirs. The tube is made from metal, which is cradled in a wooden mount. To shoot it, a section of smoldering cord was touched to the powder, which, like a blowgun hunter's breath, expelled a lead ball faster than the eye could see. Smoke and fire erupted along with a crack like thunder. The body before us had the classic signs of an arrow wound. I'd seen more than enough to know. From the tracks, it was easy to read the victim's last movements. He'd been running, the caballos charging down behind him. Unlike the time when I'd been in a similar situation, they hadn't just knocked him down for a prisoner. Instead, they had ridden close and shot him in the back. Under the hoofprints, the soil marked where he'd fallen and slid. What do you think? Pearlhand asked as I bent over the body and shooed the dogs away. They were sniffing unsurely, wary at the scent of death. I'm picking a crossbow arrow, I replied, looking into the wound. Something was pulled out. Here you can see the boot heel imprints where the Cristiano leaned back as he pulled. Some of the tissue came with the shaft. Then the Cristiano remounted, and the caballos turned around and headed back from whence they'd come. How long? Pearlhand asked, indicating the body. I grabbed an ankle and lifted, feeling the stiff joint. Maybe this morning? She glanced worriedly up the trail. Well, we're warned. They're close. I nodded stood, and withdrew my bow and a couple of hunting arrows before slipping the trader's staff into the alligator hide case behind my chunky lances. From here on, we'd better show more care. Travel at night, she suggested. It would be safer. I glanced around the unfamiliar countryside. But I think we'd spend so much time being lost and backtracking that it wouldn't be worth our time, let alone the possibility of stepping on a water moccasin in the dark. We proceeded slowly, taking our time, listening, keeping an eye on the trees, searching for any sign of Christianos. Our ears sought any hint of clinking metal. Even the dogs seemed more alert. After crossing the third creek, we almost missed the burned farmstead. Honeysuckle had reclaimed all but two charred roof supports that protruded through the greenery. For half a day we followed the trail northeast only to have it end in a palmetto thicket, beyond which was a marshy swamp filled with lotus, cattails, and reeds. Several pairs of alligator eyes were watching us from the water, and given the size of them, wading didn't seem an option. We backtracked and located a trail running north through stands of oak, poisonwood, and palmetto, the hammocks dotted with pines. This, too, ended at water, but here, pulled up in the palmettos, were three small dugout canoes, paddles resting beneath the inverted hulls. From the bank I could see another landing across the way. Borrowing the largest of the vessels, we loaded the dogs and crossed in a hand's time. Turning the canoe over, we placed the paddles beneath and continued. We hadn't made it three bow shots into the trees before a young man rose from the palmettos, an arrow at full draw in his bow. I looked into his eyes, reading terror and desperation. Only thin air lay between the bone-pointed arrow and my frantically beating heart.
Chapter 14 Wait, I cried, holding up my bow. We travel under the power of trade. Gods, I hope he spoke Timakua. At the same time, I was signing like a madman, the bow making my hands awkward. I peered into the young warrior's hard eyes, saw him hesitate, and then lower his weapon. The arrow remained drawn, but no longer pointed at my chest. I am Black Shell, I said reasonably. A traitor. The one who took Iraparakoki's woman? he asked in accented Timakua. I'm the woman, Pearl Hand gave him a respectful smile. News of Iraparakoki's loss seems to have traveled. The youth shrugged, as if it were no matter. There were other concerns than Iraparakoki's skill with a bow. You've heard of the Christianos? We're trying to avoid them, I replied, motioning the dogs to rest. They have taken Tokaste town, and our chief. No one knows what to do. We are guarding all of our trails. I thought about killing you as you landed, but decided that first I'd see how you acted. Thank you for replacing our canoe, even if it's on the wrong side of the crossing now. We only wish to cross. We thank the owner for the use of his vessel, and would offer trade and compensation. I hope that sounded reasonable. The youth nodded, then glanced worriedly back at the crossing. I should get back to my post. The Christianos could come at any time. He pointed up the trail. Turtletown is that way, less than two hands' journey. Tell them that Muskrat sent you. But expect no grand feasts, trader. Many have been killed or captured. A number of the clan leaders are taken hostage. The healers have wounded to care for. We understand, Muskrat, and thank you. He hesitated, then asked, The Christianos, I mean, the stories people tell about them, are they true? Worse than you've heard, Pearl Hand said softly. So much worse. His expression pinched with concern. Then he nodded sadly before hurrying down the trail to guard the crossing. Turtletown occupied an elevated sandy ridge surrounded by small gardens of corn, squash, and beans that had been cleared of trees and brush. A rickety-looking palisade surrounded a collection of houses, a small plaza, and a mound topped by a thatch-roofed charnel house. The chief's house was the largest structure, open-sided and thickly thatched. Four young warriors, little more than boys, actually, came charging out of the gate, bows at the ready. I lifted my arms, calling, We are traders and come in peace under the power of trade. Muskrat has sent us. The boys trotted to a stop, looking us over warily. Squirm started to growl, and I gestured him to silence. An old man appeared in the gate behind the boys and called, Enter, traders, and be welcome, such as it is. Then he spoke to the boys, who reluctantly lowered their bows. I am Black Shell of the Chikaza. It sounded good to believe it again. And this is my wife, Pearl Hand, of the Chikora. Greetings, he bowed slightly. Gray had filled the hair on his head, his weathered face a leather of wrinkles and scars. Faded tattoos covered his cheeks and forehead, and his shoulders had been painted black with charcoal. I am old man crawfish these days, head elder of the Muscle Shell Clan. Come, our chief and many of our council are not here. Muskrat told us the Christianos have them. Crawfish nodded. For the moment, we've been spared. Our scouts tell us the Christianos are headed north into the swamp. May the fools all drown in the attempt. He sighed. It seems we can't be rid of them any other way. We have heard there's been fighting. He nodded again. Much to our regret, seven are dead. More are wounded. The healer is doing his best in the chief's house. Pearl Hand said, We have some medicine plants. Crawfish gave her a wistful look. Alas, there is not much we can trade. At the order of our chief, Holata Karamaba, most of the food, jars, and pots were sent to Tokaste. The men and women who bore them have been made slaves. Well, but for a few who escaped with their lives. Others were run down like fleeing rabbits. They have terrible hunting dogs. And what they do to a person. I've seen, I said bitterly. And you are a lucky man, traitor. They didn't get you. 
Or does the power of trade protect you? They spit on the power of trade. In that case, the spirits of the ancestors will grow so incensed they will destroy them. I held my tongue, thinking that only a seasoned army of Muscogee warriors might do the trick. Most of the people we saw were either the very young or elders. At the chief's house, I bade the dogs to lie down and unlace the pack containing dried gumweed, tobacco, and mint leaves. I also took out some coneflower petals and pine resins. Brewed into tea, it was the best I could do for their wounded. The healer was called Spotted Wing, an old woman past her bearing years. She nodded as Crawfish introduced us and listened as he spoke in a language I didn't understand. Evidently, not all the residents understood Timakua. Spotted Wing led us under the roof to where two men and a woman lay on cattail matting. First came the stench, then I got a really good look at what a metal sword could do to a human body. The woman had taken a cut across the thigh. The wound gaped like a great smile. Only the bone had stopped the blade from slicing clear through. The great artery, fortunately or not, hadn't been severed. We left it open, Crawfish said upon seeing my horror. We tried sewing up Batfish's arm, he pointed to one of the men. The flesh on his upper arm stitched closed like a leather flap. Streams of yellow pus were leaking out along the length of the wound. His hideously swollen arm was blackened, greenish, and mottled-looking. Fever burned beads of sweat out of his skin, and his eyes were rolled back into his head. They should have cut his throat, Prohan said in Muskogee. It would have been kinder. I turned my attention to the third man. A thick poultice had been applied to his belly, but from the smell of it, I knew his guts were punctured. Crawfish turned pleading eyes on ours. Do you have something that would heal them? Perhaps a medicine in your packs? I shook my head. Nothing for wounds as festered as these. I'm sorry. But a tea made from the things I have brought would help. Crawfish gratefully took what I offered. I walked back, stepping into the sunlight, pearl hand following. Outside, I drew deeply of the sweet air. You look terrible, she noted. Arrow wounds are bad enough, those people in there, the flayed open like fish under an obsidian blade. She glanced sidelong at me. Seeing those people, are you still sure you want to pursue the Christianos? I considered that as I glanced around the subdued village. People were watching us discreetly. Up on the high mound, I could see the charnel house. It soon would have at least three new additions to the number of rotting bodies tended by the priests. Haven't we had this discussion already? Her beautiful face had taken on a sad expression. Would it be so bad just going somewhere out of the way, just the two of us? Changing your mind? Seeing what's in that house? Well, it sobers the souls. It does indeed. But that day on the trail when you told me to choose... I did. And it was the right choice. The dream visions I've had. I mean, I've gone places in spirit form, seen the seeing hand at the end of the earth and stared into the west wind's eyes. I've traveled to the underworld. I owe something to Water Panther. I've eaten in First Woman's house. With a barbed remark, she interrupted, not to mention driven your peg into Corn Woman. I ignored her. They all say I've been chosen by Horn's Serpent for something, and whatever it is, it involves the Christianos. I paused, thinking back, replaying images of the dreams. This is a war, Pearl Hand. We have been chosen to fight. But like her, more than anything, I wished I could just turn tail and run. Maybe find a place to spend the rest of my days enjoying the sunshine and rain, lingering in Pearl Hand's arms and growing old beside her. You'd spend the rest of your life despising yourself. Crawfish assigned Pearl Hand and me to an unoccupied house for the night. While the people did their best for us, the evening feast was a somber affair, consisting of fish, boiled snails, freshwater mussels, and palm berries. Throughout, people constantly glanced back at the chief's house, from which low groans could be heard. Muskrat arrived just after dark and went into council with several of the other boys. 
Later, he came ambling over to where Pearl Hand and I sat on the matting of our open-sided house, tossing a deer-hide ball for fetch. The rest of the dogs chased after him, trying to steal it. Frustrated at never getting the ball, Bark dropped on his butt, gave me a forlorn look, and began arf arfing in mournful tones. Pearl Hand called him over and ruffled his ears, as much to shut him up as to comfort him. That brought Gnaw, his white-tipped tail, slashing the gloom. Muskrat squatted on his haunches off to our left and scratched behind Gnaw's ear. The dog loved it. Fetch spit the soggy ball at our feet, ears pricked, ready for another chase. I propped a foot on it to keep Squirm from grabbing it away. No sign of the Christianos, I asked. He gave a shrug. A runner came just before dark. They're off to the north. The fools are trying to wade across the swamps. Sometimes they're in water up to their necks. Several of the caballos have stuck in the mud and drowned in their panic. He looked wistfully up at the cloudy night sky. Lightning flickered in the distance. If we had all of Iraparacoki's warriors, we could paddle up in canoes and kill them one by one. And if turtles could fly, they'd snap all the mosquitoes out of the sky, I reminded. But they can't, so we're plagued. I'm headed north in the morning, Muskrat said softly, poking a finger at the charcoal-stained earth beside Gnaw. Taking a canoe to keep an eye on them in case they turn back south. If I had two more people to paddle, well, I'd drop you on the east side at a good trailhead. I glanced at Pearl Hand. She shrugged. Very well, Muskrat, we will accompany you. Besides, I would see the Christianos wading up to their necks. Anything to enjoy their suffering for once. And this would be an opportunity to observe their order of march without having to worry about riders chasing us down. You sure this is a good idea? Pearl Hand asked after we'd retired to our bed. I'm not sure I ever have a good idea anymore. But if the Christianos are floundering in the swamps, maybe we'll learn something we can put to use. You're an idiot, you know. Yes, and fortunately for me, you love idiots. The next morning, just before dawn, we loaded packs and dogs into the large dugout canoe Muskrat had procured. I could tell by his actions that he wasn't overjoyed at the scouting task his people had ordered him to undertake. Myself? I was preoccupied with the dreams I'd had during the night. In them, Water Panther prowled the depths just below our canoe. All the while, he contemplated the notion of switching his tail and dumping us in the swamps. As we were preparing to push off, voices rose in song, the melody solemn. We looked back just able to make out the shapes of people emerging from the chief's house. They carried a body borne on a litter. My cousin, Muskrat said sadly. He died in the night. Relatives are carrying him to the charnel house. Shouldn't you be there? Pearl Hand asked. He gave her a flat, listless look. These are not normal times. We said no more as we loaded the dogs in packs, then pushed the canoe out into the calm waters. The three of us plied paddles to drive us through the bald cypress, tupelo, and water oak line passages that led north. Fetch perched himself in the bow, surveying the water ahead, as if he were a lord overlooking his domain. Insects buzzed and hummed over the water, while birds of all kinds sang in the trees or flitted across the surface in search of prey. And Hingas perched on cypress knees, watching with their beady brown eyes. I waved at them and wondered what they'd tell Water Panther and Snapping Turtle. And backwaters choked with duckweed and yellow lotus, alligators peered with unblinking eyes, and turtles sunned themselves on logs protruding from the murky water. Several manatees, like gray sentinels, paused in their feeding to watch us pass. From the sun, I gauged the time to be nearing midday. How Muskrat found his way through the endless maze of channels, islands, shallows, and passages was beyond me. Pearl Hand and I were sweating. As badly as my shoulders ached after several moons away from the paddle, I could tell Pearl Hand suffered even more. Fetch growled first, bark and squirm chiming in. Gnaw and Skipper's ears pricked, eyes alert. I hushed them with a single command. There, hear it? Muskrat asked from his position in the rear. We coasted on the water, and I noticed the dogs were fixed on the channel ahead. Faintly, my ears picked up a distant shout, then another. I snapped my fingers in rebuke as Fetch gave a low bark. 
Men, Pearlhand said as we dipped the paddles and eased forward again. I'll keep us toward the east side, Muskrat said. There is better cover in the channels, safer to keep out of sight. We proceeded for perhaps a hand of time, the shouts and occasional cries growing louder as we pursued a way through narrow channels, ducking strands of hanging moss. One of the caballos made that eerie braying they did when losing sight of companions. The sound came echoing over the water and sent a shiver down my spine. No barks, I hissed at the dogs, getting reluctant looks in return. Muskrat started us past a small island when Pearlhand raised an arm in warning. The island was a low thing, covered in sawgrass and brush. As we cleared the vegetation, I could see them, perhaps five bow shots distant across open water. The Cristianos were in a long line, perhaps waist-deep as they slogged through the shallows. They cursed and splashed along, ripples of water radiating from their passage. Each man bore his weapons in a pack on his back. It hit me they looked like ugly snails crossing the water. Even over the distance, I could tell their movements were labored, as if they were on the verge of exhaustion. Sunlight gleamed from the metal armor and helmets. After every ten men came a line of captives, their bodies bent under great packs perched high on their backs. Some labored under those ridiculous chairs, others, in teams, carried wooden tables, and two struggled to bear some sort of boxy thing that stood on four legs. My heart went out to the slaves, but as bad as my lot had been, I'd had solid footing for the most part. No straining of the ears was necessary to hear the clinking of the accursed chains. Like an obscene caterpillar, the line of humans sloshed and slogged through the watery muck. Why cross this mess? Pearlhand wondered. They needed but go further east and follow dry trails from town to town. This is madness. I propped my elbow on a knee and rested my chin as I studied the struggling men. A line of caballos came into sight, the animals tied together, led by a single man with a rope. The beasts, clearly unhappy, lurched and buck-jumped, muddy water sluicing from their hides. Because they don't know any better, I mused. And here is the advantage we can exploit. Just because they get lost and stumble into a swamp doesn't make them easy to defeat, Pearlhand countered. What do you have in mind, luring them into a marsh, then canoe up and shoot them down with arrows? That might have possibilities. Then I tried to put words to my thoughts. No, I was thinking more of their arrogance. I'm a traitor, and I know I'm ignorant when I enter a new country or meet a new people. Not knowing the customs, I beg forbearance for the mistakes I will make and ask politely about the manners, the country, the animals, and the trails. These Christianos, they don't think they have anything to learn from us. To them we're little more than insects. But here, watching them, it's plain to see that such arrogance carries the roots of their final defeat. She glanced at me, eyes thoughtful. You've never seen them fight. Their armor, weapons, and discipline allow a small number to defeat a huge body of warriors. She shook her head. To overwhelm them would take vast numbers of warriors, probably more than any coalition that could be put together. I haven't seen them fight, but I've seen what their weapons do to a man's body. And unlike them, I'm more than willing to take your word that to attack them head-on is suicide. Good, we'll live longer that way, she added grimly. We'd been talking in Muskogee. Muskrat asked what we'd been saying. I resettled myself, watching those miserable people out there in the water. We're trying to figure out how to defeat them. It's too bad we don't have a thousand Chikaza warriors in canoes to paddle up and kill the Christianos in deep water. He shrugged. Even then their armor might save them. I'm told one of my cousins shot one from right up close. His arrow hit center and stopped cold. The man he shot killed him with a thunder stick and paused only long enough to brush the arrow off as if it were a blunted thorn. The ones wearing the cloth, they have padding with metal plates sewn inside, and arrows glance off the metal body armor like hail off a rock. So we must shoot for their face or neck, I mused. That kind of accuracy was difficult in the heat of combat, when men were moving, ducking and weaving. I glanced at Muskrat's bow. It was nothing like mine, having a short and thin stave of local wood. In the peninsula, 
Bows were made for hunting the local small deer, rabbits, and the like. In the north, among the nations, bows were larger, stronger, with a tremendous pull, meant to drive solid wood-shafted arrows right through a wooden shield. The light cane arrows of the southern hunters didn't come close to matching the penetration. But against Cristiano armor? That I didn't know. We watched another group of Cristianos come into view. At first I couldn't understand what I was seeing, and then, to my astonishment, realized it was the Puerco swimming in a horde. Maybe this is a job for women, Prohan remarked. Lure them one by one into our beds and cut their throats. Cristianos have an ungoverned appetite when it comes to lying with women. I countered. Once they catch on, they won't take a woman to bed unless she's stripped naked. I paused. No, this must be fought over time, by wearing them down. I thought of their great floating palaces and how far they had come from their homes across the sea. They're heading inland, up the peninsula. Which means? Pearlhand asked. They are getting farther and farther from any resupply. Which left the question, just how far did the Christianos plan to travel? This ends Disc 5, Coming of the Storm, Disc 6. Chapter 15 Muskrat dropped us on the eastern edge of the swamps at a trailhead that took us inland onto higher ground. We bid him the best of luck in the future and turned our steps to the east. The dogs, chafing under their packs, followed along behind. We wound through scrubby palms, honeysuckle, and stands of live oak, the air perfumed with the scent of earth, spring flowers, and the damp must of vegetation. I watched a spiral of buzzards off to the north, wondering if the Christianos had dispatched yet another unlucky soul to bloat in the sun. That night we camped under a copse of live oaks. I cooked us a supper of smoked fish that we traded for at Turtle Town. As I scrubbed out the ceramic pot I'd used, Pearl Hand wore her arm out throwing Fetch's stick. She enjoyed the melee that followed as the other dogs tried to steal it. Afterward, I retrieved my pipe, loaded it with tobacco, and lit it from the fire. We sat side by side, backs to the trunk of an oak. I stared up at the gnarly branches as I exhaled a cloud of blue. Live oaks are wonderful, and I always see images in their intricately bent branches, sort of like how people see pictures in the stars. You've been preoccupied all day, Pearlhan remarked as I passed her the pipe. She drew and blew the smoke up at the hovering column of mosquitoes. The vicious little beasts remain stymied by our greased ungent. I'm trying to understand what's happened to me. Seeing the Christianos, realizing that my souls have traveled to the spirit world, and it's all starting to sink in. I took the pipe and drew the smoke in, letting Sister Tobacco ease my worry. No matter what, nothing will ever be the same again. No, she whispered. It won't. It's an eerie thing to be called by power. I've done what only the great dreamers have. Stood face to face with spirit beings. I paused as she took the pipe, then asked, Do you believe? In spirit power? She studied the pipe for a moment, her face pensive in the gloom. All peoples believe in something, some power, or ghosts, or gods. She handed the pipe back. I've just never been this close to it before. I was, once, and it cost me everything. I sighed. No one believed me. They thought I was lying to save myself. I paused and for a long time afterward I wasn't sure they weren't right. I gestured absently with the pipe. Oh, I've attended to the forms, offering food and thanks, participating in the rituals. But these spirit dreams, they were as real as I am, sitting here with you. She glanced at me. Why choose you? Why not some powerful priest or dreamer, someone who has studied the ways and forms of power? or perhaps a great sorcerer who can call the winds, lightning, and storm to destroy the Christianos. Like smacking an acorn with a hammer stone, she'd hit on the question that had been plaguing me. In the dreams I was told this is a fight among men, that we would decide. All right, 
But why leave it to people? Why can't horned serpent just dive out of the sky, snap off their wooden cross, and kill them all? I finger the pipe stem. Maybe because our power and the power of the Christianos is balanced. Somehow equal. Like red and white power. Perhaps the ultimate way of it will be determined by what men decide to believe. Or who can conquer the other? She gestured her futility. In that case, the Christianos win. It's early to be saying that. I've seen them fight, Black Shell. I might have been little, but it's nothing you are ever likely to forget. Outnumbered and surrounded, I watched them break and destroy a huge mass of Chikora warriors. I've never seen so many dead. The nightmare haunted my dreams for years. I shrugged, remembering how the Chikasa fought. I had no idea how good her Chikora would have been. As for the southern Timakua, they were part-time warriors who made war with puny arrows, as if it were an extension of a hunting party. Ten Chikasa would overwhelm fifty Timakua with no problem. Then I brought up another consideration that had come to roost like a buzzard between my souls. When power asks, a man simply can't walk away, not expect to enjoy a happy and healthy life. You, however, aren't bound. I glanced at her. The chances of me making it through this without— I'm with you. Why? You're deathly afraid of the Christianos. As if I wasn't. You've got everything to lose if they catch you. The way of this is going to be hard, dangerous, and will likely end in disaster for one or both of us. She patted my knee. Believe me, I know better than you do. Her grip on my knee tightened. Black shell. What if it were different? What if I'd had the spirit dreams and you were still free to go? What if I were the one chosen to fight the Christianos? I don't understand. What would you do? Take off and leave me to my fate? Go off somewhere to safety and live the rest of your life without a second thought? I sighed in resignation. I would rather take my chances enjoying every second I had, just to be with you. And there, my lover and husband, you have my answer. The following day, we immediately got lost. The trails along the edge of the swamp were a maze of deer traces. Deer usually move from food source to food source before scattering. By bearing east, we finally stumbled onto a main trail and headed north. Perhaps we traveled a hand's time through mixed grasses and trees when the dogs perked, ears forward, and low growls broke from their throats. I signaled for silence and motioned off to the side, leading the way as Pearl Hand followed me and the dogs into the myrtle and button bush. We crouched as the faint clink of metal and the occasional snuffling of a caballo could be heard. I was trying to muzzle the dogs, all of whom weren't cooperating with being silent. Metal clanged, and I thumped gnaw to keep him from barking. Through the brush, I could see the rider as his caballo, sweat-streaked and mud-caked, clumped up the trail. That foul caballo had either heard or scented us. It was on alert, looking this way and that, ears pricked. The Cristiano followed his mount's gaze, panicked eyes shifting to and fro. A metal helmet perched on his head, locks of dark hair hanging down just under the brim. Rust speckled his metal breastplate, and a crossbow rested across the pommel of his saddle. That's when Fetch couldn't stand it any more. He burst from where Pearl Hand was trying to hold him and charged, barking and snapping. Then the unexpected happened. The man jerked the crossbow up and took aim. I heard the twang of the release, and Fetch squealed, literally under the caballo's feet. The great animal began to buck and jump, its head down, back feet kicking high. The Cristiano stayed with the snorting beast until it tangled in the brush on the other side of the trail. Caballo and rider crashed down. The animal immediately scrambled to its feet and bolted off down the trail. I knocked an arrow and hurried forward. In the name of power, tell me Fetch is all right. The Cristiano jumped to his feet, looking dazed and bent down to retrieve his crossbow, but then stopped short, desperation filling his eyes as he stared straight down my arrow. Pearl Hand, I called. Are any more coming? I heard her emerge from behind me to stare down the trail. 
Not yet, but they don't like traveling alone. Then she asked something in the Cristiano language. The youth answered, frozen in his tracks. Then his expression softened, and he said something else. He says he's lost. Prohan's voice held an amused note. He's thankful he found friendly Cristiano indios who speak proper language. Alto, Pearlhan called as he lowered his crossbow and placed a foot in the round loop just under its front. Cristiano froze, panic returning to his eyes. How's Fetch? I asked, unwilling to lower my aim. She stepped over to Fetch, but I dared not take time to look. The Cristiano was watching me with fear, bright eyes. It isn't good, she said softly. I felt my heart sink and said to the Cristiano, Then I'm afraid it isn't good for you either, you hubakwatsu. An instant before I drove my arrow through his right eye, Pearlhand said, Wait, he'll have information we can use. I hesitated, desperate to lose my arrow. All of the abuse the Cristianos had heaped upon me came rolling back through my souls. I thought of how they'd worked men and women to death, then cut their heads off to free the collars, how the dogs had done their vicious work, and the misery of captivity. He read the tracks of my souls and swallowed dryly. Oh yes, I am your death. Pearlhand was chattering something harsh in Cristiano, and the young man nodded, dropping the crossbow and lifting his hands high. What did you say? I managed through gritted teeth. I told him you desperately wished to kill him, but that his life might be spared if he would answer a few questions. He has agreed. I kept my arrow ready as he stepped slowly forward. Staring into his brown eyes, I read the fear and savored it like a starving man does a fine elk roast. I backed a step as Pearl Hand made him kneel in the trail, and after pulling some braided leather straps from one of the packs, she tied his hands behind him. Only then did I release the tension and allow the arrow to ride forward. I bent to fetch and winced. The stubby Cristiano arrow had penetrated the length of his body. Blood was leaking out from Fetch's mouth and nose, his eyes gone glassy. And just that quickly, his souls fled. I knelt beside him, my fingers tracing softly along his head. Carefully, I smoothed the sleek brown hair on his muscular shoulders and straightened his flexed front leg. How many camps had we shared? How many frugal meals? How many lands had we traversed? I remembered the time a pack of Kusa dogs had jumped him, and how for days I nursed him back to health. In lonely camps, it had been Fetch who would sense my despair and approach with a stick, dropping it suggestively on my foot. I pray they have a great many sticks in the land of the dead, old friend. And then I bent and unstrapped the pack from his back. The arrow had driven through the upper corner of one side, and Fetch's blood soaked the soft tanned leather. The other dogs were standing off, sniffing, eyes wary as they glanced from Fetch to me, and then to the Cristiano, as though trying to understand. How could they, when I myself could not? Pearlhand walked over and picked up the crossbow. Then she pulled the bloody arrow out of the earth beneath Fetch's body. Putting her foot through the loop, she took several tries before muscling back the string and locking it. Then she settled the bloody arrow in the groove knocking it firmly. The Cristiano watched her, trickles of sweat running down his face, his mouth working as he whispered words I didn't recognize. What's he doing? I asked, eyes slitted, wishing only to reach over and strangle the life out of him. Praying to the Cristiano God. We have no golden cup here, I muttered, as I carefully picked up Fetch's body and carried it into the grass. I left him. His bloody nose pointed west, the path to the land of the dead. Beside his head I placed food and would have left water for the journey ahead, but not having a source close, this he'd have to find on his own. Then squatting beside him, I called to his souls. You were gone, old friend. Head west, to the edge of the world. There, after passing through a great forest, you will find the sheer cliff. Pay no attention to the west wind, but jump with all your might through the seeing hand. I know your heart, faithful friend, 
The guardians will read the measure of your souls and let you pass. There in the beyond, one day I will join you when all is finished here. Then, oh yes, we shall play fetch forever. I gave him one last pat and stood. Come on, Pearlhands called. There may be others coming. She had hung Fetch's pack around the Cristiano's neck. I took one last glance back at where my dog now rested and glared at the Cristiano, violent murder in my heart. Pearl Hand walked a couple of steps behind him, the crossbow aimed at the middle of his back. I called the rest of the pack and followed. They kept looking back, whining, then turning their questioning brown eyes to me for an explanation. No one could see the hot tears streaking down my cheeks. Chapter 16 Firelight illuminated our camp in the thicket of live oaks, while the screening of saw palmetto, thorny greenbrier, and poisonwood around the edges would ensure that no light could be seen from beyond. We didn't want reflection from the leaves. We kept the fire burning low. Pearl Hand and I used an ungent against the swarms of mosquitoes. Remembering my treatment at the hands of the Cristianos, let alone what this one had done to fetch, our captive didn't receive similar benefits. The vicious little beasts hovered over him in a humming column. I chewed the meat from a duck's thigh as I watched the Cristiano, periodically tossing a piece to the four dogs who watched me with intense stares. It only added to the sense of loss that Fetch wasn't there to share. Pearled Hand kept shooting me solicitous glances, knowing full well how Fetch's death affected me. She looked gorgeous in the firelight's golden glow, her long hair rippling down over her shoulder and curled around the curve of her bare breast. Her dark eyes softened as she met my gaze. For many, a dog is just a replaceable commodity and a source for an occasional meal. I'd been in villages where dogs are only kept to dispose of the trash, sound a warning in the event of an approaching enemy, and are easily replaceable from any local litter. Such doings, it seemed to me, reflected a poverty of the soul. As is accepted among Muskegian beliefs, I tossed what was left of the duck into the fire, thanking the bird for its gift of food. The rising smoke would carry the prayer to the animal's soul. Since the spirit dreams, I found myself adhering to the old ways with a newfound reverence. The duck gone, Squirm had paced over to look out at our back trail, waiting, watching. He shot me a glance, his white blaze contrasting to the shadows. Fetch isn't coming, I whispered and patted my leg, calling Squirm to lie beside me. Gnaw dropped his gray head on his paws, shooting questioning looks as only a dog can between Pearl Hand and myself. Always slow to pick up on a situation, Bark walked over to where Squirm had stood and waited expectantly, apparently sure that Fetch would be coming at any moment. I tried to ignore him and turned my attention to the Cristiano. The source of my current misery was staring raptly at Pearl Hand's breasts. Granted, all women had breasts, but the way he was ogling pearl hands would leave one to believe that Christiana women were somehow woefully and inadequately endowed. Does this piece of two-legged filth have a name? I asked. Pearl hands said something in Christiano, and he tore his gaze from her chest. Chin up, he stated, Antonio Luis y Gonzalez. He followed with a long explanation. Pearl hand translated, he lists a bunch of ancestors and says he comes from the same town as Adelantado de Soto. Should have stayed home, I muttered. Where are the Cristianos headed? After an exchange, Pearl Hand told me. He says that they wish to winter in Ocale, but there is only enough food for a couple of weeks. Several parties are scouring the countryside for other villages to loot. I considered that, giving the young man a narrowed-eyed stare. They'll have to head north. The Usachili might have enough resources, but the nearest great nation is Apalachee. Only High Minko Kafake has the surplus to feed such a large force. The other option is to head north into the interior. She spoke to Antonio, and I caught the word, Apalachee. See, si, came the response. Yes, 
Pearlhan told me, though I'd picked up on C during my captivity. What do they want? I asked. Why would they come here? What do they expect to get out of us? Land? Control? Pearlhan spoke softly, and Antonio rattled off a vigorous response. She said, They expect to get rich. They come in search of gold. Her mouth quirked, and there's something about saving our souls for their god. Gold? I shook my head. What could they want with gold? Pearlhan shrugged. They value it the way our people value copper. Tell him there's very little gold up north. Another exchange followed, and Pearl Hand replied, He assures me we are liars. They have heard of much gold in the north. Captives have told the Adelantado that all gold comes from the north. The Christianos have seen bits of it in the captured towns. Copper from the north, yes, I agreed. But most of the gold being traded around the peninsula comes from their wrecked ships along the shore. A few traders have tried carrying it up to the nations, but they can't make much from it. Pearl Hand gave me a wry smile. I think I understand where this is coming from. Imagine you're the Usita chief, and these vermin march into your town. What are you going to tell them? That there is no gold in the north? If you do, what would the Christianos do? Maybe burn your town in frustration, clap you into a collar, and perhaps even stay and take your lands? No, Black Shell. Better to tell them anything that will encourage them to leave just as soon as possible. Tempt them into the north, and just maybe the Kusa, the Akmolji, or the Apalachi will destroy them once and for all. That made sense. None of the fragmented chiefdoms in the peninsula could muster the kind of force necessary to destroy the Christianos. I don't understand this business of saving our souls. Pearlhand turned to the Christiano. He chatted on for some time, Pearlhand frowning often as he spoke. She finally turned to me. It sounds crazy, but apparently they think our souls are lost, somehow evil. They think we serve some evil spirit named El Diablo, and our souls will burn forever as a result. Brett Giver isn't evil, nor are the spirit beasts. When we die, our souls go to the edge of the earth, I thumped my chest. I've been there, stood on the edge of the cliff, and seen the jump through the seeing hand that leads to the path of the dead. She shrugged. Antonio says that the only way to save our souls is to accept his god. Who is his god? A Pearl Hand's question. Antonio started off again. Pearl Hand finally held up a slim hand to stop him. He says his god is the true god, and his religious society, called Catholicos, and its leader, is the only way to god. Anything else is, she made a face, del diablo. I frowned, rubbing gnaw behind the ear. What does he believe, that we're all witches? I listened to them discuss this. That's what he believes, Pearlhand replied. He says we are all pardido, lost. Only by accepting his god will our souls live forever. Ask him if all the Christianos have accepted this god. At Antonio's insistent response, Pearlhand told me, He says the Christianos are his god's warriors, and that they carry the true cross. By what they do here, they will all go to Paraiso, which is a wonderful afterlife full of holy people who sing, and their god smiles at them. Let me get this straight. All the misery they are making here, and getting rich too? This is in the service of their god? So he will let them into this paraiso? I made a face. Would you want your soul to go there, stuffed full of Christianos who commit atrocities? Give me the path of the dead where I'll find my ancestors and dogs any day. What do they do? Raid each other and make war for eternity? Pearlhand translated. He says it is all peace, what he calls tranquilo. God will reward them for the good work they do while they are alive here. I fingered the scabs on my neck, remembering their good works here, like turning the dogs loose on unfortunates whose strength failed under their lash. In a whisper I asked, What kind of God do they serve? Pearl Hand didn't even take time to ask. They say it is the one true God. He is called Dios. His son is Jesus. I'm not clear on this, but they appear to be one and the same. Jesus came to earth, 
and enemies pinned him to a cross to die. That doesn't surprise me, given what I've learned of Christianos. Jesus rose from his grave, went back to Paraiso, and became one with God. And there's a sacred spirit mixed up in it somehow. All this was done to save people's souls from being lost and sent to burn forever. Even if they are good people? At her question, Antonio responded in some length. Pearlhan's smile was amused. He says to be good, you must believe in the true God. If you do not, you are evil. And that's that. If we would save ourselves from an eternity of fire and torment, we will free him. He will then take us to one of his priests who will save our souls and send them to Paraiso. Sure we will. And I suppose Fetch will be waiting there, tail wagging and happy to see us? I said it in jest, but Pearl Hand asked anyway. No, she told me. Animals don't have souls. His god didn't give them any. Only the souls of people inhabit Paraiso. Then she added, and, unlike us, they think people only have one soul. I just glared at him. His god didn't give souls to animals? Who'd want to spend eternity in a place without animals? Just what did they eat in their paraiso without deer, elk, and birds? What kind of foolishness was that? In the beginning, Breathgiver breathed life and souls into all creatures and plants. To live was to have souls. And the notion of only one soul? That was simply ridiculous. How did a body stay alive when the dream soul was out wandering about? Many people, like the Yuchi, thought you had as many as four souls. Machikasa believed in five. Tell him he's a fool, I muttered. At Antonio's reply, she said, He says you are the fool. He has the truth and serves the one God. You, he says, are maldito, cursed by God. Better cursed by his God, I growled, than condemned to his paraiso full of murderers and thieves like him and his adelantado. Antonio's words gave me a lot to chew on, especially in light of the warnings I'd heard in my spirit dreams. The nature of the battle with the Christianos began to come clear. This was not just a conflict between men. The Christianos wanted us to become followers of their god and send our souls to Paraiso to spend eternity being smiled at and singing, but without animals, hunting, campfires, and stories told by our ancestors. Where was the joy in that? And worse, what if they won in the end? That night I was tormented by dreams. In them, I walked through a sterile paraiso, where no animal souls provided company. I was alone, carrying a dog-chewed stick, with no fetch to chase it. When I called for him, screamed for him to come, I found myself surrounded by Christianos who chased me, driven on by a terrible god who laughed as innocents were clapped into collars, and slain by sword-wielding, bearded men. I woke to a faint light dimming the eastern horizon. Whatever the afterlife, I whispered, give me one where my souls are judged on who I am, not who I serve. And in the meantime, I would do all I could to send as many Christianos as I could to the terrible eternity of their paraiso. Chapter 17 what do you think? I asked, head cocked as I studied the pile of clothing on the ground. We were standing in our little clearing, the morning sun sending rays of light through the leaves while warblers, mockingbirds, and wrens sought to outdo the cheering insects with song, the fragrant smell of blossoms mixed with the scent of grass and faint whips of wood smoke from our fire. Bark still stood at the trail, his scarred muzzle pointed back toward where we'd left Fetch. I tried to ignore the hollow sense of loss. He's a skinny specimen, Pearlhand replied as she studied the naked Cristiano. I believe that but for his hair, you'd lose him completely in a snowbank. I glanced at the Cristiano, still shocked by the whiteness of his hide. Somehow I couldn't help but think it couldn't be healthy to be that white. It made my skin crawl to see the places he had hair. It matted in a shallow V on his chest and ran down in a line, thinning at the navel to thicken around his penis and testicles. It continued down his thighs and calves. Tufts of hair even could be seen on the knuckles of his toes. 
His frame was spare, ribs and shoulders sticking out. The ropey muscles belied the threat projected when he was dressed in armor. Up close, he had tiny brown spots on his arms, chest, and thighs. Bug bites made ugly red welts everywhere else, and the chiggers were feasting where the mosquitoes hadn't been able to. All in all, a naked Cristiano looked pretty pathetic. I was talking about his clothes, I countered, bending down to pluck up the metal breastplate. The thing reminded me of a beetle shell. That it should be so light surprised me, and I admired the workmanship that could pound metal so thin and uniform. There was no way I'd ever buckle it around my chest and shoulders. The thing was too small. I tapped it with a fingernail, listening to the now rusting metal sing. There had to be power in that, but red or white I couldn't tell. Maybe both, given the metal's now browning color, power is drawn to color, and the speckled brown spreading on the silver didn't inspire me with awe. Or perhaps the power faded if the metal wasn't polished every day. I'd learned that with the Cristiano sword. Beneath the breastplate, Antonio wore a fabric vest, layered, and into which had been sewn little squares of metal. Inspecting it carefully, I could see how the batting, mixed with metal, could stop arrows. The thing was worth a fortune for the small metal plates alone. They could be patiently hammered into beads, or sharpened and fixed to a staff to serve as an axe. His shirt was of heavy cloth, white with blue stripes that would have defied the best weavers in the north. I liked the puffy sleeves that allowed free movement of the arms. For the moment, it reeked of the Cristiano's sweat. The pants and undergarments also amazed me. Cristiano's wore a lot of layers. His footwear was made of very durable leather, unlike any I had ever seen. And the stitching? Well, remarkable is the only word to describe the workmanship. His helmet was also a thing of wonder, light and protective. Good for rain with its brim, a man could parade around untouched in a hailstorm of stunning intensity. I began to see what Muskrat meant when he told of his cousin's arrow being as impotent as a mosquito bite. The disadvantage was clear when I lifted the whole of it. No wonder they rode caballos. This much weight wouldn't be debilitating in the morning, but after a long, hot day's march, it would sap any man's resources. Impressed, Pearl Hand asked as she watched me sort through the belt and undergarments. Very. I lifted a little knife with a yarrow blade and tested the sharp edge. This alone would bring a chief's ransom in the north. I dropped it into one of my packs. You can see how difficult it is to kill them, Pearlhand replied, glancing speculatively at Antonio. Uncomfortable under her gaze, he dropped his hands to hide his balls and penis. I'd have been ashamed of them, too. Arrow placement is critical, I agreed. Then, on a whim, I carried the metal breastplate over and leaned it against the palmetto. Stepping back to my bow, I strung it, knocked a war arrow, and from ten paces, shot. The arrow shattered in a ringing clatter, the breastplate bouncing and falling to the side. When I walked over, I was amazed to see that the yarrow carapace was only dented. The discovery was worth the loss of the arrow. Antonio had a smug look on his face, and I considered driving a second one through his now vulnerable and oh-so-pale chest. And one day, Antonio, I will. When I do, I promise, I'm sending your soul to the land of the dead where you can serve fetch the way your people made me serve them. I ran a finger over the dimple my shot had made in the armor. We make chest armor in the north, I mused. Ours is crafted from wood, or perhaps woven cane. Nothing as good as this. That's why they make the crossbow, she told me. Even though you turn your nose up at the short arrow... Its iron head and the power of the bow will send it through armor like that. I nodded. Hence the undercoat, right? The outer metal slows the arrow, which the batting and plate can stop. That would seem to be the idea, she agreed. The thunder sticks, though, will go through them both if fired from up close. I saw such a thing as a little girl. Then they would shoot right through anything our people wear. I thought of one of their heavy little lead balls and couldn't help but believe our best wooden armor wouldn't be as effective as grass when it came to stopping one. Thundersticks have one shot, she reminded me, 
It takes a long time to load them again. Until that happens, a thunder stick is just an awkward club. Provided you survive that first shot. That, she agreed, is the problem. And they tend to cover their shooters with archers and spears. The combination of those weapons is what makes them so terrible. Ask Antonio, who is this Adelantado? We know he seeks gold and works for his god, but why did he come here? Prohan carried on an exchange for a while, then explained. The Adelantado has many exploits to his name in another country to the south. He was in an army that captured a great nation called Inca. He killed many people and took much gold and silver from the Inca. Doing so made him one of the richest men in his country, called España. De Soto's high minco, called El Rey Carlos, and a holy leader called Papa, gave him all of this country as his own. Who? If this was a high minco's land to give, why have I never heard of him? Pearl Hand repeated the question, to which Antonio replied in length. She then said, This is the way Antonio says it works. Cristianos believe that Dios created the world. This Papa is the leader of Dios's priests, the Catolicos. Since Dios created the world, the Catolicos can give it to whomever they wish. And where does this Rey Carlos fit in? The High Minko rules by the will of Dios, but he appears to be under the command of the Papa. Somehow it takes two of them, but they both agree to give the Adelantado any lands he captures. I shook my head at the absurdity of it. A High Minko across the sea is giving away lands he's never even seen because he thinks his god created it? The things I had been told in my spirit dreams began to make an even more chilling sense. Pearl Hand shrugged, missing my suddenly sober expression. I told you long ago, they are arrogant. The worst is yet to come, I whispered, gaze fixed on the breastplate. I've had three spirit dreams. Yes, so? The important one the one all spirit dreamers seek, is the fourth dream. You were sick last time. Your souls were wandering. I nodded, glancing uneasily at Antonio. But the fourth will come. I will dream again, and when I do, the stakes will become clear. I shivered at the thought. She frowned, lines marking her smooth forehead. And we're caught right in the middle of it? You don't have to be. As she shook her head, long locks of raven hair played down her back. Power is counting on us, both of us. Go somewhere. Be safe. She said something to me in Cristiano tongue. What? That's why I'm here, Black Shell. I know something of them. Speak their language. Power needed me to rescue you, heal you of their disease. Power is working through me. She gestured toward Antonio, standing awkwardly his hands cupping his genitals. Power gave us the Cristiano, a captive so we might learn more. We're being prepared, given a chance to learn things before we're thrown into the battle. I nodded, staring at the dimple in the breastplate. But there are just two of us. Perhaps, she murmured softly. For now. But there will be others. Then she walked back to Antonio, gesturing for him to sit. He dropped, staring up at her. He had that look in his eyes again, as if he'd never seen a real woman before. What are you doing? I asked as she began speaking in Cristiano. Refreshing my knowledge of their tongue, she replied between strings of Cristiano, so that I'm even better at knowing their souls. I thought about that, and turned to my own study of the man's armor and clothing. What if we didn't have as much time as I thought? Suddenly, every heartbeat mattered. We worked in shifts. I would leave one day, taking my bow and arrows to go hunt. We had, after all, three human and four dog bellies to keep full. The next day I would stay with the Cristiano, patiently trying to learn his language. For her part, Pearl Hand would take one of the dog packs and pick berries, dig roots, and collect seeds. She was also good at tickling fish which involves reaching slowly under the banks and carefully grasping whatever's hiding there. She caught turtles and snared rabbits. 
My progress in the language, which Antonio informed me was called Espanol, came slowly at first, being unrelated to any tongue I was familiar with. Then at night, Pearl Hand would coach me while she practiced with the crossbow. In the beginning, I thought the design was silly. Maybe the Cristianos weren't the only ones who were arrogant. Seeing the power that device unleashed, I would never doubt a Cristiano weapon again. We only had the one iron-tipped arrow. Antonio's others had vanished with his caballo. That one was precious since we had figured out it would pierce Cristiano armor. I made her some practice arrows which allowed her to learn to aim and shoot. She had a proficiency with the weapon that I certainly didn't. Since we were experimenting, I took out the Cristiano sword, batting it around like a war club. Antonio laughed at my feeble efforts. It got to the point where he was grabbing his belly and making faces. If you're so smart, show me how it's done. I gave him a mocking look. Untie, he offered his bound wrists. He gave Pearl Hand a smug look as if suddenly sure of himself. Granted, I was smart enough not to let him have the real thing. But with Pearl Hand watching, the crossbow ready on her lap, I provided staves of the approximate shape. Antonio, to his immense satisfaction, started out battering me unmercifully. But, it turns out, a sword, while very different from a war club, uses many of the same principles. Watch his feet, Pearl Hand coached. Left one in front, forward and back, not dancing about like a girl at a round dance. By this time I was covered with bruises and hadn't landed so much as a blow against his clothing. Yes, we'd let him dress, but I had pitched his boots into a swamp where they'd never be found. He didn't look like the kind who could go far barefoot. Each time he'd whack me with a stave, he'd grin stupidly at Pearl Hand, as if to impress her with his superiority. The next time he did, I used his preoccupation to wrap him across the ribs. At that, his expression clouded and he was at me with redoubled fury. War clubs are slower, with more bobbing and weaving, jumping and swinging. The hardest part of the sword was the thrusting, until I remembered spear training as a boy. By the time he was winded, I began to wrap him across the ribs. The more he tired, the slower his movements. I was able to see how he did it. I finally knocked his stave to one side, leaping forward in a thrust, driving the blunt end of my stave into his gut. He stumbled backward, chest heaving. Antonio's bitter burst of cursing caused me to retreat. He says he would have killed you many times over before you landed that blow. Pearl Hand didn't need to translate. The man's anger and hatred couldn't be missed. He would have, I puffed, catching my breath. But if we keep at this, I will learn it. Why? Pearl Hand wondered. It's not like you'll be able to beat them at their own game. He's barely more than a boy. Put you up against a man who's practiced that all his life, and he'll gut you like a fish. I know, I winced as I prodded my ribs. But our warriors will go up against them with war clubs. The sword is quicker, faster. If I learn it, perhaps the knowledge will be useful. How? I shrugged, tossing the stave to one side, staring down Antonio's hatred with my own. I don't know, but some day perhaps it will make the difference. I pointed to Antonio. You and me, tomorrow, again. Pearl Hand stood covering Antonio with the crossbow while I rebound his arms and legs. In the process, Antonio chattered in Espanol. He wants to know why we're keeping him prisoner. He says his father, Don Luis Ruiz, is a very rich man, a sub-chief of the Adelantado. Don Luis will pay ransom and make us both rich. I'm rich enough, I muttered. And just so there is no misunderstanding, you are only here to teach us how to defeat you. Pearl Hand translated. Antonio's eyes slitted, rattled back. He says that as long as the Cristianos follow the true God, they cannot be defeated by any accursed agents of El Diablo. But for you, Antonio says, he'll make an exception and send your damned soul straight to the fires of hell. I bent down, glaring into his angry eyes. What if I kill you first? How then will you manage this? Pearl Hand translated his reply. 
He says his father will come for him at the head of many soldados, and he will laugh as he cuts your throat. In the meantime, he says he refuses to even talk to us or eat our food. He's done polluting his soul with the agents of El Diablo. I jerked the last of the knots tight. Prefieres muerto? I asked in my very bad Espanol. Un dia te matare. En el nombre del Dios, lo prometo. Antonio jerked his head in hot affirmation, as proving it to himself. He says, I know. I waved down her translation. He's going to kill me. I stared at the welts and scrapes left on my chest and belly by the staves. But today is not that day. I walked over, picking through Fetch's pack. There I found the hated collar and a length of sinew. These I pulled free, seeing Antonio's eyes widen. Walking up to him, I dangled it, letting the half-rings of the collar jangle and dance at the end of the chain. He tried to wiggle away as I bent down, but was no match for my muscle, as I slapped the halves of the collar together around his neck, and sitting on him, tied it tight with sinew. How does it feel? I asked, rising. A passionately foul string of curses was my answer. I watched him finger the collar, violent rage in his eyes. So I yanked up on the chain, tying it to a live oak branch. True, it could easily be defeated, but it made me feel good. Pearl Han's expression betrayed skeptical amusement, but she held her peace as I reached for my bow. The dogs came to immediate attention, as always, anxious to go along. I waved them down. I'm going to see if I can drive an arrow through some unlucky furry creature by way of adding to the meal pot. I gestured. Watch him. She nodded. Be careful. Antonio's been missing for a while. They will still be looking for him. I used the bow to bend the poison wood back and ease through the saw palmetto. Then I carefully picked my way through the grass. We didn't follow the same route twice, leery of creating any kind of trail. Pearlhand was right. I didn't want to try fighting Cristianos with their own weapons, but gaining a familiarity with the sword also gave me a healthy respect. Attacking swordsmen with war clubs would be disastrous. What other surprises did the Cristianos have for us? I thought about the thundersticks, about the crossbow that was definitely more powerful than even the finest composite bow with which I was familiar. And then they had those odd long spears tipped with metal points as well as a large cutting blade that jutted out to the side. The things looked awkward and cumbersome. I was willing to wager a good shell gorget that they were anything but. Otherwise, the Christianos wouldn't be lugging them around. When I reached the main trail, I noticed the caballo tracks first thing. They'd been through in the last hand of time. I carefully scouted up and down the length of trail, but could see no sign of them. I started back the other way. I was after deer, right? Just because it was in the general direction of Ocali Town didn't mean I was looking for trouble. The faint clink of metal was accompanied by a caballo blowing. At first I wasn't sure which direction it had come from, so I just slipped into the grass, weaseling back away from the trail. A large copperhead ghosted off, disturbed by my presence. Then I crouched down, obscured by the leaves of a sumac. Overhead an osprey winged by, a fish clutched lengthwise in its taloned feet. Meadow clanked again, and I heard a man's voice. A caballo snuffled, and leather creaked. The first rider came into my limited view. He wore a helmet, this one polished to shine in the sunlight, and a lance was propped in a stirrup holder. Behind him came another, and yet another. Six in all, two with crossbows, the rest holding lances. Swords hung at their sides, and shining metal shields covered their left arms. After they passed, I crept out, smelling the acrid scent of caballo. Carefully I eased along after them. The day was brutally hot, and I thought about all those layers of clothing they were sweating into. They should have drawn every mosquito within a day's walk, and flies, too. For some time I trotted along, staying just far enough behind to hear them. From previous excursions, I knew the trail crossed a small creek that fed into the swamps. Beyond that, I figured it was too close to their camp at Okale Town to take chances. Pearl Hand might not come to get me again. 
I could hear the caballos splash into the water, and was on the point of turning back when a shout went up, followed by war cries. I hurried ahead, stopping when I could just see the crossing. The caballos were milling, splashing in the water, and even over the distance, I could make out arrows clattering against the Cristiano's armor. Ocale warriors were dancing around, loosing shaft after shaft. The Cristianos, wheeling the caballos in the water, formed up under shouted commands and charged, the lancers each catching a darting warrior. The two men with crossbows rode close before shooting down fleeing warriors. Then they drew their swords as the heavy caballos crashed through vegetation in pursuit. Within moments, it was over. Shouted commands brought the riders together. Two men stepped down, walking over with their swords to kill the wounded. Then, as though the skirmish were nothing, the Cristianos remounted, laughing, clanking their shields, and continued on across the creek. I waited a full hand of time before sneaking up to view the carnage. It had been a well-planned ambush, the Cristianos completely surrounded, and had it been anyone but Cristianos, nothing would have saved them. Shadowed arrows lay on the ground, a couple in the churned mud of the crossing. I studied the dead. The lances had been most efficient, though a follow-up slash of the sword had made sure. One of the warriors who had fled had been ridden down, his head split in two with a sword. Flies were already enjoying the feast. One by one I counted the dead, finding sixteen. It was a small fight, the first I'd seen involving Christianos, but it shook me to the core. I squatted there, looking out at the muddy water. If six Christianos could do this to sixteen Ocale warriors, what would it take to overwhelm the entire army in a frontal assault? I shivered at the realization that no nation, not even my bellicose Chikaza, would stand a chance. And you want Pearl Hand and me to stop them? I looked up at the blazing sun, seeking an answer, and finding none. Chapter 18 Two days later, I was hunting. As I stalked along an overgrown deer trail, I should have been paying attention. I was out to kill a deer, turkey, opossum, or anything for the pot. Instead, the green palmettos, mulberries, and honeysuckle might have been a gray screen. My bow rested forgotten in my hand, the knocked arrow in abstract. I kept mulling over something Pearl Hand had told me the night before. Antonio has a high opinion of himself, she whispered as we lay in our bed. He keeps telling me what a great man his father is, and how one day he, Antonio, will be a Don, too. What's that? Like a subchief. He's not going to live that long. She tickled my ear. You've seen the way he looks at me. That might be one of the reasons he doesn't live that long. What's with him? Don't the Cristianos have women back where they come from? I saw two in Usita while I was there. Antonio would like me to believe that if I take him back to his people, I could become a wife. He would shower me with great honors, fine dresses, and place me in charge of many servants in a very important family. I turned in the blankets. You're kidding. She chuckled softly. Can you imagine it? Me, with that skinny little boy? Imagine it. The very thought makes me want to throw up. I flipped the blanket back. Maybe I'll go kill him now. She pulled me back down, running a teasing finger around my ear. Later, for the moment, I think I'd like to enjoy a real man. Antonio, on top of being a Cristiano, had only proved himself to be an idiot. It was going to take a lot more than promises of riches and status to win her over to the Cristianos. She knew them for what they were. Nevertheless, it bothered me. I was used to men admiring Pearl Hand, but the thought of a maggot like Antonio constantly gawking at my woman? Outside of the amusement it provided Pearl Hand, it only kindled rage between my souls. And then, jerking back to where I was, I tightened my grip on my bow. Fool, you're supposed to be hunting. What idiocy possessed you to— I heard voices coming from down the trail. I eased back. The arrow still knocked in my bow and crouched in the tangle of grape and greenbriar, thorns from the ladder raking my skin. 
I was no more than ten paces off the trail when a small group of men and women, burdened with baskets hung from tump lines, passed. Their expressions were glum, hair dirty and unkempt. Smudges could be seen on their bare legs, and the women's skirts looked as if they'd been sleeping in them. The man in the lead kept glancing uneasily back at his companions, as if seeking reassurance by their very presence. I could catch snatches of their conversation, the local dialect of Timakua almost incomprehensible. As they passed, I rose, calling, Wait, I am a trader, and approach under the power of trade. You'd have thought I was a wolf attacking a group of rabbits. The women screamed, throwing themselves to the ground, hands over their ears. The men whirled, bringing up bows, fear in their faces. I held my bow off to the side, my right hand opened, fingers splayed. I only want news. Do not shoot. They hesitated for a moment, the men licking their lips, clearly afraid. It was a younger man, muscular and tattooed with traditional starbursts on his cheeks and breast, who called, Who are you? Black Shell, a trader of the Chikasa. I come under the power of trade. Under that power I give you my word, I mean you no harm. The youth lowered his bow. What news do you want? I sighed and stepped forward. What is happening with the Christianos? Have you heard anything? The older man finally lowered his bow and nodded. He was gray-haired, wrinkled, with a rounded stoop to his shoulders. His roomy brown eyes kept casting warily about in case I was not alone. They have left Okale, heading north. They have run out of food even after raiding Akura and all the surrounding villages. We heard this from one of our people who escaped just yesterday. He gestured towards Okale. We ran at their approach and have been hiding. Now we are going to see what is left. Not much knowing the Christianos. You'll be lucky if they haven't burned everything to the ground. He gave me a weak smile that exposed pink and toothless gums. Then at least it will save us the effort. No one would live in a house the Christianos have polluted. Not only do they destroy the spirit power in the house, they leave it full of disease. Anything left standing, we will burn anyway. He shook his head. It will be a hard winter. Instead of eating our corn and squash, we're going to have to go out each day to gather roots, nuts, and fruits. From dawn to dusk we will have to fish and trap birds just to keep our bellies full. They fouled the entire country with their stink. Such is their nature, I agreed. I remember you, the younger man said. You came through several moons ago, heading south. I am two panthers. You stayed with us for a night? Your chief, Holata Okale, thought I was a spy working for the Patano. Perhaps now he will understand I'm just a traitor. Something about two panthers seemed familiar. You were asking about the Christianos, weren't you? The young two panthers asked, brow lined as he remembered. I was a fool. I pointed to the healing red welts on my neck. I found them. They put one of those metal collars on me and made me work. Power was with me. I got away. What do you do now? the old man asked. I watched them, trying to figure out a way to destroy them. One man alone? two panthers asked. I gave him a shrug. Power is with me. It was with our healer, too, the old man said wearily. He went to fight their god, calling on all his powers. They sent great dogs to tear him to pieces. He scuffed the trail dirt. Whatever their power is, ours is no match. Wickedness, I answered. That is their power. That, and of course their armor and weapons. But we have something else, something they can't beat. The old man cocked his head, giving me a skeptical look. What would that be, traitor? I gestured around. We know the land, and have time. The women had risen self-consciously to their feet, resetting the burden baskets over their hips. One now said, And how will that work against them? Parties of our warriors have tried to ambush them, and most were killed. No one can stand against them. I shrugged. Not yet. But I saw Cristiano suffer as they were crossing the swamps. I gestured around. They have left Okale. 
Out of food, imagine that. Here, surrounded by things to eat, they are hungry. They may have eaten your stores, but at least you won't starve. I nodded to myself, putting it together. No, we won't beat them, but the land will. You can carry on your fight, two panthers said. We just want to be left alone to care for our dead and rebuild. You shall, I agreed. But I think if you are smart, you won't replant or rebuild for a while. Without stores of food, they won't be tempted to come back. The old man chuckled, clearly not amused. How right you are. They've even eaten the seed corn. We have nothing to plant, but we'll have to trade for it. The look two panthers gave me sent a shiver down my spine. Then he asked, They've brought death, haven't they? Not just to our people, but to our world. Nothing will ever be the same, will it? I hitched up my belt, not knowing how to answer. The finality in his voice might have encompassed the entire world. Even the sun and the sky seemed to dim. I must be going. Remember me to your chief. Tell him I really wasn't a spy. Two panthers gave me a dull look. The Christianos killed him in the first fight. If the clans agree, I shall be Holado Akale now. I remembered him, sitting in the chief's house, the youngest son. He'd been quiet, his skeptical father and older brothers asking barbed questions about my real reason for being there. You have my sympathy, two panthers. May the Holata's souls rest peacefully and protect you from evil. And your mother, Sebal, she provided me with a wonderful feast of corn, palm heart, and fish mixed with elderberries. It was the only highlight from my time in Okale. They took her, captured her in a raid. The last I saw, she was being led off with a rope around her neck. If you should happen across her on your journey, tell my mother we will be waiting should she ever escape. And your brothers? I remembered two others, older than this one. Dead. Two panthers gave me a weak smile, as if that were the best to be hoped for. May the power of trade be with you, Black Shell of the Chikasa. You are going to need it. With that, they all turned, walking stolidly up the trail to discover whatever wreckage remained of their lives. When I returned to camp, it was to find Pearl Hand nursing a bruise on the side of her face. The dogs clustered around her. Antonio was nowhere to be seen. What happened? I asked, hurrying over to her. I turned her face up, seeing the discoloration on her cheek. You didn't check his bindings this morning, she accused hotly. No, you did, I shot back. I told you to, but I thought you'd done it. She jerked her head away. This is pointless. He got loose and jumped me, hit me hard and knocked me over. As I scrambled to my feet, he was leaping for the sword. That's when the dogs tore into him. By the time I got the sword, he was running headlong for the brush. She pointed at a hole torn in the vines, palmettos, and poison wood. He crashed through there, figuring the dogs wouldn't follow. I glanced over, considering the direction he'd fled. That was east, and the Christianos were headed north. Should we try to hunt him down? Pearlhand's crossbow now lay beside her, the bowstring locked and the war arrow knocked. She followed my gaze, saying, Well, I thought he might come back. Why? Because he was shouting that I would now be his woman. I stood, looking around the little clearing. Antonio had been in such a rush he'd left behind his armor, fleeing barefoot in only his cloth pants and shirt. I climbed up partway one of the live oaks, staring out at the sawgrass on the other side. The trail Antonio had left was clearly visible. I'll bet he's cut to ribbons, and the poison wood will be doing its work about now. He'll be headed straight back to the Christianos, she said softly. We've got to leave. He'll bring them here. They left yesterday. He's going to be very disappointed. I told her what I'd learned from the Okale. She sighed, slapping her thighs, and stood. Then we had better be after them. Who knows? We might track him down on the trail. I thought about that. He's alone, barefoot and unarmed in a country he doesn't know. 
I shook my head. If a snake or alligator doesn't get him, the first hunter he runs into won't hesitate to drive an arrow through his heart. Assuming he's lucky. If he's unlucky, they'll take him back and sacrifice him to the sun. It wouldn't be a happy death, given the anger and rage the Christianos had kindled in local hearts. I'm afraid you lost your collar. It was still around his neck. Too bad we didn't have metal buttons to seal it fast. He hates you for that, you know. He said he'd pay you back more than once for the insult. I'll be waiting. The dogs were happy to be on the trail again, and I began to realize it was just as well that Antonio had escaped. We passed two parties of Ocale that day. All were headed home to see what was left. Antonio's future looked grim. I said as much to Pearl Hand. She mused for a moment, then asked, Would it have bothered you seeing him cut down? Only slightly. He was our captive, after all. That, and he could be carrying this pack. I had fetches over my shoulder, doubling my load and inhibiting any movement. She shook her head. You'd be carrying it anyway. Not even claiming he was our slave would have saved his life. The Okale would have just pushed us aside and cut him to pieces. News in the back country, however, is often euphemistic. We hadn't covered a finger's travel before two panthers, the old man and women in tow, came hurrying down the trail. Two panthers, I called, reshuffling my load, raising my hand. It felt odd not to be greeting people with my trader's staff, resting as it was with the bow, arrows, sword, and my chunky lances. They're still there, I could see the churning anger in Two Panther's face. Only part of them left. The others, like maggots, continued to infest us. Did they see you? I asked, glancing back down the trail, half expecting to see Cristianos galloping our direction. No, his expression was irritated. Not even I am dumb enough to just charge out of the forest. I looked first and saw a small herd of their caballos and puercos chewing up what was left of our corn stalks, and guards in armor lounged by the palisade gates. So what will you do? Pearlhand asked. Two panthers shrugged. Back to the forests and swamps for now. Two more parties of your people are behind us. They'll need warning. I glanced back down the trail. And you, Black Shell? Two panthers asked, clearly concerned. You are welcome to come with us. Another man good with a bow is always appreciated. I glanced at Pearl Hand, and she arched a questioning eyebrow. They're split, I paused, considering. Then maybe some advantage can be had of this. Which way did they go? North. With the Christianos still at Ocale, Antonio's fate was no longer sealed. He might even be on the verge of stumbling into the town as we spoke provided he found the right trail and didn't find Okale warriors in the process. One thing was certain. He'd have his caballeros scouring the countryside for us. To two panthers, I said, the Christianos will be beating the country all around where you first met me. They will know where I camped. Keep all of your people clear of that area. Meanwhile, is there a trail Pearl Hand and I can take that will veer wide of Okale? The last place they'll be searching for us is in the north. How would they know where your camp was? Two Panthers asked. Surely you don't trade with them. His gaze fixed on the sword and pack of armor, old suspicions beginning to brew. We had a Cristiano as a slave for a while. He got away this morning. I pointed with a finger. But he will be back, and probably with a large party in tow. You and your people don't want to be found. Two Panthers gave me an incredulous look. You actually managed to take a Cristiano for a slave? And learned a great many things. But we're wasting time. You need to find a place to hide, and we need to get around Okale without being butchered. Two Panthers gave me a dubious look, then squatted in the trail, outlining the routes we could take around Okale. Pearl Hand and I bent down, listening intently, as Two Panthers explained the landmarks, directions, and turns. In trade, I gave him the metal breastplate that had been awkwardly strapped to Bark's back. The big gray dog wagged his tail as if happy to be rid of the thing. 
Two panthers immediately buckled it about his wiry frame and preened before the awed eyes of his companions. Be careful, I called as we parted. Go with power, traitor. And then they were gone, hurrying down the trail. Power had better be with him, too, Pearlhan noted. He'll be too busy polishing that metal to outrun any Christianos. But he'll make a very pretty holata, assuming he is confirmed, I added as I took the trail. For the moment, it was a race between us getting out of the area and whether or not Antonio managed to stumble into Ocale and turn the countryside upside down. This ends Disc 6. Coming of the Storm, Disc 7. For two days, we played hawk and mouse with the caballo mounted patrols, easily fading into the underbrush at the first sound of their clanking armor. Maybe it was Fetch's demise, or perhaps the dogs were getting used to the game, but they developed a particular growl at the approach of caballos. Nor did they need reminding to keep quiet while we were hiding. Whatever the fate of Antonio, he didn't catch up to us. Past Ocale, the trail of the Cristianos was easy to follow. Not only did the caballos and the passage of so many feet churn the trail into a wallow, but every now and then we passed a dead body. The hapless man or woman literally worked to death. From the tattoos, we could tell if they were Uzita, Mokoso, Tocaste, or one of Iraparacoki's. The ones who had been in the collars had had their heads cut off. The others had been finished with a sword stroke when they'd finally collapsed. The flies would lift in angry black columns, only to resettle on the feast as we passed. As the days wore on, we could mark the direction of travel by spirals of buzzards overhead, and the distance they had on us by the swelling of the rotting carcasses. Pearl Hands stared at one, a young woman who had been cut down from behind with a sword stroke. The buzzards had been at the wound. She'd been so young, she might not have even been out of the women's house. Even the meaning of death is changing, Pearlhan remarked. There are so many. It's grown so common. We forget that she had a name, with someone's daughter. That she had dreams, hopes, and perhaps even looked forward to marrying a special boy. Now she's just another nameless corpse. With a foot I rolled her over, wincing at the bite marks on her young breasts and the bruises on her thighs, partially hidden by the rumpled skirt. Pearlhan said nothing but a hardness lay behind her smoldering eyes. Then the rains came. We trudged onward, water pelting down to turn the trail into muck. We passed through Itolaholata, Potana Town, and Utinamocharo, trading off bits of Antonio's armor to the disorganized, broken, and dispirited survivors, most of whom had fled to the woods. By these means, we were also able to keep track of the Cristiano's location, now more than four days ahead of us. The town of Tapolo Halata we found gutted, and upon the ground lay no less than forty viciously chopped and hacked bodies, all placed in a line. One of the shocked survivors told us the tale. His name was Yabi, which translates to get well in the Takuma tongue. He was a round-faced man with a broad mouth that almost split his head in two. In between bouts of crying over his wife's and son's bodies, Yabi related the following. Five days ago, a family of the White Bird clan was harvesting its corn patch when out of the forest came Caballos with riders. The White Bird family, men, women, and children were quickly surrounded. Only one young boy got away. He ran in terror to warn the town. Our chief, Tapalu Halata, called a warning, telling the people to flee to the forest. Meanwhile, scouts watched as the Cristianos led the white bird captives, roped at the neck, into the palisade. How did we get the people back? Tapula Halata devised a plan. One young man, kin to the captives, offered to deceive the Cristianos. He donned the Halata's hat and took his sacred staff, and walked boldly up to the palisade gate, calling on the Cristianos that he was chief, and if they would surrender his people, he would guide them and serve them. The Cristianos were happy with this arrangement, and released the other captives. That night the false Holata, knowing the plan, told the Cristianos many things, anything, in fact, that seemed to make them happy. Meanwhile, Tapala Holata 
gathered all his warriors, even the women. Just after dawn we assembled beyond the palisade, almost three hundred of us. The plan was that we would frighten the Christianos with our numbers. That was when our brave false Halata led this de Soto out, telling him that if he would speak to us, we would do his bidding. This young man was a strong and fast warrior, and when he led de Soto close to us, he used his chief's staff and struck the guards accompanying him. Then he ran, and to our surprise, the Christianos were not frightened. Instead, they sent a terrible dog to chase the fleeing warrior down. At the same time, they came charging at us. Yabi slowly shook his head. We ran, all of us, fleeing through the forest. But they just kept coming. I, myself, crawled under a rotting log, and one of their great caballos leaped over it, those hooves pounding the dirt before my eyes. I hid for almost two days, and when I came out and made my way back, the dead were laid out just like this. Yabi pointed with a trembling finger. Look at them. Men and women, little children, all butchered like deer from a forest surround. So many of our people, and we didn't manage to kill a single one of them. Not one. Yabi swallowed hard, eyes begging the question. Are they spirit demons? Perhaps filled with evil sorcery? They might as well be, Pearlhand said through gritted teeth, her pained eyes on the line of corpses. Yabi rose on uncertain legs and wobbled over to the shredded remains of a man. The corpse had been gutted, the severed head stuffed down into the pelvis, as though to look out through a gaping cavity that had been cored out of the anus. This was the false Holata, the deceiver, Yabi sadly shook his head. This was the bravest man I have ever known. I cannot say his name now, for it would anger his souls and bring me misfortune. But could I say it? I would do so with great pride, for he truly was the best of us. Pearl Hand and I looked down the row of dead, now tended by a handful of relatives. Then out at what remained of the town. The buildings had been burned, the palisade pulled over, and the posts piled and set on fire. Tendrils of blue smoke still rose over the charred remains. Where are the rest of your people? Pearl Hand asked. The other survivors. Yabi, tears leaking from the corners of his eyes, raised his round face in despair. They will not come back here. He pointed again to a smoldering ruin on a small rise. That was the House of the Dead, where the ghosts of our ancestors have dwelt among us since the beginning. For four days, as is our custom, we will tend the dead. Then we will carry them here, to the Burn Charno house, and then we too will leave. To go where? I asked. East, Yabi confided. We have kin there. And who knows? The Christianos may come back. They may indeed, I replied, contemplating the line of corpses. And there are even more Christianos down south at Ocale. If what we know of their plans is correct, you will not want to be here when they arrive. Chapter 19 The people of Cholupaha, one of the Uzichili frontier towns, fared better. They had received news of Tapalo Halata's fate a day's march to their south. The Cholupaha Holata ordered that his people pack what belongings they could, and all fled to the forest. The happy Christianos had looted the granaries and gorged themselves on fresh stores of corn. Just beyond Cholupaha, as we slugged through the rain, we found a great bridge, another wonder created by the Christianos. This one spanned the rain swollen Black Duck River just a little over two bowshots across. Pearlhand and I stopped, marveling at the sight. The thing was built of timbers and freshly split planks lashed over cross pieces. The wood, so neatly cut by the Euro axes, gleamed in the rain. To surface the span, earth had been carried and poured over the planks. We walked out on the soil, marred by the passing of caballos, and stared over the edges at the swirling waters below. The dogs, tails wagging, glanced over, too, as if curious at what we were seeing. Squirm gave me a questioning look, his white blaze accenting his mystification at our preoccupation with water. 
I ran my finger over the cut marks left by the Cristiano axes, musing at how they reminded me of the work of a giant beaver. On the trip down, I had to hire a canoe to carry me across. This time, Pearl Hand, the dogs, and I walked across, feet dry but for the rain slash mud. Then we followed the trace into Virgin Forest and straight into more trouble than we wanted. Crossing the river put us firmly in territory controlled by the great Holata Usachili, the most powerful Timucuan chieftain in the north. Not only did Usachili's resources allow a larger population, but only a unified chieftainship could hold off the powerful Apalachee to the west and the Muscogean nations to the north. This was thickly forested land with low rolling hills. You must put yourself in that place, an old forest of walnut, great oaks, hickory, and gum trees, the sky literally roofed with arching branches high overhead. Beneath that lofty canopy, the ground is open, matted with leaves so deep the foot sinks at every step. The sensation conjured by the massive tree trunks, the hanging vines, and the semi-darkness is one mindful of the underworld, where little light penetrates. Here, the soul perceives a sense of age and grandeur. The forest, however, is anything but quiet, with birds singing, squirrels chattering, and the distant breeze in the treetops. Night or day, the ear is regaled with the whirring and clicking of insects. That day, while rain hammered the high leaves, we followed the chopped trail left by De Soto on his march north. The way wound around the great boles of the trees and large drops of water collected on the leaves high overhead, then fell with soft plops onto the leaf mat. Or louder spats when they hit us. Because of the sound-deadening rain, we had no warning. The wet soil, thick with leaves, muffled the sound of the approaching caballos. Sodden leather didn't creak, and the misty droplets of water falling from the leaves absorbed any clink of metal. The riders were coming at a trot, and I happened to look up just as they saw me. We both shouted a warning at the same time. My only thought was defense, dropping Fetch's pack, throwing off my quiver, and pulling out my bow. I managed to get it strung and grabbed up the quiver as I scuttled off behind the thick bowl of a walnut. The dogs were barking, burdened by their packs, and Pearl Hand had run the other way, stopping only long enough to step into the crossbow's foot loop and pull the string back with both hands. Then the riders were upon us. I fished out an arrow, not taking time to see what it was, and drew. I aimed the blunt shaft of one of my bird points. Too late to switch. I drew down on the black-bearded rider thundering toward me. He had a lance in his left hand, a round shield strapped to the forearm. His right hand held the reins that controlled his caballo. We weren't more than ten paces apart when I released, having taken the center of his bearded chin for my target. I watched the blunt tip of my arrow impact just below his right eye. Then I ducked behind the tree. I swear to this day, I could feel the impact of his lance through the thick bowl. Then came the cracking of wood, and he was passed, right hand to his face. The caballo, uncontrolled, raced off down the path. I fished for another arrow. It was a hunting shaft tipped with keenly flaked white chert. I drew, stepping around the tree, seeing five caballos milling, two others following after my first opponent. Oye, a key! I cried, wondering where Pearl Hand had gotten to. My pack dogs were nipping at the caballos, and I saw Gnaw get kicked. He yelped, flew, and tumbled, bits of trade bursting from his pack. No, not my dogs! At my shout, the men turned, sawing at the reins of their panicked caballos. I waited, unwilling to pick a target from the melee. One man got control of his beast, guiding it in my direction. A feeling of peace seemed to settle on me, the old control of countless years of practice firming my hold on the bow. This rider had lowered his lance, spurring his horse. Again I waited, watching him close the distance. At my release, I caught the momentary widening of his eyes, and he tried to jerk away. It was enough to save his life but not enough to keep the arrow from entering his right cheek. The impact of it twisted his head and he dropped the lance, pawing at the feathered shaft lodged deeply in his face. His caballo hammered on, 
Until I die, I will hear those grunting explosions of hot breath as the animal passed. Bending for another arrow, I heard a cry and looked past my tree. One of the riders was shouting, Fuera! Ahora! Fuera! They laid spurs to their animals, pelting down on the trail. I stared in disbelief. My final wounded rider, his left hand still clapped to the arrow sticking out of his face, had recovered control of his mount and went charging after them. Curses carried in the still forest air. The pack dogs, but for gnaw, ran barking in pursuit. Pearl Hand, are you all right? She emerged from behind a tree, looking shaken and disheveled. I'm all right. You? Fine. Taking time only to grab up some arrows, I ran for Gnaw, who was cowering in the trail, his tail between his legs. I knelt down, took him by the head, and stared into his frightened brown eyes. The other dogs came hobbling up, panting, tails lashing, as if in great victory. I quickly stripped the pack, seeing where the muddy caballo hoof had struck it. Then I ran my hands over Gnaw's ribs, relieved to find none broken, though he whined when I pressed. Relieved, I sat there in the mud and hugged him close, feeling my panic subside. Only when he began to squirm did I let him loose and turn to the mess littering the forest floor. Most of my trade had spilled from the packs and lay scattered about. Bark's pack had slid around until it hung from his belly. Squirm, delight in his soft brown eyes, was almost out of his. Figures. A broken lance was embedded in the walnut, the shaft nothing more than white splintered wood. Pearl Hand walked up, almost casually, leaning on the crossbow. I didn't kill him. Who? The first one I shot. The armor stopped the arrow, but I think he'll be hurting. You? Get any? My first arrow was a bird shaft. I hit him just under the eye. Ouch, Pearl Hand muttered. And the second? Ran it through the side of his face. It probably cut along the side of the skull and stopped when it hit the inside of the helmet. He'll have a most wondrous scar. If infection doesn't kill him. Why did they just leave? She shook her head, staring back down the trail. The leader ordered them away. That's what fuera means. They don't usually back off from a fight, unless they're on a special task for the adelantado. Let's get the trade picked up. I petted Gnaw's gray hide a final time and pulled myself wearily to my feet. I'd as soon get out of here. What if that's just the advance guard? I don't think so. They'd have gone back to the main party. She glanced thoughtfully to the north. Maybe now that they're in Usicili, the Adelantado has found more than he bargained on? Let's hope. I fought the urge to shiver as I went about picking up bits of shell, small flats of copper, beads, skeins of buffalo wool, pieces of Antonio's armor, and pouches of medicine herbs. Whatever's happened up ahead, I'd like to know sooner rather than later, I added, making a hasty job of packing. Me too. Pearl Hand was tying Squirm's pack on. But I've got a problem. Outside of hunting the most dangerous men on earth, what might that be? I picked up the drop lance, inspecting it with a critical eye. The arrow I took out of fetch? It had that funny metal tip. It punched right through that caballero's armor. The ones we've made of stone? They just splinter. I inspected the lance. The tip was small and square in cross-section. I thought it lacked a good cutting edge, but it had been built for tough penetration. We have those little metal plates in Antonio's armor. Maybe we can fix that. She nodded, giving Squirm a pat on the head. Then she looked down the trail where the caballeros had fled. I hope so. We're going to have to do better in the future. Yes, we would. But we were alive, and we'd learned. In the coming days, we would be learning a lot more. By definition, the future is an unknown. The Ajo Calaquin town, however, lay just ahead. There is a reason Breathgiver keeps the future hidden to all but an unlucky few. Chapter 20 The town of Ahokalaquin, which means like tempting fruit in Timakua, had been smart enough to evacuate, like its southern ally, Cholupaha. 
In the beginning, only two locals were caught by the advancing Cristianos. Those unlucky souls told the Cristianos where the already harvested corn had been hastily cached. At least half of the harvest still remained on the stalk, and numerous corn and squash fields surrounded the town. Adelantado de Soto, however, didn't just pass through as he had done in the south. After finding plentiful corn, beans, and squash buried in pits and under house floors, his raiders located more in outlying farmsteads. He decided to rest his forces. More or less. For one thing, his slaves were wearing out, and many were dying under his lash. For another, those taken from Iraperacoki had come to the conclusion that cooperating and willfully helping would earn them a release from the collars and heavy chains. Many, so freed, had now cast their lot with the Christianos. Having been in their place, I could understand. So far, no one had been able to bloody the Christianos in their relentless march. Surely such strength had to have something going for it. Those who converted to the Dios Jesu Cristo God however that worked, were given extra rations and got to drink out of the golden cup. In their minds, it gave them some of the Cristiano's spirit power. But why anyone would want to die and go to an afterlife like the Cristiano's craved was beyond me. So now they could look forward to spending eternity serving their brutal masters? What joy! For myself, I wanted to spend time with my ancestors, telling stories around campfires in the night sky and socializing. I would meet legends from among my people, learn from our greatest Hopaye and Minkos, who had gone before. Later, my children, and their children, and so forth, would all arrive, and I'd learn how things had worked out for them. They'd want to hear about my fight against the Christianos, going to the underworld, and meeting First Woman and Corn Woman. We'd all play with our dogs, hunt the spirits of deer, elk, and buffalo. Was there really a choice here? Or was I missing something important about the Christianos? A hand's time after the attack, Pearl Hand and I were traveling a couple of bow shots off the main trail. We kept just close enough to follow the trail, but back so that we could easily hide should more caballeros come charging out of the gloom. Skipper was the first to stop short sniffing and growling, his ears pricked, squirm and gnaw immediately froze, wary. Bark, being as dim as the forest gloom we traveled through, slowed, growling himself, but unsure why. Greetings, I called in Timakua. I am Black Shell of the Chikasa. I come under the power of trade. Silence. I glanced around, head cocked. Pearl Hand slipped a toe into the crossbow loop muscling the string to the latch. I held out a warning hand before she dropped a stone-tipped arrow into the weapon's channel. I repeat, we come under the power of trade. Bark lived up to his namesake, and I gestured him to silence. From where? An unexpected voice called. From the south? And what have you seen there? Death, and too many Christianos. I caught movement, forms shifting from behind the trees. Then why are you following in their tracks and carrying their weapons? Plunder from fights we've had with them. Perhaps we can use such weapons against them. Nothing else seems to penetrate that armor of theirs. A man seemed to detach himself from a tree. I ordered the dogs to stay and walked forward. Bark tried to follow, growling. He was still in the mood to fight. Pearl Hand bent down and whacked him across the nose to get his attention. He gave her a surprised look, then meekly dropped to his belly. The warrior was of medium height and stocky, tattooed with stars and zigzag lines, the sides of his head shaven. A central roach of hair was pulled up and tied like a palm. Red paint had been liberally applied to his square face. Despite the wet day, he wore only a breechcloth. Hard black eyes met mine, and I noticed that while his bow is lowered, it could be pulled back and released quickly. I have heard of Black Shell of the Chikasa. He came through our lands several moons ago. He gave a slight tilt of the head. And the woman? My wife, Pearl Hand. I indicated the dogs. As you can see, they are pack animals. 
These days my trader's staff rides in my quiver. A bow, it seems, is the only badge of office the Cristianos respect. They are without honor. For the first time he nodded, then made a signal. Warriors appeared from all directions, perhaps ten in all. Lucky for you, the Holata Uzachili and his people honor the power of trade. I took a deep breath, slightly relieved. We had a fight with eight caballeros a ways down the trail. They seem to be in a hurry. The Christiana chief sent them south this morning. Perhaps he wanted to save their lives? They won't be here when we kill the rest. Perhaps, I shifted my packs. You have my name. I do not have yours. Bloodthorn. I am a Neha of the Fish Clan, of the Uzichili Nation. I am the first son of Bit Woman, wife of Paracusi Eagle Fighter, war leader of the Aho Calaquin. I am received in the Utina Council of Holata Uzichili. Eniha meant a subchief, and not just any subchief since he sat in the council at Usachili, the capital city off to the west. Beyond that, his mother was married to the war chief, or Paracusi, of the Ahokalaquin town. Where are the Christianos? Prohand asked. Bloodthorn jerked his head toward the north. They sit in Ahokalaquin behind the palisade. His expression turned grim. Through treachery they have taken our holata. Initially his niece was taken captive. Our Holata went to meet with the Christianos, promising to surrender his freedom for that of his niece and some of our people taken captive with her. The Christianos agreed, but when Holata Ahokalaquin surrendered himself, they kept him and refused to let the others leave. He spat in disgust. They are maggot men without honor, and their given word is no more sacred than dog shit. Pearlhand asked, so they just stay in the fortified town? No. They send out parties of caballeros each day to raid. To stop this, only this morning we gathered in force three hundred warriors and six squadrons, hoping to engage them in a great battle and destroy them. He snorted in disgust. The cowards stay behind the palisade. After a couple of hands of time, eight riders burst out and fled. Like I said, we think they wish to save their lives. Oh, no, I told him seriously. Just the opposite, Bloodthorn. To the south, in Ocale, are another eight hundred Christianos, and you can bet that as soon as those riders reach them, they'll be on their way here. He gave me a hard-eyed look. You know this. We know this. He glanced at Pearl Hand, who stood easily, almost arrogantly, her crossbow lowered but ready at hand. His very male inspection of her tall body ended at her defiant eyes, as if she dared him to say something. To his credit, he gave her a slight nod, saying, Perhaps you should come with us. We followed him for a hand of time through what would have been trackless forest for me. I figured we were getting close when Bloodthorn nodded to a warrior with a strung bow who hid in the root cavity of an old deadfall. Then, a couple of bow shots farther, we followed a trail through honeysuckle, myrtle, and greenbriar into a small clearing in the trees. There, perhaps three hundred men, women, and children waited in the misty rain. Impromptu shelters had been raised, and the grass was beaten flat. Under a shaky ramada roofed with branches, several men and three women crouched. They were older, perhaps forty summers of age, each painted for war, the men wore their hair in the same fashion as blood thorn. People watched us pass, pointing and talking under their hands, as blood thorn led us to the Ramada and announced our presence in the flowery oratory of the western Timakua. Then he told of our fight with the eight caballeros and said we'd brought information on the Christianos. One of the men stood, a wiry specimen, his broad face painted red. Old scars crisscrossed his hands, forearms, and shoulders. He studied me, then pearl hand, smiling in a way that irritated me as he took in the damp dress clinging to her curves. The man turned his attention back to me. I am Eagle Fighter, Paracusi of the Ahokalaquin. Then he recounted his clan and lineage, told stories of the battles he'd fought, and finally offered his hand. The gesture was that of a potential ally given to another. 
I gripped his hand and nodded, saying, We thank you for your welcome, but wish it were under different circumstances. We come from the south, following the trail of the Christianos. Then, as we call upon the blessing of Mother's Son, our ancestors and spirits, perhaps you shall be here when we kill them to the last man. Pearlhand softly said, You will need more than spirit power, Paracusi. We have followed a trail of misery and death to reach this place. One of the women stood. I am Bit Woman, of the Fish Clan, daughter of White Fruit, cousin of Holata Ahokalaquin, who is captive in his own town. You raise my curiosity, Pearl Hand of the Chikora. The warriors of Usachili Nation are nothing like those disorganized towns in the south. We have fought the Apalachee and beaten them, sent their warriors scurrying home amid the wailing of widows and the crying of fatherless children. The Christianos have seen nothing of the art of war. Our ancestors now rally, bringing power from the realms of the dead. Our call for warriors has only now reached the outlying villages. Soon there shall be five hundred men and women, all ready to wreak our vengeance on the Christianos, their dogs and caballos. We have more than spirit power. We have the beating courage of our hearts. It won't be enough, Pearl Hans said in a respectful tone.